Section one of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. Esther Happy or How a Courtesan Can Love. Chapter one in eighteen twenty four at the last opera ball of the season several masks were struck by the beauty of a youth who was wandering about the passages and green room with the air of a man in search of a woman kept at home by unexpected circumstances the secret of this behaviour now dilatory and again hurried is known only to old women and to certain experienced loungers in this immense assembly the crowd does not trouble itself much to watch the crowd each one's interest is impassioned and even idlers are preoccupied the young dandy was so much absorbed in his anxious quest that he did not observe his own success he did not hear he did not see the ironical exclamations of admiration the genuine appreciation the biting jibes the soft invitations of some of the masks though he was so handsome as to rank among those exceptional persons who come to an opera ball in search of an adventure and who expect it as confidently as men looked for a lucky coup at roulette in frascati's day he seemed quite philosophically sure of his evening he must be the hero of one of those mysteries with three actors which constitute an opera ball and are known only to those who play a part in them for to young wives who come merely to say i have seen it to country people to inexperienced youths and to foreigners the opera house must on those nights be the palace of fatigue and dullness to these that black swarm slow and serried coming going winding turning returning mounting descending comparable only to ants on a pile of wood is no more intelligible than the bourse to a breton peasant who has never heard of the grand livre with a few rare exceptions men wear no masks in paris a man in a domino is thought ridiculous in this the spirit of the nation betrays itself men who want to hide their good fortune can enjoy the opera ball without going there and masks who are absolutely compelled to go in come out again at once one of the most amusing scenes is the crush at the doors produced as soon as the dancing begins by the rush of persons getting away and struggling with those who are pushing in so the men who wear masks are either jealous husbands who come to watch their wives or husbands on the loose who do not wish to be watched by them two situations equally ridiculous now our young man was followed though he knew it not by a man in a mask dogging his steps short and stout with a rolling gait like a barrel to every one familiar with the opera this disguise betrayed a stockbroker a banker a lawyer some citizen soul suspicious of infidelity for in fact in really high society no one courts such humiliating proofs several masks had laughed as they pointed this preposterous figure out to each other some had spoken to him a few young men had made game of him but his stolid manner showed entire contempt for these aimless shafts he went on whither the young man led him as a hunted wild boar goes on and pays no heed to the bullets whistling about his ears or the dogs barking at his heels though at first sight pleasure and anxiety wear the same livery the noble black robe of venice and though all is confusion at an opera ball the various circles composing parisian society meet there recognize and watch each other there are certain ideas so clear to the initiated that this scrawled medley of interests is as legible to them as any amusing novel 
so to these old hands this man could not be here by appointment he would infallibly have worn some token red white or green such as notifies a happy meeting previously agreed on was it a case of revenge seeing the domino following so closely in the wake of a man apparently happy in an assignation some of the gazers looked again at the handsome face on which anticipation had set its divine halo the youth was interesting the longer he wandered the more curiosity he excited everything about him proclaimed the habits of refined life in obedience to a fatal law of the time we live in there is not much difference physical or moral between the most elegant and best-bred son of a duke and peer and this attractive youth whom poverty had not long since held in its iron grip in the heart of paris beauty and youth might cover him in deep gulfs as in many a young man who longs to play a part in paris without having the capital to support his pretensions and who day after day risks all to win all by sacrificing to the god who has most votaries in this royal city namely chance at the same time his dress and manners were above reproach he trod the classic floor of the opera house as one accustomed there who can have failed to observe that there as in every zone in paris there is a manner of being which shows who you are what you are doing whence you come and what you want what a handsome young fellow and here we may turn round to look at him said a mask in whom accustomed eyes recognized a lady of position do you not remember him replied the man on whose arm she was leaning madame du chatelet introduced him to you what is that the apothecary's son she fancied herself in love with who became a journalist mademoiselle coralie's lover i fancied he had fallen too low ever to pull himself up again and i cannot understand how he can show himself again in the world of paris said the comte sixte du chatelet he has the air of a prince the mask went on and it is not the actress he lived with who could give it to him my cousin who understood him could not lick him into shape i should like to know the mistress of this sargine tell me something about him that will enable me to mystify him this couple whispering as they watched the young man became the object of study to the square-shouldered domino dear monsieur chardon said the prefet of the charente taking the dandy's hand allow me to introduce you to someone who wishes to renew acquaintance with you dear comte chatelet replied the young man that lady taught me how ridiculous was the name by which you address me a patent from the king has restored to me that of my mother's family the rubempres although the fact has been announced in the papers it relates to so unimportant a person that i need not blush to recall it to my friends my enemies and those who are neither you may class yourself where you will but i am sure you will not disapprove of a step to which i was advised by your wife when she was still only madame de bargeton this neat retort which made the marquise smile gave the prefet of la charente a nervous chill you may tell her lucien went on that i now bear gules a bull raging argent on a meadow vert raging argent echoed chatelet madame la marquise will explain to you if you do not know why that old coat is a little better than the chamberlain's key and imperial gold bees which you bear on yours to the great despair of madame chatelet ne negra police d'espard said lucien quickly 
since you recognize me i cannot puzzle you and i could never tell you how much you puzzle me said the marquise d'espard amazed at the coolness and impertinence to which the man had risen whom she had formerly despised then allow me madame to preserve my only chance of occupying your thoughts by remaining in that mysterious twilight said he with the smile of a man who does not wish to risk assured happiness i congratulate you on your changed fortunes said the comte du chatelet to lucien i take it as you offer it replied lucien bowing with much grace to the marquise what a coxcomb said the count in an undertone to madame d'espard he has succeeded in winning an ancestry with these young men such coxcombry when it is addressed to us almost always implies some success in high places said the lady for with you older men it means ill fortune and i should very much like to know which of my grand lady friends has taken this fine bird under her patronage then i might find the means of amusing myself this evening my ticket anonymously sent is no doubt a bit of mischief planned by a rival and having something to do with this young man his impertinence is to order keep an eye on him i will take the duc de navarin's arm you will be able to find me again just as madame d'espard was about to address her cousin the mysterious mask came between her and the duke to whisper in her ear lucien loves you he wrote the note your prefet is his greatest foe how can he speak in his presence the stranger moved off leaving madame d'espard a prey to a double surprise the marquise knew no one in the world who was capable of playing the part assumed by this mask she suspected a snare and went to sit down out of sight the comte sixte du chatelet whom lucien had abridged of his ambitious du with an emphasis that betrayed long meditated revenge followed the handsome dandy and presently met a young man to whom he thought he could speak without reserve well rastignac have you seen lucien he has come out in a new skin if i were half as good-looking as he is i should be twice as rich replied the fine gentleman in a light but meaning tone expressive of keen raillery no said the fat mask in his ear repaying a thousand ironies in one by the accent he lent the monosyllable rastignac who was not the man to swallow an affront stood as if struck by lightning and allowed himself to be led into a recess by a grasp of iron which he could not shake off you young cockerel hatched in mother vauquer's coop you whose heart failed you to clutch old taillefer's millions when the hardest part of the business was done let me tell you for your personal safety that if you do not treat lucien like the brother you love you are in our power while we are not in yours silence and submission or i shall join your game and upset the skittles lucien de rubempre is under the protection of the strongest power of the day the church choose between life and death answer rastignac felt giddy like a man who has slept in a forest and wakes to see by his side a famishing lioness he was frightened and there was no one to see him the boldest men yield to fear under such circumstances no one but he can know or would dare he murmured to himself the mask clutched his hand tighter to prevent his finishing his sentence act as if i were he said he rastignac then acted like a millionaire on the high road with a brigand's pistol at his head 
he surrendered my dear count said he to du chatelet to whom he presently returned if you care for your position in life treat lucien de rubempre as a man whom you will one day see holding a place far above where you stand the mask made an imperceptible gesture of approbation and went off in search of lucien my dear fellow you have changed your opinion of him very suddenly replied the prefet with justifiable surprise as suddenly as men change who belong to the centre and vote with the right replied rastignac to the prefet député whose vote had for a few days failed to support the ministry are there such things as opinions nowadays there are only interests observed des lupoles who had heard them what is the case in point the case of the sieur de rubempre whom rastignac is setting up as a person of consequence said du chatelet to the secretary-general my dear count replied des lupoles very seriously monsieur de rubempre is a young man of the highest merit and has such good interest at his back that i should be delighted to renew my acquaintance with him there he is rushing into the wasp's nest of the rakes of the day said rastignac end of section one section two of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary esther happy chapter two the three speakers looked towards a corner where a group of recognized wits had gathered men of more or less celebrity and several men of fashion these gentlemen made common stock of their jests their remarks and their scandal trying to amuse themselves till something should amuse them among this strangely mingled party were some men with whom lucien had had transactions combining ostensibly kind offices with covert false dealing hallo lucien my boy why here we are patched up again new stuffing and a new cover where have we come from have we mounted the high horse once again with little offerings from florine's boudoir bravo old chap and blondet released finot to put his arm affectionately around lucien and press him to his heart andoche finot was the proprietor of a review on which lucien had worked for almost nothing and to which blondet gave the benefit of his collaboration of the wisdom of his suggestions and the depth of his views finot and blondet embodied bertrand and raton with this difference that la fontaine's cat at last showed that he knew himself to be duped while blondet though he knew that he was being fleeced still did all he could for finot this brilliant condottieri of the pen was in fact long to remain a slave finot hid a brutal strength of will under a heavy exterior under polish of wood as a laborer rubs his bread with garlic he knew how to garner what he gleaned ideas and crown pieces alike in the fields of the dissolute life led by men engaged in letters or in politics blondet for his sins had placed his powers at the service of finot's vices and idleness always at war with necessity he was one of the race of poverty-stricken and superior men who can do everything for the fortune of others and nothing for their own aladdins who let other men borrow their lamp these excellent advisers have a clear and penetrating judgment so long as it is not distracted by personal interest in them it is the head and not the arm that acts hence the looseness of their morality and hence the reproach heaped upon them by inferior minds 
blondet would share his purse with the comrade he had affronted the day before he would dine drink and sleep with one whom he would demolish on the morrow his amusing paradoxes excused everything accepting the whole world as a jest he did not want to be taken seriously young beloved almost famous and contented he did not devote himself like finot to acquiring the fortune an old man needs the most difficult form of courage perhaps is that which lucien needed at this moment to get rid of blondet as he had just got rid of madame d'espard and chatelet in him unfortunately the joys of vanity hindered the exercise of pride the basis beyond doubt of many great things his vanity had triumphed in the previous encounter he had shown himself as a rich man happy and scornful to two persons who had scorned him when he was poor and wretched but how could a poet like an old diplomat run the gauntlet with two self-styled friends who had welcomed him in misery under whose roof he had slept in the worst of his troubles finot blondet and he had grovelled together they had wallowed in such orgies as consume something more than money like soldiers who find no market for their courage lucien had just done what many men do in paris he had still further compromised his character by shaking finot's hand and not rejecting blondet's affection every man who has dabbled or still dabbles in journalism is under the painful necessity of bowing to men he despises of smiling at his dearest foe of compounding the foulest meanness of soiling his fingers to pay his aggressors in their own coin he becomes used to seeing evil done and passing it over he begins by condoning it and ends by committing it in the long run the soul constantly strained by shameful and perpetual compromise sinks lower the spring of noble thoughts grows rusty the hinges of familiarity wear easy and turn of their own accord alceste becomes filente natures lose their firmness talents are perverted faith in great deeds evaporates the man who yearned to be proud of his work wastes himself in rubbishy articles which his conscience regards sooner or later as so many evil actions he started like lousteau or vernou to be a great writer he finds himself a feeble scrivener hence it is impossible to honor too highly men whose character stands as high as their talent men like d'arthez who know how to walk sure-footed across the reefs of literary life lucien could make no reply to blondet's flattery his wit had an irresistible charm for him and he maintained the hold of the corrupter over his pupil besides he held a position in the world through his connection with the comtesse de montcornet has an uncle left you a fortune said finot laughing at him like you i have marked some fools for cutting down replied lucien in the same tone then monsieur has a review a newspaper of his own and finot retorted with the impertinent presumption of a chief to a subordinate i have something better replied lucien whose vanity nettled by the assumed superiority of his editor restored him to the sense of his new position what is that my dear boy i have a party there is a lucien party said vernou smiling finot the boy has left you in the lurch i told you he would lucien is a clever fellow and you never were respectful to him you used him as a hack repent blockhead said blondet 
blondet as sharp as a needle could detect more than one secret in lucien's air and manner while stroking him down he contrived to tighten the curb he meant to know the reasons of lucien's return to paris his projects and his means of living on your knees to a superiority you can never attain to albeit you are finot he went on admit this gentleman forthwith to be one of the great men to whom the future belongs he is one of us so witty and so handsome can he fail to succeed by your quibus cumque vius here he stands in his good milan armour his strong sword half unsheathed and his pennon flying bless me lucien where did you steal that smart waistcoat love alone can find such stuff as that have you an address at this moment i am anxious to know where my friends are domiciled i don't know where to sleep finot has turned me out of doors for the night under the vulgar pretext of a lady in the case my boy said lucien i put into practice a motto by which you may secure a quiet life fuge late take i am off but i am not off till you pay me a sacred debt that little supper you know eh said blondet who was rather too much given to good cheer and got himself treated when he was out of funds what supper asked lucien with a little stamp of impatience you don't remember in that i recognize my prosperous friend he has lost his memory he knows what he owes us i will go bail for his good heart said finot taking up blondet's joke rastignac said blondet taking the young dandy by the arm as he came up the room to the column where the so-called friends were standing there is a supper in the wind you will join us unless he added gravely turning to lucien monsieur persists in ignoring a debt of honour he can monsieur de rubempre is incapable of such a thing i will answer for him said rastignac who never dreamed of a practical joke and there is bichu he will come too cried blondet there is no fun without him without him champagne cloys my tongue and i find everything insipid even the pepper of satire my friends said bichu i see you have gathered round the wonder of the day our dear lucien has revived the metamorphoses of ovid just as the gods used to turn into strange vegetables and other things to seduce the ladies he has turned the chardon the thistle into a gentleman to bewitch whom charles the tenth my dear boy he went on holding lucien by his coat button a journalist who apes the fine gentleman deserves rough music in their place said the merciless jester as he pointed to finot and vernou i should take you up in my society paper you would bring in a hundred francs for ten columns of fun bichu said blondet an amphitryon is sacred for twenty-four hours before a feast and twelve hours after our illustrious friend is giving us a supper what then cried bichu what is more imperative than the duty of saving a great name from oblivion of endowing the indigent aristocracy with a man of talent lucien you enjoy the esteem of the press of which you were a distinguished ornament and we will give you our support finot a paragraph in the latest items blondet a little butter on the fourth page of your paper we must advertise the appearance of one of the finest books of the age l'archer de charles neuf we will appeal to dauriat to bring out as soon as possible les marguerites those divine sonnets by the french petrarch we must carry our friend through on the shield of stamped paper by which reputations are made and unmade 
if you want a supper said lucien to blondet hoping to rid himself of this mob which threatened to increase it seems to me that you need not work up hyperbole and parable to attack an old friend as if you were a booby to-morrow night at lointier's he cried seeing a woman come by whom he rushed to meet oh 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 said bixiou on three notes with a mocking glance and seeming to recognize the mask to whom lucien addressed himself this needs confirmation he followed the handsome pair got past them examined them keenly and came back to the great satisfaction of all the envious crowd who were eager to learn the source of lucien's change of fortune friends said bixiou you have long known the goddess of the sire de rubempre's fortune she is des lupeaux's former rat a form of dissipation now forgotten but still customary at the beginning of this century was the keeping of rats the rat a slang word that has become old-fashioned was a girl of ten or twelve in the chorus of some theatre more particularly at the opera who was trained by young roues to vice and infamy a rat was a sort of demon page a tomboy who was forgiven a trick if it were but funny the rat might take what she pleased she was to be watched like a dangerous animal and she brought an element of liveliness into life like scapin scannerelle and frontin in old-fashioned comedy but a rat was too expensive it made no return in honour profit or pleasure the fashion of rats so completely went out that in these days few people knew anything of this detail of fashionable life before the restoration till certain writers took up the rat as a new subject what after having seen coralie killed under him lucien means to rob us of la torpille the torpedo fish said blondet as he heard the name the brawny mask gave a significant start which though repressed was understood by rastignac it is out of the question replied finot la torpille has not a sou to give away nathan tells me she borrowed a thousand francs of florine come gentlemen gentlemen said rastignac anxious to defend lucien against so odious an imputation well cried vernou is coralie's kept man likely to be so very particular oh replied bixiou those thousand francs prove to me that our friend lucien lives with la torpille what an irreparable loss to literature science art and politics exclaimed blondet la torpille is the only common prostitute in whom i ever found the stuff for a superior courtesan she has not been spoiled by education she can neither read nor write she would have understood us we might have given to our era one of those magnificent aspasias without which there can be no golden age see how admirably madame du barry was suited to the eighteenth century ninon de l'enclos to the seventeenth marion de l'orme to the sixteenth imperia to the fifteenth flora to republican rome which she made her heir and which paid off the public debt with her fortune what would horace be without lydia tibullus without delia catullus without lesbia propertius without cynthia demetrius without lamia who is his glory at this day blondet talking of demetrius in the opera house seems to me rather too strong of the debat said bixiou in his neighbor's ears and where would the empire of the caesars have been but for these queens blondet went on lais and rhodope are greece and egypt they all indeed are the poetry of the ages in which they lived this poetry which napoleon lacked 
for the widow of his great army is a barrack jest was not wanting to the revolution it had madame tallien in these days there is certainly a throne to let in france which is for her who can fill it we among us could make a queen i should have given la torpia an aunt for her mother is too decidedly dead on the field of dishonor du tillet would have given her a mansion lousteau a carriage rastignac her footman des lupeaux a cook finot her hats finot could not suppress a shrug at standing the point-blank fire of this epigram vernou would have composed her advertisements and bichiou her repartees the aristocracy would have come to enjoy themselves with our ninon where we would have got artists together under pain of death by newspaper articles ninon the second would have been magnificently impertinent overwhelming in luxury she would have set up opinions some prohibited dramatic masterpiece should have been read in her drawing-room it should have been written on purpose if necessary she would not have been liberal a courtesan is essentially monarchical oh what a loss she ought to have embraced her whole century and she makes love with a little young man lucien will make a sort of hunting-dog of her none of the female powers of whom you speak ever trudged the streets said finot and that pretty little rat has rolled in the mire like a lily-seed in the soil replied vernou and she has improved in it and flowered hence her superiority must we not have known everything to be able to create the laughter and joy which are part of everything he is right said lousteau who had hitherto listened without speaking la torpille can laugh and make others laugh that gift of all great writers and great actors is proper to those who have investigated every social deep at eighteen that girl had already known the greatest wealth the most squalid misery men of every degree she bears about her a sort of magic wand by which she lets loose the brutal appetites so vehemently suppressed in men who still have a heart while occupied with politics or science literature or art there is not in paris another woman who can say to the beast as she does come out and the beast leaves his lair and wallows in excesses she feeds you up to the chin she helps you to drink and smoke in short this woman is the salt of which rabelais writes which thrown on matter animates it and elevates it to the marvellous realms of art her robe displays unimagined splendour her fingers drop gems as her lips shed smiles she gives the spirit of the occasion to every little thing her chatter twinkles with bright sayings she has the secret of the quaintest onomatopoeia full of colour and giving colour she you are wasting five francs worth of copy said bichiou interrupting lousteau la torpille is something far better than all that you have all been in love with her more or less not one of you can say that she ever was his mistress she can always command you you will never command her you may force your way in and ask her to do you a service oh she is more generous than a brigand chief who knows his business and more devoted than the best of schoolfellows said blondet you may trust her with your purse or your secrets but what made me choose her as queen is her bourbon-like indifference for a fallen favourite she like her mother is much too dear said des lupeaux the handsome dutch woman would have swallowed up the income of the archbishop of toledo she ate two notaries out of house and home 
and kept maxime de troyes when he was a court page said bixiou la torpille is too dear as raphael was or carême or taglioni or laurence or boule or any artist of genius is too dear said blondet esther never looked so thoroughly a lady said rastignac pointing to the masked figure to whom lucien had given his arm i will bet on its being madame de serizy not a doubt of it cried du chatelet and monsieur de rubempre's fortune is accounted for ah the church knows how to choose its levites what a sweet ambassador's secretary he will make remarked des lupeaulx all the more so rastignac went on because lucien is a really clever fellow these gentlemen have had proof of it more than once and he turned to blondet finot and lousteau yes the boy is cut out of the right stuff to get on said lousteau who was dying of jealousy and particularly because he has what we call independent ideas it is you who trained him said vernou well replied bixiou looking at des lupeaulx i trust to the memory of monsieur the secretary-general and master of appeals that mask is la torpille and i will stand a supper on it i will hold the stakes said du chatelet curious to know the truth come des lupeaulx said finot try to identify your rat's ears there is no need for committing the crime of treason against the mask replied bixiou la torpille and lucien must pass us as they go up to the room again and i pledge myself to prove that it is she so our friend lucien has come above water once more said nathan joining the group i thought he had gone back to angomois for the rest of his days has he discovered some secret to ruin the english he has done what you will not do in a hurry retorted rastignac he has paid up the burly mask nodded in confirmation a man who has sown his wild oats at his age puts himself out of court he has no pluck he puts money in the funds replied nathan oh that youngster will always be a fine gentleman and will always have such lofty notions as will place him far above many men who think themselves his betters replied rastignac at this moment journalists dandies and idlers were all examining the charming subject of their bet as horse-dealers examine a horse for sale these connoisseurs grown old in familiarity with every form of parisian depravity all men of superior talent each his own way equally corrupt equally corrupting all given over to unbridled ambition accustomed to assume and to guess everything had their eyes centred on a masked woman a woman whom no one else could identify they and certain habitual frequenters of the opera balls could alone recognize under the long shroud of the black domino the hood and falling ruff which make the wearer unrecognizable the rounded form the individuality of figure and gait the sway of the waist the carriage of the head the most intangible trifles to ordinary eyes but to them the easiest to discern in spite of this shapeless wrapper they could watch the most appealing of dramas that of a woman inspired by a genuine passion were she la torpille the duchesse de maufrigneuse or madame de serizy on the lowest or highest rung of the social ladder this woman was an exquisite creature a flash from happy dreams these old young men like these young old men felt so keen an emotion that they envied lucien the splendid privilege of working such a metamorphosis of a woman into a goddess 
the mask was there as though she had been alone with lucien for that woman the thousand other persons did not exist nor the evil and dust-laden atmosphere no she moved under the celestial vault of love as raphael's madonnas under their slender oval glory she did not feel herself elbowed the fire of her glance shot from the holes in her mask and sank into lucien's eyes the thrill of her frame seemed to answer to every movement of her companion whence comes this flame that radiates from a woman in love and distinguishes her above all others whence that sylph-like lightness which seems to negative the laws of gravitation is the soul become ambient has happiness a physical affluence the ingenuousness of a girl the graces of a child were discernible under the domino though they walked apart these two beings suggested the figures of flora and zephyr as we see them grouped by the cleverest sculptors but they were beyond sculpture the greatest of the arts lucien and his pretty domino were more like the angels busied with flowers or birds which gian bellini has placed beneath the effigies of the virgin mother lucien and this girl belonged to the realm of fancy which is as far above art as cause is above effect when the domino forgetful of everything was within a yard of the group bichiu exclaimed esther the unhappy girl turned her head quickly at hearing herself called recognized the mischievous speaker and bowed her head like a dying creature that has drawn its last breath a sharp laugh followed and the group of men melted among the crowd like a knot of frightened field rats whisking into their holes by the roadside rastignac alone went no further than was necessary just to avoid making any show of shunning lucien's flashing eye he could thus note two phases of distress equally deep though unconfessed first the hapless torpille stricken as by a lightning stroke and then the inscrutable mask the only one of the group who had remained esther murmured a word in lucien's ear just as her knees gave way and lucien supporting her led her away rastignac watched the pretty pair lost in meditation how did she get her name of la torpille asked a gloomy voice that struck to his vitals for it was no longer disguised he again he has made his escape muttered rastignac to himself be silent or i murder you replied the mask changing his voice i am satisfied with you you have kept your word and there is more than one arm ready to serve you henceforth be as silent as the grave but before that answer my question well the girl is such a witch that she could have magnetized the emperor napoleon she could magnetize a man more difficult to influence you yourself replied rastignac and he turned to go one moment said the mask i will prove to you that you have never seen me anywhere the speaker took his mask off for a moment rastignac hesitated recognizing nothing of the hideous being he had known formerly at madame vauquer's the devil has enabled you to change in every particular excepting your eyes which it is impossible to forget said he the iron hand gripped his arm to enjoin eternal secrecy at three in the morning des lupeaux and finot found the elegant rastignac on the same spot 
leaning against the column where the terrible mask had left him rastignac had confessed to himself he had been at once priest and penitent culprit and judge he allowed himself to be led away to breakfast and reached home perfectly tipsy but taciturn Section three of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter three. The Rue de Langlade and the adjacent streets are a blot on the Palais Royal and the Rue de Rivoli. This portion of one of the handsomest quarters of Paris will long retain the stain of foulness left by the hillocks formed of the middens of old paris on which mills formerly stood these narrow streets dark and muddy where such industries are carried on as care little for appearances wear at night an aspect of mystery full of contrasts on coming from the well-lighted regions of the rue st honore the rue neuve des petits champs and the rue de richelieu where the crowd is constantly pushing where glitter the masterpieces of industry fashion and art every man to whom paris by night is unknown would feel a sense of dread and melancholy on finding himself in the labyrinth of little streets which lie round that blaze of light reflected even from the sky dense blackness is here instead of floods of gaslight a dim oil lamp here and there sheds its doubtful and smoky gleam and many blind alleys are not lighted at all foot passengers are few and walk fast the shops are shut the few that are open are of a squalid kind a dirty unlighted wine shop or a cellar of underclothing and eau de cologne an unwholesome chill lays a clammy cloak over your shoulders few carriages drive past there are sinister places here especially the rue de l'anglade the entrance to the passage saint guillaume and the turnings of some streets the municipal council has not yet been to purge this vast lazar place for prostitution long since made it its headquarters it is perhaps a good thing for paris that these alleys should be allowed to preserve their filthy aspect passing through them by day it is impossible to imagine what they become by night they are pervaded by strange creatures of no known world white half-naked forms cling to the walls the darkness is alive between the passenger and the wall a dress steals by a dress that moves and speaks half-open doors suddenly shout with laughter words fall on the ear such as rabelais speaks of as frozen and melting snatches of songs come up from the pavement the noise is not vague it means something when it is hoarse it is a voice but if it suggests a song there is nothing human about it it is more like a croak often you hear a sharp whistle and then the tap of boot heels has a peculiarly aggressive and mocking ring this medley of things makes you giddy atmospheric conditions are reversed there it is warm in winter and cool in summer still whatever the weather this strange world always wears the same aspect it is the fantastic world of hoffmann of berlin the most mathematical of clerks never thinks of it as real after returning through the straits that lead into decent streets where there are passengers shops and taverns modern administration or modern policy more scornful or more shamefaced than the queens and kings of past ages no longer dare look boldly in the face of this plague of our capitals measures of course must change with the times and such as bear on individuals and on their liberty are a ticklish matter 
still we ought perhaps to show some breadth and boldness as to merely material measures air light and construction the moralist the artist and the sage administrator alike must regret the old wooden galleries of the palais royal where the lambs were to be seen who will always be found where there are loungers and is it not best that the loungers should go where they are to be found what is the consequence the gayest parts of the boulevards that delightfulest of promenades are impossible in the evening for a family party the police has failed to take advantage of the outlet afforded by some small streets to purge the main street the girl whom we have seen crushed by a word at the opera ball had been for the last month or two living in the rue de l'anglade in a very poor-looking house this structure stuck on to the wall of an enormously large one badly stuccoed of no depth and immensely high has all its windows on the street and bears some resemblance to a parrot's perch on each floor are two rooms let as separate flats there is a narrow staircase clinging to the wall queerly lighted by windows which mark its ascent on the outer wall each landing being indicated by a stink one of the most odious peculiarities of paris the shop and entresol at that time were tenanted by a tin man the landlord occupied the first floor the four upper stories were rented by very decent working girls who were treated by the portress and the proprietor with some consideration and an obligingness called forth by the difficulty of letting a house so oddly constructed and situated the occupants of the quarter are accounted for by the existence there of many houses of the same character for which trade has no use and which can only be rented by the poorer kinds of industry of a precarious or ignominious nature at three in the afternoon the portress who had seen mademoiselle esther brought home half dead by a young man at two in the morning had just held counsel with the young woman of the floor above who before setting out in a cab to join some party of pleasure had expressed her uneasiness about esther she had not heard her move esther was no doubt still asleep but this slumber seemed suspicious the portress alone in her cell was regretting that she could not go to see what was happening on the fourth floor where mademoiselle esther lodged just as she had made up her mind to leave the tin man's son in charge of her room a sort of den in a recess on the entresol floor a cab stopped at the door a man stepped out wrapped from head to foot in a cloak evidently intended to conceal his dress or his rank in life and asked for mademoiselle esther the portress at once felt relieved this accounted for esther's silence and quietude as the stranger mounted the stairs above the portress's room she noticed silver buckles in his shoes and fancied she caught sight of the black fringe of a priest's sash she went downstairs and catechized the driver who answered without speech and again the woman understood the priest knocked received no answer heard a slight gasp and forced the door open with a thrust of his shoulder charity no doubt lent him strength but in any one else it would have been ascribed to practice he rushed to the inner room and there found poor esther in front of an image of the virgin in painted plaster kneeling or rather doubled up on the floor her hands folded the girl was dying a brazier of burnt charcoal told the tale of that dreadful morning the domino cloak and hood were lying on the ground the bed was undisturbed the unhappy creature stricken to the heart by a mortal thrust 
had no doubt made all her arrangements on her return from the opera a candle wick collapsed in the pool of grease that filled the candle sconce showed how completely her last meditations had absorbed her a handkerchief soaked with tears proved the sincerity of the magdalen's despair while her classic attitude was that of the irreligious courtesan this abject repentance made the priest smile esther unskilled in dying had left the door open not thinking that the air of two rooms would need a larger amount of charcoal to make it suffocating she was only stunned by the fumes the fresh air from the staircase gradually restored her to a consciousness of her woes the priest remained standing lost in gloomy meditation without being touched by the girl's divine beauty watching her first movements as if she had been some animal his eyes went from the crouching figure to the surrounding objects with evident indifference he looked at the furniture in the room the paved floor red polished and cold was poorly covered with a shabby carpet worn to the string a little bedstead of painted wood and old-fashioned shape was hung with yellow cotton printed with red stars one armchair and two small chairs also of painted wood and covered with the same cotton print of which the window curtains were also made a gray wallpaper sprigged with flowers blackened and greasy with age a fireplace full of kitchen utensils of the vilest kind two bundles of fire logs a stone shelf on which lay some jewelry false and real a pair of scissors a dirty pincushion and some white scented gloves an exquisite hat perched on the water jug a terneau shawl stopping a hole in the window a handsome gown hanging from a nail a little hard sofa with no cushions broken clogs and dainty slippers boots that a queen might have coveted cheap china plates cracked or chipped with fragments of a past meal and nickel forks the plate of the paris poor a basket full of potatoes and dirty linen with a smart gauze cap on the top a rickety wardrobe with a glass door open and empty and on the shelves sundry pawn tickets this was the medley of things dismal or pleasing abject and handsome that fell on his eye these relics of splendor among the potsherds these household belongings so appropriate to the bohemian existence of the girl who knelt stricken in her unbuttoned garments like a horse dying in harness under the broken shafts and tangled in the reins did the whole strange scene suggest any thoughts to the priest did he say to himself that this erring creature must at least be disinterested to live in such poverty when her lover was young and rich did he ascribe the disorder of the room to the disorder of her life did he feel pity or terror was his charity moved to see him his arms folded his brow dark his lips set his eye harsh any one must have supposed him absorbed in morose feelings of hatred considerations that jostled each other sinister schemes he was certainly insensible to the soft roundness of a bosom almost crushed under the weight of the bowed shoulders and to the beautiful modelling of the crouching venus that was visible under the black petticoat so closely was the dying girl curled up the drooping head which seen from behind showed the white slender flexible neck and the fine shoulders of a well-developed figure did not appeal to him he did not raise esther he did not seem to hear the agonizing gasps which showed that she was returning to life a fearful sob and a terrifying glance from the girl were needed before he condescended to lift her 
and he carried her to the bed with an ease that revealed enormous strength lucien she murmured love is there the woman is not far behind said the priest with some bitterness the victim of parisian depravity then observed the dress worn by her deliverer and said with a smile like a child's when it takes possession of something longed for then i shall not die without being reconciled to heaven you may yet expiate your sins said the priest moistening her forehead with water and making her smell at a cruet of vinegar he found in a corner i feel that life instead of departing is rushing in on me said she after accepting the father's care and expressing her gratitude by simple gestures this engaging pantomime such as the graces might have used to charm perfectly justified the nickname given to this strange girl do you feel better said the priest giving her a glass of sugar and water to drink this man seemed accustomed to such queer establishments he knew all about it he was quite at home there this privilege of being everywhere at home is the prerogative of kings courtesans and thieves when you feel quite well this strange priest went on after a pause you must tell me the reasons which prompted you to commit this last crime this attempted suicide my story is very simple father replied she three months ago i was living the evil life to which i was born i was the lowest and vilest of creatures now i am only the most unhappy excuse me from telling you the history of my poor mother who was murdered by a captain in a house of ill fame said the priest interrupting the penitent i know your origin and i know that if a being of your sex can ever be excused for leading a life of shame it is you who have always lacked good examples alas i was never baptized and have no religious teaching all may yet be remedied then replied the priest provided that your faith your repentance are sincere and without ulterior motive lucien and god fill my heart said she with ingenuous pathos you might have said god and lucien answered the priest smiling you remind me of the purpose of my visit omit nothing that concerns that young man you have come from him she asked with a tender look that would have touched any other priest oh he thought i should do it no replied the priest it is not your death but your life that we are interested in come explain your position toward each other in one word said she the poor child quaked at the priest's stern tone but as a woman quakes who has long ceased to be surprised at brutality lucien is lucien said she the handsomest young man the kindest soul alive if you know him my love must seem to you quite natural i met him by chance three months ago at the porte saint martin theatre where i went one day when i had leave for we had a day a week at madame Maynardie's where i then was next day you understand i went out without leave love had come into my heart and had so completely changed me that on my return from the theatre i did not know myself i had a horror of myself lucien would never have known instead of telling him what i was i gave him my address at these rooms where a friend of mine was then living who was so kind as to give them up to me i swear on my sacred word you must not swear is it swearing to give your sacred word well from that day i have worked in this room like a lost creature at shirt-making at twenty-eight sous apiece so as to live by honest labor 
for a month i have had nothing to eat but potatoes that i might keep myself a good girl and worthy of lucien who loves me and respects me as a pattern of virtue i have made my declaration before the police to recover my rights and submitted to two years surveillance they are ready enough to enter your name on the lists of disgrace but make every difficulty about scratching it out again all i asked of heaven was to enable me to keep my resolution i shall be nineteen in the month of april at my age there is still a chance it seems to me that i was never born till three months ago i prayed to god every morning that lucien might never know what my former life had been i bought that virgin you see there and i prayed to her in my own way for i do not know any prayers i cannot read nor write and i have never been into a church i have never seen anything of god except in processions out of curiosity and what do you say to the virgin i talk to her as i talk to lucien with all my soul till i make him cry oh so he cries with joy said she eagerly poor dear boy we understand each other so well that we have but one soul he is so nice so fond so sweet in heart and mind and manners he says he is a poet i say he is a god forgive me you priests you see don't know what love is but in fact only girls like me know enough of men to appreciate such as lucien a lucien you see is as rare as a woman without sin when you come across him you can love no one else so there but such a being must have his fellow so i want to be worthy to be loved by my lucien that is where my trouble began last evening at the opera i was recognized by some young men who have no more feeling than a tiger has pity for that matter i could come round the tiger the veil of innocence i had tried to wear was torn off their laughter pierced my brain and my heart do not think you have saved me i shall die of grief your veil of innocence said the priest then you have treated lucien with the sternest severity oh father how can you who know him ask me such a question she replied with a smile who can resist a god do not be blasphemous said the priest mildly no one can be like god exaggeration is out of place with true love you had not a pure and genuine love for your idol if you had undergone the conversion you boast of having felt you would have acquired the virtues which are a part of womanhood you would have known the charm of chastity the refinements of modesty the two virtues that are the glory of a maiden you do not love esther's gesture of horror was seen by the priest but it had no effect on the impassibility of her confessor yes for you love him for yourself and not for himself for the temporal enjoyments that delight you and not for love itself if he has thus taken possession of you you cannot have felt that sacred thrill that is inspired by a being on whom god has set the seal of the most adorable perfections has it never occurred to you that you would degrade him by your past impurity that you would corrupt a child by the overpowering seductions which earned you your nickname glorious in infamy you have been illogical with yourself and your passion of a day of a day she repeated raising her eyes by what other name can you call a love that is not eternal that does not unite us in the future life of the christian to the being we love ah i will be a catholic she cried in a hollow vehement tone that would have earned her the mercy of the lord 
can a girl who has received neither the baptism of the church nor that of knowledge who can neither read nor write nor pray who cannot take a step without the stones in the street rising up to accuse her noteworthy only for the fugitive gift of beauty which sickness may destroy to-morrow can such a vile degraded creature fully aware too of her degradation for if you had been ignorant of it and less devoted you would have been more excusable can the intended victim to suicide and hell hope to be the wife of lucien de rubempre every word was a poniard thrust piercing the depths of her heart at every word the louder sobs and abundant tears of the desperate girl showed the power with which light had flashed upon an intelligence as pure as that of a savage upon a soul at length aroused upon a nature over which depravity had laid a sheet of foul ice now thawed in the sunshine of faith why did i not die was the only thought that found utterance in the midst of a torrent of ideas that racked and ravaged her brain my daughter said the terrible judge there is a love which is unconfessed before men but of which the secret is received by the angels with smiles of gladness what is that love without hope when it inspires our life when it fills us with the spirit of sacrifice when it ennobles every act by the thought of reaching some ideal perfection yes the angels approve of such love it leads to the knowledge of god to aim at perfection in order to be worthy of the one you love to make for him a thousand secret sacrifices adoring him from afar giving your blood drop by drop abnegating your self-love never feeling any pride or anger as regards him even concealing from him all knowledge of the dreadful jealousy he fires in your heart giving him all he wishes were it to your own loss loving what he loves always turning your face to him to follow him without his knowing it such love as that religion would have forgiven it is no offence to laws human or divine and would have led you into another road than that of your foul voluptuousness as she heard this horrible verdict uttered in a word and such a word and spoken in such a tone esther's spirit rose up in fairly legitimate distrust this word was like a thunderclap giving warning of a storm about to break she looked at the priest and felt the grip on her vitals which wrings the bravest when face to face with sudden and imminent danger no eye could have read what was passing in this man's mind but the boldest would have found more to quail at than to hope for in the expression of his eyes once bright and yellow like those of a tiger but now shrouded from austerities and privations with a haze like that which overhangs the horizon in the dog days when though the earth is hot and luminous the mist makes it indistinct and dim almost invisible the gravity of a spaniard the deep furrows which the myriad scars of virulent smallpox made hideously like broken ruts were ploughed into his face which was sallow and tanned by the sun the hardness of this countenance was all the more conspicuous being framed in the meagre dry wig of a priest who takes no care of his person a black wig looking rusty in the light his athletic frame his hands like an old soldier's his broad strong shoulders were those of the caryatides which the architects of the middle ages introduced into some italian palaces remotely imitated in those of the front of the port saint martin theatre the least clear-sighted observer might have seen that fiery passions or some unwonted accident 
must have thrown this man into the bosom of the church certainly none but the most tremendous shocks of lightning could have changed Section four of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter four. Women who have lived the life that Esther had so violently repudiated come to feel absolute indifference as to the critics of our day who may be compared with them in some respects and who feel at last perfect disregard of the formulas of art they have read so many books they see so many pass away they are so much accustomed to written pages they have gone through so many plots they have seen so many dramas they have written so many articles without saying what they meant and have so often been treasonable to the cause of art in favour of their personal likings and aversions that they acquire a feeling of disgust of everything and yet continue to pass judgment it needs a miracle to make such a writer produce sound work just as it needs another miracle to give birth to pure and noble love in the heart of a courtesan the tone and manner of this priest who seemed to have escaped from a picture by Zurbaran, struck this poor girl as so hostile little as externals affected her that she perceived herself to be less the object of his solicitude than the instrument he needed for some scheme being unable to distinguish between the insinuating tongue of personal interest and the unction of true charity for we must be acutely awake to recognize false coin when it is offered by a friend she felt herself as it were in the talons of some fierce and monstrous bird of prey who after hovering over her for long had pounced down on her and in her terror she cried in a voice of alarm i thought it was a priest's duty to console us and you are killing me at this innocent outcry the priest started and paused he meditated a moment before replying during that instant the two persons so strangely brought together studied each other cautiously the priest understood the girl though the girl could not understand the priest he no doubt put aside some plan which had threatened the unhappy esther and came back to his first ideas we are physicians of the soul said he in a mild voice and we know what remedies suit their maladies much must be forgiven to the wretched said esther she fancied she had been wrong she slipped off the bed threw herself at the man's feet kissed his gown with deep humility and looked up at him with eyes full of tears i thought i had done so much she said listen my child your terrible reputation has cast lucien's family into grief they are afraid and not without reason that you may lead him into dissipation into endless folly that is true it was i who got him to the ball to mystify him you are handsome enough to make him wish to triumph in you in the eyes of the world to show you with pride and make you an object for display and if he wasted money only but he will waste his time his powers he will lose his inclination for the fine future his friends can secure to him instead of being some day an ambassador rich admired and triumphant he like so many debauchees who choke their talents in the mud of paris will have been the lover of a degraded woman as for you after rising for a time to the level of a sphere of elegance you will presently sink back to your former life 
for you have not in you the strength bestowed by a good education to enable you to resist vice and think of the future you would no more be able to break with the women of your own class than you have broken with the men who shamed you at the opera this morning lucien's true friends alarmed by his passion for you have dogged his steps and know all filled with horror they have sent me to you to sound your views and decide your fate but though they are powerful enough to clear a stumbling-stone out of the young man's way they are merciful understand this child a girl whom lucien loves has claims on their regard as a true christian worships the slough on which by chance the divine light falls i came to be the instrument of a beneficent purpose still if i had found you utterly reprobate armed with effrontery and astuteness corrupt to the marrow deaf to the voice of repentance i should have abandoned you to their wrath the release civil and political which it is so hard to win which the police is so right to withhold for a time in the interests of society and which i heard you long for with all the ardor of true repentance is here said the priest taking an official-looking paper out of his belt you were seen yesterday this letter of release is dated to-day you see how powerful the people are who take an interest in lucien at the sight of this document esther was so ingenuously overcome by the convulsive agitation produced by unlooked-for joy that a fixed smile parted her lips like that of a crazy creature the priest paused looking at the girl to see whether when once she had lost the horrible strength which corrupt natures find in corruption itself and was thrown back on her frail and delicate primitive nature she could endure so much excitement if she had been a deceitful courtesan esther would have acted a part but now that she was innocent and herself once more she might perhaps die as a blind man cured may lose his sight again if he is exposed to too bright a light at this moment this man looked into the very depths of human nature but his calmness was terrible in its rigidity a cold alp snowbound and near to heaven impenetrable and frowning with flanks of granite and yet beneficent such women are essentially impressionable beings passing without reason from the most idiotic distrust to absolute confidence in this respect they are lower than animals extreme in everything in their joy and despair in their religion and irreligion they would almost all go mad if they were not decimated by the mortality peculiar to their class and if happy chances did not lift one now and then from the slough in which they dwell to understand the very depths of the wretchedness of this horrible existence one must know how far in madness a creature can go without remaining there by studying la torpille's violent ecstasy at the priest's feet the poor girl gazed at the paper of release with an expression which dante has overlooked and which surpassed the inventiveness of his inferno but a reaction came with tears esther rose threw her arms round the priest's neck laid her head on his breast which she wetted with her weeping kissing the coarse stuff that covered that heart of steel as if she fain would touch it she seized hold of him she covered his hands with kisses she poured out in a sacred effusion of gratitude her most coaxing caresses lavished fond names on him saying again and again in the midst of her honeyed words let me have it in a thousand different tones of voice she wrapped him in tenderness covered him with her looks with a swiftness that found him defenceless at last she charmed away his wrath 
the priest perceived how well the girl had deserved her nickname he understood how difficult it was to resist this bewitching creature he suddenly comprehended lucien's love and just what must have fascinated the poet such a passion hides among a thousand temptations a dart-like hook which is most apt to catch the lofty soul of an artist these passions inexplicable to the vulgar are perfectly accounted for by the thirst for ideal beauty which is characteristic of a creative mind for are we not in some degree akin to the angels whose task it is to bring the guilty to a better mind are we not creative when we purify such a creature how delightful it is to harmonize moral with physical beauty what joy and pride if we succeed how noble a task is that which has no instrument but love such alliances made famous by the example of aristotle socrates plato alcibiades cethegus and pompey and yet so monstrous in the eyes of the vulgar are based on the same feeling that prompted louis the fourteenth to build versailles or that makes men rush into any ruinous enterprise into converting the miasma of a marsh into a mass of fragrance surrounded by living waters placing a lake at the top of a hill as the prince de conti did at nointel or producing swiss scenery at casson like bergeret the farmer-general in short it is the application of art into the realm of morals the priest ashamed of having yielded to this weakness hastily pushed esther away and she sat down quite abashed for he said you are still the courtesan and he calmly replaced the paper in his sash esther like a child who has a single wish in its head kept her eyes fixed on the spot where the document lay hidden my child the priest went on after a pause your mother was a jewess and you have not been baptized but on the other hand you have never been taken to the synagogue you are in the limbo where little children are little children she echoed in a tenderly pathetic tone as you are on the books of the police a cipher outside the pale of social beings the priest went on unmoved if love seen as it swept past led you to believe three months since that you were then born you must feel that since that day you have been really an infant you must therefore be led as if you were a child you must be completely changed and i will undertake to make you unrecognizable to begin with you must forget lucien the words crushed the poor girl's heart she raised her eyes to the priest and shook her head she could not speak finding the executioner in the deliverer again at any rate you must give up seeing him he went on i will take you to a religious house where young girls of the best families are educated there you will become a catholic you will be trained in the practice of christian exercises you will be taught religion you may come out an accomplished young lady chaste pure well brought up if the man lifted up a finger and paused if he went on you feel brave enough to leave the torpille behind you here ah cried the poor thing to whom each word had been like a note of some melody to which the gates of paradise were slowly opening ah if it were possible to shed all my blood here and have it renewed listen to me she was silent your future fate depends on your power of forgetting think of the extent to which you pledge yourself a word a gesture which betrays la torpille will kill lucien's wife a word murmured in a dream an involuntary thought an immodest glance 
a gesture of impatience a reminiscence of dissipation an omission a shake of the head that might reveal what you know or what is known about you for your woes yes yes father said the girl with the exaltation of a saint to walk in shoes of red-hot iron and smile to live in a pair of stays set with nails and maintain the grace of a dancer to eat bread salted with ashes to drink wormwood all will be sweet and easy she fell again on her knees she kissed the priest's shoes she melted into tears that wetted them she clasped his knees and clung to them murmuring foolish words as she wept for joy her long and beautiful light hair waved to the ground a sort of carpet under the feet of the celestial messenger whom she saw as gloomy and hard as ever when she lifted herself up and looked at him what have i done to offend you cried she quite frightened i have heard of a woman such as i am who washed the feet of jesus with perfumes alas virtue has made me so poor that i have nothing but tears to offer you have you not understood he answered in a cruel voice i tell you you must be able to come out of the house to which i shall take you so completely changed physically and morally that no man or woman you have ever known will be able to call you esther and make you look round yesterday your love could not give you strength enough so completely to bury the prostitute that she could never reappear and again to-day she revives in adoration which is due to none but god was it not he who sent you to me said she if during the course of your education you should even see lucien all would be lost he went on remember that who will comfort him said she what was it that you comforted him for asked the priest in a tone in which for the first time during this scene there was a nervous quaver i do not know he was often sad when he came sad said the priest did he tell you why never answered she he was sad at loving such a girl as you exclaimed he alas and well he might be said she with deep humility i am the most despicable creature of my sex and i could find favor in his eyes only by the greatness of my love that love must give you the courage to obey me blindly if i were to take you straight from hence to the house where you are to be educated everybody here would tell lucien that you had gone away to-day sunday with a priest he might follow in your tracks in the course of a week the portress not seeing me again might suppose me to be what i am not so one evening this day week at seven o'clock go out quietly and get into a cab that will be waiting for you at the bottom of the rue des frondaires during this week avoid lucien find excuses have him sent from the door and if he should come in go up to some friend's room i shall know if you have seen him and in that event all will be at an end i shall not even come back these eight days you will need to make up some suitable clothing and to hide your look of a prostitute said he laying a purse on the chimney shelf there is something in your manner in your clothes something indefinable which is well known to parisians and proclaims you what you are have you never met in the streets or on the boulevards a modest and virtuous girl walking with her mother oh yes to my sorrow the sight of a mother and daughter is one of our most cruel punishments it arouses the remorse that lurks in the innermost folds of our hearts and that is consuming us i know too well all i lack well then you know how you should look next sunday said the priest rising oh said she teach me one real prayer before you go that i may pray to god 
it was a touching thing to see the priest making this girl repeat ave maria and pater noster in french that is very fine said esther when she had repeated these two grand and universal utterances of the catholic faith without making a mistake what is your name she asked the priest when he took leave of her carlos herrera i am a spaniard banished from my country esther took his hand and kissed it she Section five of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter five. In a religious institution famous for the aristocratic and pious teaching imparted there, one Monday morning in the beginning of March eighteen twenty four the pupils found their pretty flock increased by a newcomer whose beauty triumphed without dispute not only over that of her companions but over the special details of beauty which were found severally in perfection in each one of them in france it is extremely rare not to say impossible to meet with the thirty points of perfection described in persian verse and engraved it is said in the seraglio which are needed to make a woman absolutely beautiful though in france the whole is seldom seen we find exquisite parts as to that imposing union which sculpture tries to produce and has produced in a few rare examples like the diana and the calipige it is the privileged possession of greece and asia minor esther came from that cradle of the human race her mother was a jewess the jews though so often deteriorated by their contact with other nations have among their many races families in which this sublime type of asiatic beauty has been preserved when they are not repulsively hideous they present the splendid characteristics of armenian beauty esther would have carried off the prize at the seraglio she had the thirty points harmoniously combined far from having damaged the finish of her modelling and the freshness of her flesh her strange life had given her the mysterious charm of womanhood it is no longer the close waxy texture of green fruit and not yet the warm glow of maturity there is still the scent of the flower a few days longer spent in dissolute living and she would have been too fat this abundant health this perfection of the animal in a being in whom voluptuousness took the place of thought must be a remarkable fact in the eyes of physiologists a circumstance so rare that it may be called impossible in very young girls was that her hands incomparably fine in shape were as soft transparent and white as those of a woman after the birth of her second child she had exactly the hair and the foot for which the duchesse de berry was so famous hair so thick that no hairdresser could gather it into his hand and so long that it fell to the ground in rings for esther was of that medium height which makes a woman a sort of toy to be taken up and set down taken up again and carried without fatigue her skin as fine as rice paper of a warm amber hue showing the purple veins was satiny without dryness soft without being clammy esther excessively strong though apparently fragile arrested attention by one feature that is conspicuous in the faces in which raphael has shown his most artistic feeling for raphael is the painter who has most studied and best rendered jewish beauty this remarkable effect was produced by the depth of the eye socket under which the eye moved free from its setting 
the arch of the brow was so accurate as to resemble the groining of a vault when youth lends this beautiful hollow its pure and diaphanous colouring and edges it with closely set eyebrows when the light stealing into the circular cavity beneath lingers there with a rosy hue there are tender treasures in it to delight a lover beauties to drive a painter to despair those luminous curves where the shadows have a golden tone that tissue as firm as a sinew and as mobile as the most delicate membrane is a crowning achievement of nature the eye at rest within is like a miraculous egg in a nest of silken wings but as time goes on this marvel acquires a dreadful melancholy when passions have laid dark smears on those fine forms when grief has furrowed that network of delicate veins esther's nationality proclaimed itself in this oriental modelling of her eyes with their turkish lids their colour was a slate grey which by night took on the blue sheen of a raven's wing it was only the extreme tenderness of her expression that could moderate their fire only those races that are native to deserts have in the eye the power of fascinating everybody for any woman can fascinate some one person their eyes preserve no doubt something of the infinitude they have gazed on has nature in her foresight armed their retina with some reflecting background to enable them to endure the mirage of the sand the torrents of sunshine and the burning cobalt of the sky or do human beings like other creatures derive something from the surroundings among which they grow up and preserve for ages the qualities they have imbibed from them the great solution of this problem of race lies perhaps in the question itself instincts are living facts and their cause dwells in past necessity variety in animals is the result of the exercise of these instincts to convince ourselves of this long sought for truth it is enough to extend to the herd of mankind the observation recently made on flocks of spanish and english sheep which in low meadows where pasture is abundant feed side by side in close array but on mountains where grass is scarce scatter apart take these two kinds of sheep transfer them to switzerland or france the mountain breeds will feed apart even in a lowland meadow of thick grass the lowland sheep will keep together even on an alp hardly will a succession of generations eliminate acquired and transmitted instincts after a century the highland spirit reappears in a refractory lamb just as after eighteen centuries of exile the spirit of the east shone in esther's eyes and features her look had no terrible fascination it shed a mild warmth it was pathetic without being startling and the sternest wills were melted in its flame esther had conquered hatred she had astonished the depraved souls of paris in short that look and the softness of her skin had earned her the terrible nickname which had just led her to the verge of the grave everything about her was in harmony with these characteristics of the peri of the burning sands her forehead was firmly and proudly moulded her nose like that of the arab race was delicate and narrow with oval nostrils well set and open at the base her mouth fresh and red was a rose unblemished by a flaw dissipation had left no trace there her chin rounded as though some amorous sculptor had polished its fullness was as white as milk one thing only that she had not been able to remedy betrayed the courtesan fallen very low her broken nails which needed time to recover their shape 
so much had they been spoiled by the vulgarest household tasks the young boarders began by being jealous of these marvels of beauty but they ended by admiring them before the first week was at an end they were all attached to the artless jewess for they were interested in the unknown misfortunes of a girl of eighteen who could neither read nor write to whom all knowledge and instruction were new and who was to earn for the archbishop the triumph of having converted a jewess to catholicism and giving the convent a festival in her baptism they forgave her beauty finding themselves her superiors in education esther very soon caught the manners the accent the carriage and attitudes of these highly bred girls in short her first nature reasserted itself the change was so complete that on his first visit herrera was astonished as it would seem and the mother superior congratulated him on his ward never in their existence as teachers had these sisters met with a more charming nature more christian meekness true modesty nor a greater eagerness to learn when a girl has suffered such misery as had overwhelmed this poor child and looks forward to such a reward as the spaniard held out to esther it is hard if she does not realize the miracles of the early church which the jesuits revived in paraguay she is edifying said the superior kissing her on the brow and this essentially catholic word tells all in recreation hours esther would question her companions but discreetly as to the simplest matters in fashionable life which to her were like the first strange ideas of life to a child when she heard that she was to be dressed in white on the day of her baptism and first communion that she should wear a white satin fillet white bows white shoes white gloves and white rosettes in her hair she melted into tears to the amazement of her companions it was the reverse of the scene of jephthah on the mountain the courtesan was afraid of being understood she ascribed this dreadful dejection to the joy with which she looked forward to the function as there is certainly as wide a gulf between the habits she had given up and the habits she was acquiring as there is between the savage state and civilization she had the grace and simplicity and depth which distinguished the wonderful heroine of the american puritans she had too without knowing it a love that was eating out her heart a strange love a desire more violent in her who knew everything than it can be in a maiden who knows nothing though the two forms of desire have the same cause and the same end in view during the first few months the novelty of a secluded life the surprises of learning the handiworks she was taught the practices of religion the fervency of a holy resolve the gentle affections she called forth and the exercise of the faculties of her awakened intelligence all helped to repress her memory even the effort she made to acquire a new one for she had as much to unlearn as to learn there is more than one form of memory the body and mind have each their own homesickness for instance is a malady of the physical memory thus during the third month the vehemence of this virgin soul soaring to paradise on outspread wings was not indeed quelled but fettered by a dull rebellion of which esther herself did not know the cause like the scottish sheep she wanted to pasture in solitude she could not conquer the instincts begotten of debauchery was it that the foul ways of the paris she had abjured were calling her back to them did the chains of the hideous habits she had renounced cling to her by forgotten rivets 
and was she feeling them as old soldiers suffer still the surgeons tell us in the limbs they have lost had vice and excess so soaked into her marrow that holy waters had not yet exorcised the devil lurking there was the sight of him for whom her angelic efforts were made necessary to the poor soul whom god would surely forgive for mingling human and sacred love one had led to the other was there some transposition of the vital force in her involving her in inevitable suffering everything is doubtful and obscure in a case which science scorns to study regarding the subject as too immoral and too compromising as if the physician and the writer the priest and the political student were not above all suspicion however a doctor who was stopped by death had the courage to begin an investigation which he left unfinished perhaps the dark depression to which esther fell a victim and which cast a gloom over her happy life was due to all these causes and perhaps unable as she was to suspect them herself she suffered as sick creatures suffer who know nothing of medicine or surgery the fact is strange wholesome and abundant food in the place of bad and inflammatory nourishment did not sustain esther a pure and regular life divided between recreation and studies intentionally abridged taking the place of a disorderly existence of which the pleasures and the pains were equally horrible exhausted the convent boarder the coolest rest the calmest nights taking the place of crushing fatigue and the most torturing agitation gave her low fever in which the common symptoms were imperceptible to the nursing sister's eye or finger in fact virtue and happiness following on evil and misfortune security in the stead of anxiety were as fatal to esther as her past wretchedness would have been to her young companions planted in corruption she had grown up in it that infernal home still had a hold on her in spite of the commands of a despotic will what she loathed was life to her what she loved was killing her her faith was so ardent that her piety was a delight to those about her she loved to pray she had opened her spirit to the lights of true religion and received it without an effort or a doubt the priest who was her director was delighted with her still at every turn her body resisted the spirit to please a whim of madame de maintenon's who fed them with scraps from the royal table some carp were taken out of a muddy pool and placed in a marble basin of bright clean water the carp perished the animals might be sacrificed but man could never infect them with the leprosy of flattery a courtier remarked at versailles on this mute resistance they are like me said the uncrowned queen they pine for their obscure mud this speech epitomizes esther's story at times the poor girl was driven to run about the splendid convent gardens she hurried from tree to tree she rushed into the darkest nooks seeking what she did not know but she fell a prey to the demon she carried on a flirtation with the trees she appealed to them in unspoken words sometimes in the evening she stole along under the walls like a snake without any shawl over her bare shoulders often in chapel during the service she remained with her eyes fixed on the crucifix melted to tears the others admired her but she was crying with rage instead of the sacred images she hoped to see those glaring nights when she had led some orgy as habeneck leads a beethoven symphony at the conservatoire 
nights of laughter and lasciviousness with vehement gestures inextinguishable laughter rose before her frenzied furious and brutal she was as mild to look upon as a virgin that clings to earth only by her woman's shape within raged an imperial messalina she alone knew the secret of this struggle between the devil and the angel when the superior reproved her for having done her hair more fashionably than the rule of the house allowed she altered it with prompt and beautiful submission she would have cut her hair off if the mother had required it of her this moral homesickness was truly pathetic in a girl who would rather have perished than have returned to the depths of impurity she grew pale and altered and thin the superior gave her shorter lessons and called the interesting creature to her room to question her but esther was happy she enjoyed the society of her companions she felt no pain in any vital part still it was vitality itself that was attacked she regretted nothing she wanted nothing the superior puzzled by her boarder's answers did not know what to think when she saw her pining under consuming debility the doctor was called in when the girl's condition seemed serious but this doctor knew nothing of esther's previous life and could not guess it he found every organ sound the pain could not be localized the invalid's replies were such as to upset every hypothesis there remained one way of clearing up the learned man's doubts which now lighted on a frightful suggestion but esther obstinately refused to submit to a medical examination in this difficulty the superior appealed to the abbe herrera the spaniard came saw that esther's condition was desperate and took the physician aside for a moment after this confidential interview the man of science told the man of faith that the only cure lay in a journey to italy the abbe would not hear of such a journey before esther's baptism and first communion how long will it be till then asked the doctor a month replied the superior she will be dead said the doctor yes but in a state of grace and salvation said the abbe in spain the religious question is supreme above all political civil or vital considerations so the physician did not answer the spaniard he turned to the mother superior but the terrible abbe took him by the arm and stopped him not a word monsieur said he the doctor though a religious man and a monarchist looked at esther with an expression of tender pity the girl was as lovely as a lily drooping on its stem god help her then he exclaimed as he went away on the very day of this consultation esther was taken by her protector to the rocher de cancale a famous restaurant for his wish to save her had suggested strange expedients to the priest he tried the effect of two excesses an excellent dinner which might remind the poor child of past orgies and the opera which would give her mind some images of worldliness his despotic authority was needed to tempt the young saint to such profanation herrera disguised himself so effectually as a military man that esther hardly recognized him he took care to make his companion wear a veil and put her in a box where she was hidden from all eyes this palliative which had no risks for innocence so sincerely regained soon lost its effect the convent boarder viewed her protector's dinners with disgust had a religious aversion for the theatre and relapsed into melancholy she is dying of love for lucien said herrera to himself 
he had wanted to sound the depths of this soul and know how much could be exacted from it so the moment came when the poor child was no longer upheld by moral force and the body was about to break down the priest calculated the time with the hideous practical sagacity formerly shown by executioners in the art of torture he found his protege in the garden sitting on a bench under a trellis on which the april sun fell gently she seemed to be cold and trying to warm herself her companions looked with interest at her pallor as of a folded plant her eyes like those of a dying gazelle her drooping attitude esther rose and went to meet the spaniard with a lassitude that showed how little life there was in her and it may be added how little care to live this hapless outcast this wild and wounded swallow moved carlos herrera to compassion for the second time the gloomy minister whom god should have employed only to carry out his revenges received the sick girl with a smile which expressed indeed as much bitterness as sweetness as much vengeance as charity esther practised in meditation and used to revulsions of feeling since she had led this almost monastic life felt on her part for the second time distrust of her protector but as on the former occasion his speech reassured her well my dear child said he and why have you never spoken to me of lucien i promised you she said shuddering convulsively from head to foot i swore to you that i would never breathe his name and yet you have not ceased to think of him that monsieur is the only fault i have committed i think of him always and just as you came i was saying his name to myself absence is killing you esther's only answer was to hang her head as the sick do who already scent the breath of the grave if you could see him said he it would be life she cried and do you think of him only spiritually ah oh, monsieur love cannot be dissected child of an accursed race i have done everything to save you i send you back to your fate you shall see him again why insult my happiness can i not love lucien and be virtuous am i not ready to die here for virtue as i should be ready to die for him am i not dying for these two fanaticisms for virtue which was to make me worthy of him and for him who flung me into the embrace of virtue yes and ready to die without seeing him or to live by seeing him god is my judge the color had mounted to her face her whiteness had recovered its amber warmth esther looked beautiful again the day after that on which you are washed in the waters of baptism you shall see lucien once more and if you think you can live in virtue by living for him you shall part no more the priest was obliged to lift up esther whose knees failed her the poor child dropped as if the ground had slipped from under her feet the abbe seated her on a bench and when she could speak again she asked him why not to-day do you want to rob monseigneur of the triumph of your baptism and conversion you are too close to lucien not to be far from god yes i was not thinking you will never be of any religion said the priest with a touch of the deepest irony god is good said she he can read my heart conquered by the exquisite artlessness and gestures herrera kissed her on the forehead for the first time your libertine friends named you well you would bewitch god the father 
a few days more must pass and then you will both be free both she echoed in an ecstasy of joy this scene observed from a distance struck pupils and superiors alike they fancied they had looked on at a miracle as they compared esther with herself she was completely changed she was alive she reappeared her natural self all love sweet Section six of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter six. Herrera lived in the Rue Cassette, near Saint Sulpice, the church to which he was attached. This building, hard and stern in style, suited this Spaniard, whose discipline was that of the Dominicans. A lost son of Ferdinand the Seventh's astute policy, he devoted himself to the cause of the Constitution, knowing that this devotion could never be rewarded till the restoration of the Rey Neto. Carlos Herrera had thrown himself body and soul into the Camarilla, at the moment when the cortes seemed likely to stand and hold their own to the world this conduct seemed to proclaim a superior soul the duc d'angouleme's expedition had been carried out king ferdinand was on the throne and carlos herrera did not go to claim the reward of his services at madrid fortified against curiosity by his diplomatic taciturnity he assigned as his reason for remaining in paris his strong affection for lucien de rubempre to which the young man already owed the king's patent relating to his change of name herrera lived very obscurely as priests employed on secret missions traditionally live he fulfilled his religious duties at saint sulpice never went out but on business and then after dark and in a hackney cab his day was filled up with a siesta in the spanish fashion which arranges for sleep between the two chief meals and so occupies the hours when paris is in a busy turmoil the spanish cigar also played its part and consumed time as well as tobacco laziness is a mask as gravity is and that again is laziness herrera lived on the second floor in one wing of the house and lucien occupied the other wing the two apartments were separated and joined by a large reception room of antique magnificence suitable equally to the grave priest and to the young poet the courtyard was gloomy large thick trees shaded the garden silence and reserve are always found in the dwellings chosen by priests herrera's lodging may be described in one word a cell lucien's splendid with luxury and furnished with every refinement of comfort combined everything that the elegant life of a dandy demands a poet a writer ambitious and dissipated at once vain and vainglorious utterly heedless and yet wishing for order one of those incomplete geniuses who have some power to wish to conceive which is perhaps the same thing but no power at all to execute these two lucien and herrera formed a body politic this no doubt was the secret of their union old men in whom the activities of life have been uprooted and transplanted to the sphere of interest often feel the need of a pleasing instrument a young and impassioned actor to carry out their schemes richelieu too late found a handsome pale face with a young moustache to cast in the way of women whom he wanted to amuse 
misunderstood by giddy-pated younger men he was compelled to banish his master's mother and terrify the queen after having tried to make each fall in love with him though he was not cut out to be loved by queens do what we will always in the course of an ambitious life we find a woman in the way just when we least expect such an obstacle however great a political man may be he always needs a woman to set against a woman just as the dutch use a diamond to cut a diamond rome at the height of its power yielded to this necessity and observe how immeasurably more imposing was the life of mazarin the italian cardinal than that of richelieu the french cardinal richelieu met with opposition from the great nobles and he applied the axe he died in the flower of his success worn out by this duel for which he had only a capuchin monk as his second mazarin was repulsed by the citizen class and the nobility armed allies who sometimes victoriously put royalty to flight but anne of austria's devoted servant took off no heads he succeeded in vanquishing the whole of france and trained louis the fourteenth who completed richelieu's work by strangling the nobility with gilded cords in the grand seraglio of versailles madame de pompadour dead choiseul fell had herrera soaked his mind in these high doctrines had he judged himself at an earlier age than richelieu had he chosen lucien to be his cinq mars but a faithful cinq mars no one could answer these questions or measure the spaniard's ambition as no one could foresee what his end might be these questions asked by those who were able to see anything of this coalition which was long kept a secret might have unveiled a horrible mystery which lucien himself had known but a few days carlos was ambitious for two that was what his conduct made plain to those persons who knew him and who all imagined that lucien was the priest's illegitimate son fifteen months after lucien's reappearance at the opera ball which led him too soon into a world where the priest had not wished to see him till he should have fully armed him against it he had three fine horses in his stable a coupe for evening use a cab and a tilbury to drive by day he dined out every day herrera's foresight was justified his pupil was carried away by dissipation he thought it necessary to effect some diversion in the frenzied passion for esther that the young man still cherished in his heart after spending something like forty thousand francs every folly had brought lucien back with increased eagerness to la torpille he searched for her persistently and as he could not find her she became to him what game is to the sportsman could herrera understand the nature of a poet's love when once this feeling has mounted to the brain of one of these great little men after firing his heart and absorbing his senses the poet becomes as far superior to humanity through love as he already is through the power of his imagination a freak of intellectual heredity has given him the faculty of expressing nature by imagery to which he gives the stamp both of sentiment and of thought and he lends his love the wings of his spirit he feels and he paints he acts and meditates he multiplies his sensations by thought present felicity becomes threefold through aspiration for the future and memory of the past and with it he mingles the exquisite delights of the soul which makes him the prince of artists then the poet's passion becomes a fine poem in which human proportion is often set at naught 
does not the poet then place his mistress far higher than women crave to sit like the sublime knight of la mancha he transfigures a peasant girl to be a princess he uses for his own behoof the wand with which he touches everything turning it into a wonder and thus enhances the pleasure of loving by the glorious glamour of the ideal such a love is the very essence of passion it is extreme in all things in its hopes in its despair in its rage in its melancholy in its joy it flies it leaps it crawls it is not like any of the emotions known to ordinary men it is to everyday love what the perennial alpine torrent is to the lowland brook these splendid geniuses are so rarely understood that they spend themselves in hopes deceived they are exhausted by the search for their ideal mistress and almost always die like gorgeous insects splendidly adorned for their love festival by the most poetical of nature's inventions and crushed under the foot of a passer-by but there is another danger when they meet with the form that answers to their soul and which not unfrequently is that of a baker's wife they do as raphael did as the beautiful insect does they die in the fornarina's arms lucien was at this pass his poetical temperament excessive in all things in good as in evil had discerned the angel in this girl who was tainted by corruption rather than corrupt he always saw her white winged pure and mysterious as she had made herself for him understanding that he would have her so towards the end of the month of may eighteen twenty five lucien had lost all his good spirits he never went out dined with herrera sat pensive worked read volumes of diplomatic treatises squatted turkish fashion on a divan and smoked three or four hookahs a day his groom had more to do in cleaning and perfuming the tubes of this noble pipe than in currying and brushing down the horses coats and dressing them with cockades for driving in the bois as soon as the spaniard saw lucien pale and detected a malady in the frenzy of suppressed passion he determined to read to the bottom of this man's heart on which he founded his life one fine evening when lucien lounging in an armchair was mechanically contemplating the hues of the setting sun through the trees in the garden blowing up the mist of scented smoke in slow regular clouds as pensive smokers are wont he was roused from his reverie by hearing a deep sigh he turned and saw the abbe standing by him with folded arms you were there said the poet for some time said the priest my thoughts have been following the wide sweep of yours lucien understood his meaning i have never affected to have an iron nature such as yours is to me life is by turns paradise and hell when by chance it is neither it bores me and i am bored how can you be bored when you have such splendid prospects before you if i have no faith in those prospects or if they are too much shrouded do not talk nonsense said the priest it would be far more worthy of you and of me that you should open your heart to me there is now that between us which ought never to have come between us a secret this secret has subsisted for sixteen months you are in love and what then a foul hussy called la torpille well my boy i told you you might have a mistress but a woman of rank pretty young influential a countess at least i had chosen madame d'espard for you to make her the instrument of your fortune without scruple 
for she would never have perverted your heart she would have left you free to love a prostitute of the lowest class when you have not like kings the power to give her high rank is a monstrous blunder and am i the first man who had renounced ambition to follow the lead of a boundless passion good said the priest stooping to pick up the mouthpiece of the hookah which lucien had dropped on the floor i understand the retort cannot love and ambition be reconciled child you have a mother in old herrera a mother who is wholly devoted to you i know it old friend said lucien taking his hand and shaking it you wished for the toys of wealth you have them you want to shine i am guiding you into the paths of power i kiss very dirty hands to secure your advancement and you will get on a little while yet and you will lack nothing of what can charm man or woman though effeminate in your caprices your intellect is manly i have dreamed all things of you i forgive you all you have only to speak to have your ephemeral passions gratified i have aggrandized your life by introducing into it that which makes it delightful to most people the stamp of political influence and dominion you will be as great as you now are small but you must not break the machine by which we coin money i grant you all you will excepting such blunders as will destroy your future prospects when i can open the drawing-rooms of the faubourg saint germain to you i forbid your wallowing in the gutter lucien i mean to be an iron stanchion in your interest i will endure everything from you for you thus i have transformed your lack of tact in the game of life into the shrewd stroke of a skilful player lucien looked up with a start of furious impetuosity i carried off la torpille you cried lucien in a fit of animal rage the poet jumped up flung the jewelled mouthpiece in the priest's face and pushed him with such violence as to throw down that strong man i said the spaniard getting up and preserving his terrible gravity his black wig had fallen off a bald skull as shining as a death's head showed the man's real countenance it was appalling lucien sat on his divan his hands hanging limp overpowered and gazing at the abbe with stupefaction i carried her off the priest repeated what did you do with her you took her away the day after the opera ball yes the day after i had seen a woman who belonged to you insulted by wretches whom i would not have condescended to kick downstairs wretches interrupted lucien say rather monsters compared with whom those who are guillotined are angels do you know what the unhappy torpy had done for three of them one of them was her lover for two months she was poor and picked up a living in the gutter he had not a sou like me when you rescued me he was very near the river this fellow would get up at night and go to the cupboard where the girl kept the remains of her dinner and eat it at last she discovered the trick she understood the shameful thing and took care to leave a great deal then she was happy she never told any one but me that night coming home from the opera the second had stolen some money but before the theft was found out she lent him the sum which he was enabled to replace and which he always forgot to repay to the poor child as to the third she made his fortune by playing out a farce worthy of figaro's genius she passed as his wife and became the mistress of a man in power who believed her to be the most innocent of good citizens to one she gave life to another honor 
to the third fortune what does it all count for to-day and this is how they reward her would you like to see them dead said herrera in whose eyes there were tears come that is just like you i know you by that nay hear all raving poet said the priest la torpille is no more lucien flew at herrera to seize him by the throat with such violence that any other man must have fallen backwards but the spaniard's arm held off his assailant come listen said he coldly i have made another woman of her chaste pure well-bred religious a perfect lady she is being educated she can if she may under the influence of your love become a ninon a marion de l'homme a du barry as the journalist at the opera ball remarked you may proclaim her your mistress or you may retire behind a curtain of your own creating which will be wiser by either method you will gain profit and pride pleasure and advancement but if you are as great a politician as you are a poet esther will be no more to you than any other woman of the town for later perhaps she may help us out of difficulties she is worth her weight in gold drink but do not get tipsy if i had not held the reins of your passion where would you be now rolling with la torpille in the slough of misery from which i dragged you here read this said herrera as simply as talma in manlius which he had never seen a sheet of paper was laid on the poet's knees and startled him from the ecstasy and surprise with which he had listened to this astounding speech he took it and read the first letter written by mademoiselle esther to monsieur l'abbe carlos herrera my dear protector will you not suppose that gratitude is stronger in me than love when you see that the first use i make of the power of expressing my thoughts is to thank you instead of devoting it to pouring forth a passion that lucien has perhaps forgotten but to you divine man i can say what i should not dare to tell him who to my joy still clings to earth yesterday's ceremony has filled me with treasures of grace and i place my fate in your hands even if i must die far away from my beloved i shall die purified like the magdalen and my soul will become to him the rival of his guardian angel can i ever forget yesterday's festival how could i wish to abdicate the glorious throne to which i was raised yesterday i washed away every stain in the waters of baptism and received the sacred body of my redeemer i am become one of his tabernacles at that moment i heard the songs of angels i was more than a woman born to a life of light amid the acclamations of the whole earth admired by the world in a cloud of incense and prayers that were intoxicating adorned like a virgin for the heavenly spouse thus finding myself worthy of lucien which i had never hoped to be i abjured impure love and vowed to walk only in the paths of virtue if my flesh is weaker than my spirit let it perish be the arbiter of my destiny and if i die tell lucien that i died to him when i was born to god lucien looked up at the abbe with eyes full of tears you know the rooms fat caroline belfoy had in the rue tebou the spaniard said the poor creature cast off by her magistrate was in the greatest poverty she was about to be sold up i bought the place all standing and she turned out with her clothes esther the angel who aspired to heaven has alighted there 
and is waiting for you at this moment lucien heard his horses pawing the ground in the courtyard he was incapable of expressing his admiration for a devotion which he alone could appreciate he threw himself into the arms of the man he had insulted made amends for all by a look and the speechless effusion of his feelings then he flew downstairs confided esther's address to his tiger's ear and the horse Section seven of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter seven. The next day, a man who by his dress might have been mistaken by the passers by for a gendarme in disguise was passing the Rue Tebou opposite a house as if he were waiting for some one to come out he walked with an agitated air you will often see in paris such vehement promenaders real gendarmes watching a recalcitrant national guardsman bailiffs taking steps to effect an arrest creditors planning a trick on the debtor who has shut himself in lovers or jealous and suspicious husbands or friends doing sentry for a friend but rarely do you meet a face portending such coarse and fierce thoughts as animated that of the gloomy and powerful man who paced to and fro under mademoiselle esther's windows with the brooding haste of a bear in its cage at noon a window was opened and a maid-servant's hand was put out to push back the padded shutters a few minutes later esther in her dressing-gown came to breathe the air leaning on lucien any one who saw them might have taken them for the originals of some pretty english vignette esther was the first to recognize the basilisk eyes of the spanish priest and the poor creature stricken as if she had been shot gave a cry of horror there is that terrible priest said she pointing him out to lucien he said lucien smiling he is no more a priest than you are what then she said in alarm why an old villain who believes in nothing but the devil said lucien this light thrown on the sham priest's secrets if revealed to any one less devoted than esther might have ruined lucien for ever as they went along the corridor from their bedroom to the dining-room where their breakfast was served the lovers met carlos herrera what have you come here for said lucien roughly to bless you replied the audacious scoundrel stopping the pair and detaining them in the little drawing-room of the apartment listen to me my pretty dears amuse yourselves be happy well and good happiness at any price is my motto but you he went on to esther you whom i dragged from the mud and have soaked down body and soul you surely do not dream that you can stand in lucien's way as for you my boy he went on after a pause looking at lucien you are no longer poet enough to allow yourself another coralie this is sober prose what can be done with esther's lover nothing can esther become madame de rubempre no well my child said he laying his hand on esther's and making her shiver as if some serpent had wound itself round her the world must never know of your existence above all the world must never know that a certain mademoiselle esther loves lucien and that lucien is in love with her these rooms are your prison my pigeon if you wish to go out and your health will require it you must take exercise at night at hours when you cannot be seen for your youth and beauty and the style you have acquired at the convent 
would at once be observed in paris the day when any one in the world whoever it be he added in an awful voice seconded by an awful look learns that lucien is your lover or that you are his mistress that day will be your last but one on earth i have procured that boy a patent permitting him to bear the name and arms of his maternal ancestors still this is not all we have not yet recovered the title of marquis and to get it he must marry a girl of good family in whose favor the king will grant this distinction such an alliance will get lucien on in the world and at court this boy of whom i have made a man will be first secretary to an embassy later he shall be minister at some german court and god or i better still helping him he will take his seat some day on the bench reserved for peers or on the bench reserved for lucien began interrupting the man hold your tongue cried carlos laying his broad hand on lucien's mouth would you tell such a secret to a woman he muttered in his ear esther a woman cried the poet of les marguerites still inditing sonnets said the spaniard nonsense sooner or later all these angels relapse into being women and every woman at moments is a mixture of a monkey and a child two creatures who can kill us for fun esther my jewel said he to the terrified girl i have secured as your waiting-maid a creature who is as much mine as if she were my daughter for your cook you shall have a mulatto woman which gives style to a house with europe and asie you can live here for a thousand franc note a month like a queen a stage queen europe has been a dressmaker a milliner and a stage super asie has cooked for an epicure milord these two women will serve you like two fairies seeing lucien go completely to the wall before this man who was guilty at least of sacrilege and forgery this woman sanctified by her love felt an awful fear in the depths of her heart she made no reply but dragged lucien into her room and asked him is he the devil he is far worse to me he vehemently replied but if you love me try to imitate that man's devotion to me and obey him on pain of death of death she exclaimed more frightened than ever of death repeated lucien alas my darling no death could be compared with that which would befall me if esther turned pale at his words and felt herself fainting well well cried the sacrilegious forger have you not yet spelt out your daisy petals esther and lucien came out and the poor girl not daring to look at the mysterious man said you shall be obeyed as god is obeyed monsieur good said he you may be very happy for a time and you will need only nightgowns and wrappers that will be very economical the two lovers went on towards the dining-room but lucien's patron signed to the pretty pair to stop and they stopped i have just been talking of your servants my child said he to esther i must introduce them to you the spaniard rang twice the women he had called europe and asie came in and it was at once easy to see the reason of these names asie who looked as if she might have been born in the island of java showed a face to scare the eye as flat as a board with the copper complexion peculiar to malaise with a nose that looked as if it had been driven inwards by some violent pressure the strange conformation of the maxillary bones gave the lower part of this face a resemblance to that of the larger species of apes 
the brow though sloping was not deficient in intelligence produced by habits of cunning two fierce little eyes had the calm fixity of a tiger's but they never looked you straight in the face asie seemed afraid lest she might terrify people her lips a dull blue were parted over prominent teeth of dazzling whiteness but grown across the leading expression of this animal countenance was one of meanness her black hair straight and greasy looking like her skin lay in two shining bands forming an edge to a very handsome silk handkerchief her ears were remarkably pretty and graced with two large dark pearls small short and squat as he bore a likeness to the grotesque figures the chinese love to paint on screens or more exactly to the hindu idols which seem to be imitated from some non-existent type found nevertheless now and again by travellers esther shuddered as she looked at this monstrosity dressed out in a white apron over a stuff gown as he said the spaniard to whom the woman looked up with a gesture that can only be compared to that of a dog to its master this is your mistress and he pointed to esther in her wrapper as he looked at the young fairy with an almost distressful expression but at the same moment a flash half hidden between her thick short eyelashes shot like an incendiary spark at lucien who in a magnificent dressing-gown thrown open over a fine holland linen shirt and red trousers with a fez on his head beneath which his fair hair fell in thick curls presented a godlike appearance italian genius could invent the tale of othello english genius could put it on the stage but nature alone reserves the power of throwing into a single glance an expression of jealousy grander and more complete than england and italy together could imagine this look seen by esther made her clutch the spaniard by the arm setting her nails in it as a cat sets its claws to save itself from falling into a gulf of which it cannot see the bottom the spaniard spoke a few words in some unfamiliar tongue to the asiatic monster who crept on her knees to esther's feet and kissed them she is not merely a good cook said herrera to esther she is a past master and might make carême mad with jealousy as he can do everything by way of cooking she will turn you out a simple dish of beans that will make you wonder whether the angels have not come down to add some herb from heaven she will go to market herself every morning and fight like the devil she is to get things at the lowest prices she will tire out curiosity by silence you are supposed to have been in india and as he will help you to give effect to this fiction for she is one of those parisians who are born to be of any nationality they please but i do not advise that you should give yourself out to be a foreigner europe what do you say europe was a perfect contrast to asie for she was the smartest waiting-maid that montrose could have hoped to see as her rival on the stage slight with a scatterbrain manner a face like a weasel and a sharp nose europe's features offered to the observer a countenance worn by the corruption of paris life the unhealthy complexion of a girl fed on raw apples lymphatic but sinewy soft but tenacious one little foot was set forward her hands were in her apron pockets and she fidgeted incessantly without moving from sheer excess of liveliness grisette and stage super in spite of her youth she must have tried many trades as full of evil as a dozen madelonettes put together she might have robbed her parents and sat on the bench of a police court 
asie was terrifying but you knew her thoroughly from the first she descended in a straight line from locusta while Rop filled you with uneasiness which could not fail to increase the more you had to do with her her corruption seemed boundless you felt that she could set the devils by the ears madame might say she had come from valenciennes said europe in a precise little voice i was born there perhaps monsieur she added to lucien in a pedantic tone will be good enough to say what name he proposes to give to madame madame van bogsack the spaniard put in reversing esther's name madame is a jewess a native of holland the widow of a merchant and suffering from a liver complaint contracted in java no great fortune not to excite curiosity enough to live on six thousand francs a year and we shall complain of her stinginess said europe that is the thing said the spaniard with a bow you limbs of satan he went on catching asie and europe exchanging a glance that displeased him remember what i have told you you are serving a queen you owe her as much respect as to a queen you are to cherish her as you would cherish a revenge and be as devoted to her as to me neither the door porter nor the neighbors nor the other inhabitants of the house in short not a soul on earth is to know what goes on here it is your business to balk curiosity if any should be roused and madame he went on laying his broad hairy hand on esther's arm madame must not commit the smallest imprudence you must prevent it in case of need but always with perfect respect you europe are to go out for madame in anything that concerns her dress and you must do her sewing from motives of economy finally nobody not even the most insignificant creature is ever to set foot in this apartment you too between you must do all there is to be done and you my beauty he went on speaking to esther when you want to go out in your carriage by night you can tell europe she will know where to find your men for you will have a servant in livery of my choosing like those two slaves esther and lucien had not a word ready they listened to the spaniard and looked at the two precious specimens to whom he gave his orders what was the secret hold to which he owed the submission and servitude that were written on these two faces one mischievously recalcitrant the other so malignantly cruel he read the thoughts of lucien and esther who seemed paralyzed as paul and virginia might have been at the sight of two dreadful snakes and he said in a good-natured undertone you can trust them as you can me keep no secrets from them that will flatter them go to your work my little asie he added to the cook and you my girl lay another place he said to europe the children cannot do less than ask papa to breakfast when the two women had shut the door and the spaniard could hear europe moving to and fro he turned to lucien and esther and opening a wide palm he said i hold them in the hollow of my hand the words and gesture made his hearers shudder where did you pick them up cried lucien what the devil i did not look for them at the foot of the throne replied the man europe has risen from the mire and is afraid of sinking into it again threaten them with monsieur abbe when they do not please you and you will see them quake like mice when the cat is mentioned i am used to taming wild beasts he added with a smile you strike me as being a demon said esther 
clinging closer to lucien my child i tried to win you to heaven but a repentant magdalen is always a practical joke on the church if ever there were one she would relapse into the courtesan in paradise you have gained this much you are forgotten and have acquired the manners of a lady for you learned in the convent what you never could have learned in the ranks of infamy in which you were living you owe me nothing said he observing a beautiful look of gratitude on esther's face i did it all for him and he pointed to lucien you are you will always be you will die a prostitute for in spite of the delightful theories of cattle breeders you can never here below become anything but what you are the man who feels bumps is right you have the bump of love the spaniard it will be seen was a fatalist like napoleon mahomet and many other great politicians it is a strange thing that most men of action have a tendency to fatalism just as most great thinkers have a tendency to believe in providence what i am i do not know said esther with angelic sweetness but i love lucien and shall die worshipping him come to breakfast said the spaniard sharply and pray to god that lucien may not marry too soon for then you would never see him again his marriage would be my death said she she allowed the sham priest to lead the way that she might stand on tiptoe and whisper to lucien without being seen is it your wish said she that i should remain in the power of this man who sets two hyenas to guard me lucien bowed his head the poor child swallowed down her grief and affected gladness but she felt cruelly oppressed it needed more than a year of constant and devoted care before she was accustomed to these two Section 8 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac Translated by James Waring This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary Esther Happy Chapter 8 Lucien's conduct since his return to Paris had borne the stamp of such profound policy that it excited, and could not fail to excite, the jealousy of all his former friends, on whom he took no vengeance but by making them furious at his success, at his exquisite get-up, and his way of keeping every one at a distance. The poet, once so communicative, so genial, had turned cold and reserved. De Marsay, the model adopted by all the youth of Paris, did not make a greater display of reticence in speech and deed than did Lucien. As to brains, the journalist had ere now proved his mettle. De Marsay, against whom many people chose to pit Lucien, giving a preference to the poet, was small-minded enough to resent this lucien now in high favor with men who secretly pulled the wires of power was so completely indifferent to literary fame that he did not care about the success of his romance republished under its real title l'archer de charles neuf or the excitement caused by his volume of sonnets called les marguerites of which dauriat sold out the edition in a week it is posthumous fame said he with a laugh to mademoiselle des touches who congratulated him the terrible spaniard held his creature with an iron hand keeping him in the road towards the goal where the trumpets and gifts of victory await patient politicians lucien had taken beaudenord's bachelor quarters on the quai malaquais to be near the rue Tebou and his adviser was lodging under the same roof on the fourth floor 
lucien kept only one horse to ride and drive a man-servant and a groom when he was not dining out he dined with esther carlos herrera kept such a keen eye on the service in the house on the quai malaquais that lucien did not spend ten thousand francs a year all told ten thousand more were enough for esther thanks to the unfailing and inexplicable devotion of asie and europe lucien took the utmost precautions in going in and out at the rue Tebou. he never came out but in a cab with the blinds down and always drove into the courtyard thus his passion for esther and the very existence of the establishment in the rue Tebou, being unknown to the world did him no harm in his connections or undertakings no rash word ever escaped him on this delicate subject his mistakes of this sort with regard to coralie at the time of his first stay in paris had given him experience in the first place his life was marked by the correct regularity under which many mysteries can be hidden he remained in society every night till one in the morning he was always at home from ten till one in the afternoon then he drove in the bois de boulogne and paid calls till five he was rarely seen to be on foot and thus avoided old acquaintances when some journalist or one of his former associates waved him a greeting he responded with a bow polite enough to avert annoyance but significant of such deep contempt as killed all french geniality he thus had very soon got rid of persons whom he would rather never have known an old established aversion kept him from going to see madame d'espard who often wished to get him to her house but when he met her at those of the duchesse de montfrigneuse of mademoiselle des touches of the comtesse de montcornet or elsewhere he was always exquisitely polite to her this hatred fully reciprocated by madame d'espard compelled lucien to act with prudence but it will be seen how he had added fuel to it by allowing himself a stroke of revenge which gained him indeed a severe lecture from carlos you are not yet strong enough to be revenged on any one whoever it may be said the spaniard when we are walking under a burning sun we do not stop to gather even the finest flowers lucien was so genuinely superior and had so fine a future before him that the young men who chose to be offended or puzzled by his return to paris and his unaccountable good fortune were enchanted whenever they could do him an ill turn he knew he had many enemies and was well aware of those hostile feelings among his friends the abbe indeed took admirable care of his adopted son putting him on his guard against the treachery of the world and the fatal imprudence of youth lucien was expected to tell and did in fact tell the abbe each evening every trivial incident of the day thanks to his mentor's advice he put the keenest curiosity the curiosity of the world off the scent entrenched in the gravity of an englishman and fortified by the redoubts cast up by diplomatic circumspection he never gave any one the right or the opportunity of seeing a corner even of his concerns his handsome young face had by practice become as expressionless in society as that of a princess at a ceremonial towards the middle of eighteen twenty nine his marriage began to be talked of to the eldest daughter of the duchesse de grandlieu who at that time had no less than four daughters to provide for no one doubted that in honor of such an alliance the king would revive for lucien the title of marquis this distinction would establish lucien's fortune as a diplomat and he would probably be accredited as minister to some german court for the last three years lucien's life had been regular and above reproach indeed de marsay had made this remarkable speech about him 
that young fellow must have a very strong hand behind him thus lucien was almost a person of importance his passion for esther had in fact helped him greatly to play his part of a serious man a habit of this kind guards an ambitious man from many follies having no connection with any woman of fashion he cannot be caught by the reactions of mere physical nature on his moral sense as to happiness lucien's was the realization of a poet's dreams a penniless poet's hungering in a garret esther the ideal courtesan in love while she reminded lucien of coralie the actress with whom he had lived for a year completely eclipsed her every loving and devoted woman invents seclusion incognito the life of a pearl in the depths of the sea but to most of them this is no more than one of the delightful whims which supply a subject for conversation a proof of love which they dream of giving but do not give whereas esther to whom her first enchantment was ever new who lived perpetually in the glow of lucien's first incendiary glance never in four years had an impulse of curiosity she gave her whole mind to the task of adhering to the terms of the programme prescribed by the sinister spaniard nay more in the midst of intoxicating happiness she never took unfair advantage of the unlimited power that the constantly revived desire of a lover gives to the woman he loves to ask lucien a single question regarding herrera of whom indeed she lived in constant awe she dared not even think of him the elaborate benefactions of that extraordinary man to whom esther undoubtedly owed her feminine accomplishment and her well-bred manner struck the poor girl as advances on account of hell i shall have to pay for all this some day she would tell herself with dismay every fine night she went out in a hired carriage she was driven with a rapidity no doubt insisted on by the abbe in one or another of the beautiful woods round paris boulogne vincennes romainville or ville d'avre often with lucien sometimes alone with europe there she could walk about without fear for when lucien was not with her she was attended by a servant dressed like the smartest of outriders armed with a real knife whose face and brawny build alike proclaimed him a ruthless athlete this protector was also provided in the fashion of english footmen with a stick but such as single stick players use with which they can keep off more than one assailant in obedience to an order of the abbes esther had never spoken a word to this escort when madame wished to go home europe gave a call the man in waiting whistled to the driver who was always within hearing when lucien was walking with esther europe and this man remained about a hundred paces behind like two of the infernal minions that figure in the thousand and one nights which enchanters place at the service of their devotees the men and yet more the women of paris know nothing of the charm of a walk in the woods on a fine night the stillness the moonlight effects the solitude have the soothing effect of a bath esther usually went out at ten walked from about midnight till one o'clock and came in at half-past two it was never daylight in her rooms till eleven she then bathed and went through an elaborate toilet which is unknown to most women for it takes up too much time and is rarely carried out by any but courtesans women of the town or fine ladies who have the day before them she was only just ready when lucien came and appeared before him as a newly opened flower her only care was that her poet should be happy she was his toy his chattel she gave him entire liberty 
she never cast a glance beyond the circle where she shone on this the abbe had insisted for it was part of his profound policy that lucien should have gallant adventures happiness has no history and the story-tellers of all lands have understood this so well that the words they are happy are the end of every love-tale hence only the ways and means can be recorded of this really romantic happiness in the heart of paris it was happiness in its loveliest form a poem a symphony of four years duration every woman will exclaim that was much neither esther nor lucien had ever said this is too much and the formula they were happy was more emphatically true than even in a fairy tale for they had no children so lucien could coquette with the world give way to his poet's caprices and it may be plainly admitted to the necessities of his position all this time he was slowly making his way and was able to render secret service to certain political personages by helping them in their work in such matters he was eminently discreet he cultivated madame de serizy's circle being it was rumoured on the very best terms with that lady madame de serizy had carried him off from the duchesse de maufrigneuse who it was said had thrown him over one of the phrases by which women avenge themselves on happiness they envy lucien was in the lap so to speak of the high almoner's set and intimate with women who were the archbishop's personal friends he was modest and reserved he waited patiently so de marsay's speech de marsay was now married and made his wife live as retired a life as esther was significant in more ways than one but the submarine perils Section nine of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter nine. Matters were in this position when, one fine night in August, the Baron de Nucingen was driving back to Paris from the country residence of a foreign banker settled in France with whom he had been dining the estate lay at eight leagues from paris in the district of la brie now the baron's coachman having undertaken to drive his master there and back with his own horses at nightfall ventured to moderate the pace as they entered the forest of vincennes the position of beast man and master was as follows the coachman liberally soaked in the kitchen of the aristocrat of the bourse was perfectly tipsy and slept soundly while still holding the reins to deceive other wayfarers the footman seated behind was snoring like a wooden top from germany the land of little carved figures of large wine vats and of humming tops the baron had tried to think but after passing the bridge at gournay the soft somnolence of digestion had sealed his eyes the horses understood the coachman's plight from the slackness of the reins they heard the footman's basso continuo from his perch behind they saw that they were masters of the situation and took advantage of their few minutes freedom to make their own pace like intelligent slaves they gave highway robbers the chance of plundering one of the richest capitalists in france the most deeply cunning of the race which in france have been energetically styled lynxes lou servier finally being independent of control and tempted by the curiosity which every one must have remarked in domestic animals they stopped where four roads met face to face with some other horses 
whom they no doubt asked in horses language who may you be what are you doing are you comfortable when the chaise stopped the baron awoke from his nap at first he fancied that he was still in his friend's park then he was startled by a celestial vision which found him unarmed with his usual weapon self-interest the moonlight was brilliant he could have read by it even an evening paper in the silence of the forest under this pure light the baron saw a woman alone who as she got into a hired chaise looked at the strange spectacle of this sleep-stricken carriage at the sight of this angel the baron felt as though a light had flashed into glory within him the young lady seeing herself admired pulled down her veil with terrified haste the man-servant gave a signal which the driver perfectly understood for the vehicle went off like an arrow the old banker was fearfully agitated the blood left his feet cold and carried fire to his brain his head sent the flame back again to his heart he was choking the unhappy man foresaw a fit of indigestion but in spite of that supreme terror he stood up follow quick very quick tam you you are asleep he cried a hundred franc if you catch up that chaise at the words a hundred francs the coachman woke up the servant behind heard them no doubt in his dreams the baron reiterated his orders the coachman urged the horses to a gallop and at the barriere de tronne had succeeded in overtaking a carriage resembling that in which nucingen had seen the divine fair one but which contained a swaggering head clerk from some first-class shop and a lady of the rue vivienne this blunder filled the baron with consternation if only i had brought Georges instead of you stupid fool he should have found that woman said he to the servant while the excise officers were searching the carriage indeed monsieur le baron the devil was behind the chaise i believe disguised as an armed escort and he sent this chaise instead of hers there is no such thing as der teufel said the baron the baron de nucingen owned to sixty he no longer cared for women and for his wife least of all he boasted that he had never known such love as makes a fool of a man he declared that he was happy to have done with women the most angelic of them he frankly said was not worth what she cost even if you got her for nothing he was supposed to be so entirely blasé that he no longer paid two thousand francs a month for the pleasure of being deceived his eyes looked coldly down from his opera box on the corps de ballet never a glance was shot at the capitalist by any one of that formidable swarm of old young girls and young old women the cream of paris pleasure natural love artificial and love of show love love based on self-esteem and vanity love as a display of taste decent conjugal love eccentric love the baron had paid for them all had known them all excepting real spontaneous love this passion had now pounced down on him like an eagle on its prey as it did on gentz the confidential friend of his highness the prince of metternich all the world knows what follies the old diplomat committed for fanny elsler whose rehearsals took up a great deal more of his time than the concerns of europe the woman who had just overthrown that iron-bound money-box called nucingen had appeared to him as one of those who are unique in their generation it is not certain that titian's mistress or leonardo da vinci's mona lisa or raphael's fornarina were as beautiful as this exquisite esther in whom not the most practised eye of the most experienced parisian could have detected the faintest trace of the ordinary courtesan the baron was especially startled by the noble and stately air the air of a well-born woman 
which esther beloved and lapped in luxury elegance and devotedness had in the highest degree happy love is the divine unction of women it makes them all as lofty as empresses for eight nights in succession the baron went to the forest of vincennes then to the bois de boulogne to the woods of ville d'avray to meudon in short everywhere in the neighborhood of paris but failed to meet esther that beautiful jewish face which he called a face out of the bible was always before his eyes by the end of a fortnight he had lost his appetite delphine de nucingen and her daughter augusta whom the baroness was now taking out did not at first perceive the change that had come over the baron the mother and daughter only saw him at breakfast in the morning and at dinner in the evening when they all dined at home and this was only on the evenings when delphine received company but by the end of two months tortured by a fever of impatience and in a state like that produced by acute homesickness the baron amazed to find his millions impotent grew so thin and seemed so seriously ill that delphine had secret hopes of finding herself a widow she pitied her husband somewhat hypocritically and kept her daughter in seclusion she bored her husband with questions he answered as englishmen answer when suffering from spleen hardly a word delphine de nucingen gave a grand dinner every sunday she had chosen that day for her receptions after observing that no people of fashion went to the play and that the day was pretty generally an open one the emancipation of the shopkeeping and middle classes makes sunday almost as tiresome in paris as it is deadly in london so the baroness invited the famous desplein to dinner to consult him in spite of the sick man for nucingen persisted in asserting that he was perfectly well keller rastignac de marsay du tillet all their friends had made the baroness understand that a man like nucingen could not be allowed to die without any notice being taken of it his enormous business transactions demanded some care it was absolutely necessary to know where he stood these gentlemen also were asked to dinner and the comte de gondreville francois keller's father-in-law the chevalier d'espard des lupoles dr bianchon this plain's best beloved pupil beaudenord and his wife the comte and comtesse de montcornet blondet mademoiselle des touches and conti and finally lucien de rubempre for whom rastignac had for the last five years manifested the warmest regard by order as the advertisements have it we shall not find it easy to get rid of that young fellow said blondet to rastignac when he saw lucien come in handsomer than ever and uncommonly well dressed it is wiser to make friends with him for he is formidable said rastignac he said de marsay no one is formidable to my knowledge but men whose position is assured and his is unattacked rather than unattackable look here what does he live on where does his money come from he has i am certain sixty thousand francs in debts he has found a friend in a very rich spanish priest who has taken a fancy to him replied rastignac he is going to be married to the eldest mademoiselle de grandlieu said mademoiselle des touches yes said the chevalier d'espard but they require him to buy an estate worth thirty thousand francs a year as security for the fortune he is going to settle on the young lady and for that he needs a million francs which are not to be found in any spaniard's shoes that is dear for clotilde is very ugly said the baroness 
Madame de Nucingen affected to call Mademoiselle de Grandlieu by her Christian name, as though she, nay Goriot, frequented that society. No, replied du Tillet, the daughter of a duchess is never ugly to the like of us, especially when she brings with her the title of marquis and a diplomatic appointment. But the great obstacle to the marriage is Madame de Serizy's insane passion for Lucien. She must give him a great deal of money. Then I am not surprised at seeing Lucien so serious, for Madame de Serizy will certainly not give him a million francs to help him to marry Mademoiselle de Grandlieu. He probably sees no way out of the scrape, said de Marsay. But Mademoiselle de Grandlieu worships him, said the Comtesse de Montcornet, and with the young person's assistance he may perhaps make better terms. And what will he do with his sister and brother-in-law at Angoulême? asked the Chevalier d'Espard. Well, his sister is rich, replied Rastignac, and he now speaks of her as Madame Séchard de Marsac whatever difficulties there may be he is a very good-looking fellow said bianchon rising to greet lucien how do my dear fellow said rastignac shaking hands warmly with lucien de marsay bowed coldly after lucien had first bowed to him before dinner desplein and bianchon who studied the baron while amusing him convinced themselves that this malady was entirely nervous but neither could guess the cause so impossible did it seem that the great politician of the money market could be in love when bianchon seeing nothing but love to account for the banker's condition hinted as much to delphine de nucingen she smiled as a woman who has long known all her husband's weaknesses after dinner, however, when they all adjourned to the garden, the more intimate of the party gathered round the banker, eager to clear up this extraordinary case, when they heard Bianchon promise that Nucingen must be in love. "'Do you know, Baron,' said de Marsay, "'that you have grown very thin. You are suspected of violating the laws of financial nature.' "'Ach, never,' said the Baron yes yes replied de marsay they dare to say that you are in love that is true replied nucingen piteously i am in love for somebody i do not know you in love you you are a coxcomb said the chevalier d'espard in love at my age i know that is too ridiculous but what can i help it that is so a woman of the world asked lucien nay said de marsay the baron would not grow so thin but for a hopeless love and he has money enough to buy all the women who will or can sell themselves i do not know who she is said the baron and as motame de nucingen is inside the drawing-room i may say so that till now i have never known what it is to love love i think it is to grow tin and where did you meet this innocent daisy asked rastignac in a carriage at midnight in the forest of vincennes describe her said de marsay a white gaze hat a rose gown a white scarf a white veil a face just out of the bible eyes like foyer an eastern color you were dreaming said lucien with a smile that is true i was sleeping like a pig a pig mit his skin full he added for i was on my way home from dinner at my friend's was she alone said du tillet interrupting him ya yeah, said the baron dolefully but she had an aide-duke behind that carriage and a maid-servant lucien looks as if he knew her exclaimed rastignac seeing esther's lover smile 
who doesn't know the woman who would go out at midnight to meet nucingen said lucien turning on his heel well she is not a woman who is seen in society or the baron would have recognized the man said the chevalier d'espard i have never seen him replied the baron and for forty days now i have had her seeked for by the police and they do not find her it is better that she should cost you a few hundred francs than cost you your life said desplein and at your age a passion without hope is dangerous you might die of it ja ja replied the baron addressing desplein and what i eat does me no good the air i breathe feels to choke me i go to the forest of fencin to see the place what i see her and that is all my life i could not think of the last loan i trust to my partners but have pity on me i could pay one million franc to see that woman and i should gain by that for i do nothing on the bourse ask du tillet very true replied du tillet he hates business he is quite unlike himself it is a sign of death a sign of love replied nucingen and for me that is all the same thing the simple candor of the old man no longer the stock jobber who for the first time in his life saw that something was more sacred and more precious than gold really moved these world-hardened men some exchanged smiles others looked at nucingen with an expression that plainly said such a man to have come to this and then they all returned to the drawing-room talking over the event for it was indeed an event calculated to produce the greatest sensation madame de nucingen went into fits of laughter when lucien betrayed her husband's secret but the baron when he heard his wife's sarcasms took her by the arm and led her into a recess of a window madame said he in an undertone have i ever laughed at all at your passions that you should laugh at mine a good frau should help her husband out of his difficulty without making game of him like what you do from the description given by the old banker lucien had recognized his esther much annoyed that his smile should have been observed he took advantage of a moment when coffee was served and the conversation became general to vanish from the scene what has become of monsieur de rubempre said the baroness he is faithful to his motto quid me continebit said rastignac which means who can detain me or i am unconquerable as you choose added de marsay just as monsieur le baron was speaking of his unknown lady lucien smiled in a way that makes me fancy he may know her said horace bianchon not thinking how dangerous such a natural remark might be good said the banker to himself like all incurables the baron clutched at everything that seemed at all hopeful he promised himself that he would have lucien watched by some one besides luchard and his men luchard the sharpest Section ten of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter ten. Before going home to Esther, Lucien was due at the Hotel Grandlieu to spend the two hours which made mademoiselle clotilde frederic de grandlieu the happiest girl in the faubourg saint germain but the prudence characteristic of this ambitious youth warned him to inform carlos herrera forthwith of the effect resulting from the smile wrung from him by the baron's description of esther 
the banker's passion for esther and the idea that had occurred to him of setting the police to seek the unknown beauty were indeed events of sufficient importance to be at once communicated to the man who had sought under a priest's robe the shelter which criminals of old could find in a church and lucien's road from the rue saint lazare where nucingen at that time lived to the rue saint dominique where was the hotel grandlieu led him past his lodgings on the quai malaquais lucien found his formidable friend smoking his breviary that is to say colouring a short pipe before retiring to bed the man strange rather than foreign had given up spanish cigarettes finding them too mild matters look serious said the spaniard when lucien had told him all the baron who employs louchard to hunt up the girl will certainly be sharp enough to set a spy at your heels and everything will come out to-night and to-morrow morning will not give me more than enough time to pack the cards for the game i must play against the baron first and foremost i must prove to him that the police cannot help him when our lynx has given up all hope of finding his ewe lamb i will undertake to sell her for all she is worth to him sell esther cried lucien whose first impulse was always the right one do you forget where we stand cried carlos herrera no money left the spaniard went on and sixty thousand francs of debts to be paid if you want to marry clotilde de grandlieu you must invest a million of francs in land as security for that ugly creature's settlement well then esther is the quarry i mean to set before that lynx to help us to ease him of that million that is my concern esther will never that is my concern she will die of it that is the undertaker's concern besides what then cried the savage checking lucien's lamentations merely by his attitude how many generals died in the prime of life for the emperor napoleon he asked after a short silence there were always plenty of women in eighteen twenty one coralie was unique in your eyes and yet you found esther after her will come do you know who the unknown fair and she of all women is the fairest and you will find her in the capital where the duc de grandlieu's son-in-law will be minister and representative of the king of france and do you tell me now great baby that esther will die of it again can mademoiselle de grandlieu's husband keep esther you have only to leave everything to me you need not take the trouble to think at all that is my concern only you must do without esther for a week or two but go to the rue Tebou all the same come be off to bill and coo on your plank of salvation and play your part well slip the flaming note you wrote this morning into clotilde's hand and bring me back a warm response she will recompense herself for many woes in writing i take to that girl you will find esther a little depressed but tell her to obey we must display our livery of virtue our doublet of honesty the screen behind which all great men hide their infamy i must show off my handsomer self you must never be suspected chance has served us better than my brain which has been beating about in a void for these two months past all the while he was jerking out these dreadful sentences one by one like pistol shots carlos herrera was dressing himself to go out you are evidently delighted cried lucien you never liked poor esther and you look forward with joy to the moment when you will be rid of her you have never tired of loving her have you well i have never tired of detesting her but have i not always behaved as though i were sincerely attached to the hussy 
i who through asie hold her life in my hands a few bad mushrooms in a stew and there an end but mademoiselle esther still lives and is happy and do you know why because you love her do not be a fool for four years we have been waiting for a chance to turn up for us or against us well it will take something more than mere cleverness to wash the cabbage luck has flung at us now there are good and bad together in this turn of the wheel as there are in everything do you know what i was thinking of when you came in no of making myself heir here as i did at barcelona to an old bigot by aziz's help a crime i saw no other way of securing your fortune the creditors are making a stir if once the bailiffs were at your heels and you were turned out of the hotel grandlieu where would you be there would be the devil to pay then and carlos herrera by a pantomimic gesture showed the suicide of a man throwing himself into the water then he fixed on lucien one of those steady piercing looks by which the will of a strong man is injected so to speak into a weak one this fascinating glare which relaxed all lucien's fibres of resistance revealed the existence not merely of secrets of life and death between him and his adviser but also of feelings as far above ordinary feeling as the man himself was above his vile position carlos herrera a man at once ignoble and magnanimous obscure and famous compelled to live out of the world from which the law had banned him exhausted by vice and by frenzied and terrible struggles though endowed with powers of mind that ate into his soul consumed especially by a fever of vitality now lived again in the elegant person of lucien de rubempre whose soul had become his own he was represented in social life by the poet to whom he lent his tenacity and iron will to him lucien was more than a son more than a woman beloved more than a family more than his life he was his revenge and as souls cling more closely to a feeling than to existence he had bound the young man to him by insoluble ties after rescuing lucien's life at the moment when the poet in desperation was on the verge of suicide he had proposed to him one of those infernal bargains which are heard of only in romances but of which the hideous possibility has often been proved in courts of justice by celebrated criminal dramas while lavishing on lucien all the delights of paris life and proving to him that he had yet a great future before him he had made him his chattel but indeed no sacrifice was too great for this strange man when it was to gratify his second self with all his strength he was so weak to this creature of his making that he had even told him all his secrets perhaps this abstract complicity was a bond the more between them since the day when la torpille had been snatched away lucien had known on what a vile foundation his good fortune rested that priest's robe covered jacques collin a man famous on the hulks who ten years since had lived under the homely name of vautrin in the maison vauquer where rastignac and bianchon were at that time boarders jacques collin known as trompe la mort had escaped from rochefort almost as soon as he was recaptured profiting by the example of the famous comte de saint hélène while modifying all that was ill-planned in coignard's daring scheme to take the place of an honest man and carry on the convict's career 
is a proposition of which the two terms are too contradictory for a disastrous outcome not to be inevitable especially in paris for by establishing himself in a family a convict multiplies tenfold the perils of such a substitution and to be safe from all investigation must not a man assume a position far above the ordinary interests of life a man of the world is subject to risks such as rarely trouble those who have no contact with the world hence the priest's gown is the safest disguise when it can be authenticated by an exemplary life in solitude and inactivity so a priest i will be said the legally dead man who was quite determined to resuscitate as a figure in the world and to satisfy passions as strange as himself the civil war caused by the constitution of eighteen twelve in spain whither this energetic man had betaken himself enabled him to murder secretly the real carlos herrera from an ambush this ecclesiastic the bastard son of a grandee long since deserted by his father and not knowing to what woman he owed his birth was entrusted by king ferdinand the seventh to whom a bishop had recommended him with a political mission to france the bishop the only man who took any interest in carlos herrera died while this foundling son of the church was on his journey from cadiz to madrid and from madrid to france delighted to have met with this longed-for opportunity and under the most desirable conditions jacques collin scored his back to efface the fatal letters and altered his complexion by the use of chemicals thus metamorphosing himself face to face with the corpse he contrived to achieve some likeness to his sosia and to complete a change almost as marvellous as that related in the arabian tale where a dervish has acquired the power old as he is of entering into a young body by a magic spell the convict who spoke spanish learned as much latin as an andalusian priest need know as banker to three hulks collin was rich in the cash entrusted to his known and indeed enforced honesty among such company a mistake is paid for by a dagger thrust to this capital he now added the money given by the bishop to don carlos herrera then before leaving spain he was able to possess himself of the treasure of an old bigot at barcelona to whom he gave absolution promising that he would make restitution of the money constituting her fortune which his penitent had stolen by means of murder jacques collin now a priest and charged with a secret mission which would secure him the most brilliant introductions in paris determined to do nothing that might compromise the character he had assumed and had given himself up to the chances of his new life when he met lucien on the road between angouleme and paris in this youth the sham priest saw a wonderful instrument for power he saved him from suicide saying give yourself over to me as to a man of god as men give themselves over to the devil and you will have every chance of a new career you will live as in a dream and the worst awakening that can come to you will be death which you now wish to meet the alliance between these two beings who were to become one as it were was based on this substantial reasoning and carlos herrera cemented it by an ingeniously plotted complicity he had the very genius of corruption and undermined lucien's honesty by plunging him into cruel necessity and extricating him by obtaining his tacit consent to bad or disgraceful actions which nevertheless left him pure loyal and noble in the eyes of the world 
lucien was the social magnificence under whose shadow the forger meant to live i am the author you are the play if you fail it is i who shall be hissed said he on the day when he confessed his sacrilegious disguise carlos prudently confessed only a little at a time measuring the horrors of his revelations by lucien's progress and needs thus trompe la mort did not let out his last secret till the habit of parisian pleasures and success and gratified vanity had enslaved the weak-minded poet body and soul where rastignac when tempted by this demon had stood firm lucien better managed and more ingeniously compromised succumbed conquered especially by his satisfaction in having attained an eminent position incarnate evil whose poetical embodiment is called the devil displayed every delightful seduction before this youth who was half a woman and at first gave much and asked for little the great argument used by carlos was the eternal secret promised by tartuffe to elmire the repeated proofs of absolute devotion such as that of said to mahomet put the finishing touch to the horrible achievement of lucien's subjugation by a jacques collin at this moment not only had esther and lucien devoured all the funds entrusted to the honesty of the banker of the hulks who for their sakes had rendered himself liable to a dreadful calling to account but the dandy the forger and the courtesan were also in debt thus at the very moment of lucien's expected success the smallest pebble under the foot of either of these three persons might involve the ruin of the fantastic structure of fortune so audaciously built up at the opera ball rastignac had recognized the man he had known as vautrin at madame vauquer's but he knew that if he did not hold his tongue he was a dead man so madame de nucingen's lover and lucien had exchanged glances in which fear lurked on both sides under an expression of amity in the moment of danger rastignac it is clear would have been delighted to provide the vehicle that should convey jacques collin to the scaffold from all this it may be understood that carlos heard of the baron's passion with a glow of sombre satisfaction while he perceived in a single flash all the advantage a man of his temper might derive by means of a hapless esther go on said he to lucien the devil is mindful of his chaplain you are smoking on a powder barrel in cado Section 11 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy. Chapter 11. The house of Grandlieu divided into two branches about the middle of the last century. First, the ducal line destined to lapse since the present duke has only daughters and then the vicomte de grandlieu who will now inherit the title and armorial bearings of the elder branch the ducal house bears gules three broad axes or in fess with the famous motto caweo non temeo which epitomizes the history of the family the coat of the vicomte de grandlieu is the same quartered with that of navarin gules a fess crenellated or surmounted by a knight's helmet with the motto grand fait grand lieu the present viscountess widowed in eighteen thirteen has a son and a daughter 
though she returned from the emigration almost ruined she recovered a considerable fortune by the zealous aid of derville the lawyer the duke and duchesse de grandlieu on coming home in eighteen hundred and four were the object of the emperor's advances indeed napoleon seeing them come to his court restored to them all of the grandlieu estates that had been confiscated to the nation to the amount of about forty thousand francs a year of all the great nobles of the faubourg saint germain who allowed themselves to be won over by napoleon this duke and duchess she was an ajuda of the senior branch and connected with the braganzas were the only family who afterwards never disowned him and his liberality when the faubourg saint germain remembered this as a crime against the grandlieus louis the eighteenth respected them for it but perhaps his only object was to annoy monsieur a marriage was considered likely between the young vicomte de grandlieu and marie athenaï the duke's youngest daughter now nine years old sabine the youngest but one married the baron du goenic after the revolution of july eighteen thirty josephine the third became madame d'ajuda pinto after the death of the marquis's first wife mademoiselle de rochefide or rochegude the eldest had taken the veil in eighteen twenty two the second mademoiselle clotilde frederic at this time seven and twenty years of age was deeply in love with lucien de rubempre it need not be asked whether the duc de grandlieu's mansion one of the finest in the rue saint dominique did not exert a thousand spells over lucien's imagination every time the heavy gate turned on its hinges to admit his cab he experienced the gratified vanity to which mirabeau confessed though my father was a mere druggist at l'houmeau i may enter here this was his thought and indeed he would have committed far worse crimes than allying himself with a forger to preserve his right to mount the steps of that entrance to hear himself announced monsieur de rubempre at the door of the fine louis the fourteenth drawing-room decorated in the time of the grand monarque on the pattern of those at versailles where that choicest circle met that cream of paris society called then le petit chateau the noble portuguese lady one of those who never care to go out of their own home was usually the centre of her neighbour's attentions the chaulieu the navarin the lenoncourt the pretty baronne de macoumé née de chaulieu the duchesse de montfrigneuse madame d'espard madame de caen and mademoiselle des touches a connection of the grandlieus who are a breton family were frequent visitors on their way to a ball or on their return from the opera the vicomte de grandlieu the duc de retore the marquis de chaulieu afterwards duc de lenoncourt chaulieu his wife madeleine de morsauf the duc de lenoncourt's granddaughter the marquis d'ajuda pinto the prince de blamont chauvry the marquis de beauseant the vidame de pamier the vandenesses the old prince de cadignan and his son the duc de montfrigneuse were constantly to be seen in this stately drawing-room where they breathed the atmosphere of a court where manners tone and wit were in harmony with the dignity of the master and mistress whose aristocratic mien and magnificence had obliterated the memory of their servility to napoleon the old duchesse d'ussel mother of the duchesse de montfrigneuse was the oracle of this circle to which madame de serizy had never gained admittance though née de roncarolles lucien was brought thither by madame de montfrigneuse who had won over her mother to speak in his favour for she had doted on him for two years and the engaging young poet had kept his footing there thanks to the influence of the high almoner of france and the support of the archbishop of paris 
still he had not been admitted till he had obtained the patent restoring to him the name and arms of the rubempre family the duc de rhetore the chevalier d'espard and some others jealous of lucien periodically stirred up the duc de grandlieu's prejudices against him by retailing anecdotes of the young man's previous career but the duchess a devout catholic surrounded by the great prelates of the church and her daughter clotilde would not give him up lucien accounted for these hostilities by his connection with madame de bargeton madame d'espard's cousin and now comtesse du chatelet then feeling the importance of allying himself to so powerful a family and urged by his privy adviser to win clotilde lucien found the courage of the parvenu he came to the house five days in the week he swallowed all the affronts of the envious he endured impertinent looks and answered irony with wit his persistency the charm of his manners and his amiability at last neutralized opposition and reduced obstacles he was still in the highest favor with madame de maufrigneuse whose ardent letters written under the influence of her passion were preserved by carlos herrera he was idolized by madame de serizy and stood well in mademoiselle des touches good graces and well content with being received in these houses lucien was instructed by the abbe to be as reserved as possible in all other quarters you cannot devote yourself to several houses at once said his mentor the man who goes everywhere finds no one to take a lively interest in him great folks only patronize those who emulate their furniture whom they see every day and who have the art of becoming as necessary to them as the seat they sit on thus lucien accustomed to regard the grandlieu's drawing-room as his arena reserved his wit his jests his news and his courtier's graces for the hours he spent there every evening insinuating tactful and warned by clotilde of the shoals he should avoid he flattered m de grandlieu's little weaknesses clotilde having begun by envying madame de maufrigneuse her happiness ended by falling desperately in love with lucien perceiving all the advantages of such a connection lucien played his lover's part as well as it could have been acted by armand the latest jeune premier at the comedie francaise he wrote to clotilde letters which were certainly masterpieces of literary workmanship and clotilde replied vying with him in genius in the expression of perfervid love on paper for she had no other outlet lucien went to church at saint thomas d'aquin every sunday giving himself out as a devout catholic and he poured forth monarchical and pious harangues which were a marvel to all he also wrote some exceedingly remarkable articles in papers devoted to the congregation refusing to be paid for them and signing them only with an l he produced political pamphlets when required by king charles x or the high almoner and for these he would take no payment the king he would say has done so much for me that i owe him my blood for some days past there had been an idea of attaching lucien to the prime minister's cabinet as his private secretary but madame d'espard brought so many persons into the field in opposition to lucien that charles x's maitre jacques hesitated to clinch the matter nor was lucien's position by any means clear not only did the question what does he live on on everybody's lips as the young man rose in life require an answer but even benevolent curiosity as much as malevolent curiosity went on from one inquiry to another and found more than one joint in the ambitious youth's harness 
clotilde de grandlieu unconsciously served as a spy for her father and mother a few days since she had led lucien into a recess and told him of the difficulties raised by her family invest a million francs in land and my hand is yours that is my mother's ultimatum clotilde had explained and presently they will ask you where you got the money said carlos when lucien reported this last word in the bargain my brother-in-law will have made his fortune remarked lucien we can make him the responsible backer then only the million is needed said carlos i will think it over to be exact as to lucien's position in the hotel grandlieu he had never dined there neither clotilde nor the duchesse d'uxelles nor madame de maufrigneuse who was always extremely kind to lucien could ever obtain this favor from the duke so persistently suspicious was the old nobleman of the man that he designated as le sire de rubempre this shade of distinction understood by every one who visited at the house constantly wounded lucien's self-respect for he felt that he was no more than tolerated but the world is justified in being suspicious it is so often taken in to cut a figure in paris with no known source of wealth and no recognized employment is a position which can by no artifice be long maintained so lucien as he crept up in the world gave more and more weight to the question what does he live on he had been obliged indeed to confess to madame de serizy to whom he owed the patronage of monsieur granville the public prosecutor and of the comte octave de bauvin a minister of state and president of one of the supreme courts i am dreadfully in debt as he entered the courtyard of the mansion where he found an excuse for all his vanities he was saying to himself as he reflected on trompe la mort's scheming i can hear the ground cracking under my feet he loved esther and he wanted to marry mademoiselle de grandlieu a strange dilemma one must be sold to buy the other only one person could effect this bargain without damage to lucien's honor and that was the supposed spaniard were they not bound to be equally secret each for the other such a compact in which each is in turn master and slave is not to be found twice in any one life lucien drove away the clouds that darkened his brow and walked into the grandlieu drawing-room gay and beaming at this moment the windows were open the fragrance from the garden scented the room the flower-basket in the centre displayed its pyramid of flowers the duchess seated on a sofa in the corner was talking to the duchesse de chaulieu several women together formed a group remarkable for their various attitudes stamped with the different expression which each strove to give to an affected sorrow in the fashionable world nobody takes any interest in grief or suffering everything is talk the men were walking up and down the room or in the garden clotilde and josephine were busy at the tea-table the vidame de pamier the duc de grandlieu the marquis d'ageda pinto and the duc de maufrigneuse were playing whisk as they called it in a corner of the room when lucien was announced he walked across the room to make his bow to the duchess asking the cause of the grief he could read in her face madame de chaulieu has just had dreadful news her son-in-law the baron de macumay ex-duke of soria is just dead the young duc de soria and his wife who had gone to chantepleurs to nurse their brother have written this sad intelligence louise is heartbroken 
a woman is not loved twice in her life as louise was loved by her husband said madeleine de Morsauf. she will be a rich widow observed the old duchesse d'ucel looking at lucien whose face showed no change of expression poor louise said madame d'espard i understand her and pity her the marquise d'espard put on the pensive look of a woman full of soul and feeling sabine de grandlieu who was but ten years old raised knowing eyes to her mother's face but the satirical glance was repressed by a glance from the duchess this is bringing children up properly if my daughter lives through the shock said madame de chaulieu with a very maternal manner i shall be anxious about her future life louise is so very romantic it is so difficult nowadays said a venerable cardinal to reconcile feeling with the proprieties lucien who had not a word to say went to the tea-table to do what was polite to the demoiselle de grandlieu when the poet had gone a few yards away the marquise d'espard leaned over to whisper in the duchess's ear and do you really think that that young fellow is so much in love with your clotilde the perfidy of this question cannot be fully understood but with the help of a sketch of clotilde that young lady was at this moment standing up her attitude allowed the marquise d'espard's mocking eye to take in clotilde's lean narrow figure exactly like an asparagus stalk the poor girl's bust was so flat that it did not allow of the artifice known to dressmakers as fichu monter or padded habit shirts and clotilde who knew that her name was a sufficient advantage in life far from trying to conceal this defect heroically made a display of it by wearing plain tight dresses she achieved the effect of that stiff prim shape which medieval sculptors succeeded in giving to the statuettes whose profiles are conspicuous against the background of the niches in which they stand in cathedrals clotilde was more than five feet four in height if we may be allowed to use a familiar phrase which has the merit at any rate of being perfectly intelligible she was all legs these defective proportions gave her figure an almost deformed appearance with a dark complexion harsh black hair very thick eyebrows fiery eyes set in sockets that were already deeply discoloured a side face shaped like the moon in its first quarter and a prominent brow she was the caricature of her mother one of the handsomest women in portugal nature amuses herself with such tricks often we see in one family a sister of wonderful beauty whose features in her brother are absolutely hideous though the two are amazingly alike clotilde's lips excessively thin and sunken wore a permanent expression of disdain and yet her mouth better than any other feature of her face revealed every secret impulse of her heart for affection lent it a sweet expression which was all the more remarkable because her cheeks were too sallow for blushes and her hard black eyes never told anything notwithstanding these defects notwithstanding her board-like carriage she had by birth and education a grand air a proud demeanour in short everything that has been well named le je ne sais quoi due partly perhaps to her uncompromising simplicity of dress which stamped her as a woman of noble blood she dressed her hair to advantage and it might be accounted to her for a beauty for it grew vigorously thick and long she had cultivated her voice and it could cast a spell she sang exquisitely clotilde was just the woman of whom one says she has fine eyes or she has a delightful temper if any one addressed her in the english fashion as your grace she would say 
you mean your leanness why should not my poor clotilde have a lover replied the duchess to the marquise do you know what she said to me yesterday if i am loved for ambition's sake i undertake to make him love me for my own sake she is clever and ambitious and there are men who like those two qualities as for him my dear he is as handsome as a vision and if he can but repurchase the rubempre estates out of regard for us the king will reinstate him in the title of marquis after all his mother was the last of the rubempres poor fellow where is he to find a million francs said the marquise that is no concern of ours replied the duchess he is certainly incapable of stealing the money besides we would never give clotilde to an intriguing or dishonest man even if he were handsome young and a poet like monsieur de rubempre you are late this evening said clotilde smiling at lucien with infinite graciousness yes i have been dining out you have been quite gay these last few days said she concealing her jealousy and anxiety behind a smile quite gay replied lucien no only by the merest chance i have been dining every day this week with bankers to-day with the nucingens yesterday with du Tillet, the day before with the kellers whence it may be seen that lucien had succeeded in assuming the tone of light impertinence of great people you have many enemies said clotilde offering him how graciously a cup of tea some one told my father that you have debts to the amount of sixty thousand francs and that before long saint pelagie will be your summer quarters if you could know what all these calumnies are to me it all recoils on me i say nothing of my own suffering my father has a way of looking that crucifies me but of what you must be suffering if any least part of it should be the truth do not let such nonsense worry you love me as i love you and give me time a few months said lucien replacing his empty cup on the silver tray do not let my father see you he would say something disagreeable and as you could not submit to that we should be done for that odious marquise d'espard told him that your mother had been a monthly nurse and that your sister did ironing we were in the most abject poverty replied lucien the tears rising to his eyes that is not calumny but it is most ill-natured gossip my sister now is more than a millionaire and my mother has been dead two years this information has been kept in stock to use just when i should be on the verge of success here but what have you done to madame d'espard i was so rash at madame de serizy's as to tell the story with some added pleasantries in the presence of messieurs de bauvin and de granville of her attempt to get a commission of lunacy appointed to sit on her husband the marquis d'espard Pianchon had told it to me monsieur de granville's opinion supported by those of bauvin and serizy influenced the decision of the keeper of the seals they all were afraid of the gazette des tribunaux and dreaded the scandal and the marquise got her knuckles wrapped in the summing up for the judgment finally recorded in that miserable business though monsieur de serizy by his tattle has made the marquise my mortal foe i gained his good offices and those of the public prosecutor and comte d'octave de bauvin for madame de serizy told them the danger in which i stood in consequence of their allowing the source of their information to be guessed at the marquis d'espard was so clumsy as to call upon me regarding me as the first cause of his winning the day in that atrocious suit i will rescue you from madame d'espard said clotilde how cried lucien my mother will ask the young d'espards here they are charming boys and growing up now 
the father and sons will sing your praises and then we are sure never to see their mother again oh clotilde you are an angel if i did not love you for yourself i should love you for being so clever it is not cleverness said she all her love beaming on her lips good night do not come again for some few days when you see me in church at saint thomas d'aquin with a pink scarf my father will be in a better temper you will find an answer stuck to the back of the chair you are sitting in it will comfort you perhaps for not seeing me put the note you have brought under my handkerchief Section twelve of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy. Chapter twelve. Lucien took a cab in the Rue de la Planche, got out of it on the boulevards, took another by the Madeleine, and desired the driver to have the gates opened and drive in at the house in the Rue Tebou on going in at eleven o'clock he found esther in tears but dressed as she was wont to dress to do him honour she awaited her lucien reclining on a sofa covered with white satin brocaded with yellow flowers dressed in a bewitching wrapper of india muslin with cherry-coloured bows without her stays her hair simply twisted into a knot her feet in little velvet slippers lined with cherry-coloured satin all the candles were burning the hookah was prepared but she had not smoked her own which stood beside her unlighted emblematical of her loneliness on hearing the doors open she sprang up like a gazelle and threw her arms round lucien wrapping him like a web caught by the wind and flung about a tree parted is it true oh just for a few days replied lucien esther released him and fell back on her divan like a dead thing in these circumstances most women babble like parrots oh how they love at the end of five years they feel as if their first happiness were a thing of yesterday they cannot give you up they are magnificent in their indignation despair love grief dread dejection presentiments in short they are as sublime as a scene from shakespeare but make no mistake these women do not love when they are really all that they profess when they love truly they do as esther did as children do as true love does esther did not say a word she lay with her face buried in the pillows shedding bitter tears lucien on his part tried to lift her up and spoke to her but my child we are not to part what after four years of happiness is this the way you take a short absence what on earth do i do to all these girls he added to himself remembering that coralie had loved him thus ah oh, monsieur you are so handsome said europe the senses have their own ideal when added to this fascinating beauty we find the sweetness of nature the poetry that characterized lucien it is easy to conceive of the mad passion roused in such women keenly alive as they are to external gifts and artless in their admiration esther was sobbing quietly and lay in an attitude expressive of the deepest distress but little goose said lucien did you not understand that my life is at stake at these words which she chose on purpose esther started up like a wild animal her hair fell tumbling about her excited face like wreaths of foliage she looked steadily at lucien your life she cried throwing up her arms and letting them drop with a gesture known only to a courtesan in peril 
to be sure that friend's note speaks of serious risk she took a shabby scrap of paper out of her sash then seeing europe she said leave us my girl when europe had shut the door she went on here this is what he writes and she handed to lucien a note she had just received from carlos which lucien read aloud you must leave to-morrow at five in the morning you will be taken to a keeper's lodge in the heart of the forest of st germain where you will have a room on the first floor do not quit that room till i give you leave you will want for nothing the keeper and his wife are to be trusted do not write to lucien do not go to the window during daylight but you may walk by night with the keeper if you wish for exercise keep the carriage blinds down on the way lucien's life is at stake lucien will go to-night to bid you good-bye burn this in his presence lucien burned the note at once in the flame of a candle listen my own lucien said esther after hearing him read this letter as a criminal hears the sentence of death i will not tell you that i love you it would be idiotic for nearly five years it has been as natural to me to love you as to breathe and live from the first day when my happiness began under the protection of that inscrutable being who placed me here as you place some little curious beast in a cage i have known that you must marry marriage is a necessary factor in your career and god preserve me from hindering the development of your fortunes that marriage will be my death but i will not worry you i will not do as the common girls do who kill themselves by means of a brazier of charcoal i had enough of that once twice raises your gorge as mariette says no i will go a long way off out of france as z knows the secrets of her country she will help me to die quietly a prick with it is all over i ask but one thing my dearest and that is that you will not deceive me i have had my share of living since the day i first saw you in eighteen twenty four till this day i have known more happiness than can be put into the lives of ten fortunate wives so take me for what i am a woman as strong as i am weak say i am going to be married i will ask no more of you than a fond farewell and you shall never hear of me again there was a moment's silence after this explanation as sincere as her action and tone were guileless is it that you are going to be married she repeated looking into lucien's blue eyes with one of her fascinating glances as brilliant as a steel blade we have been toiling at my marriage for eighteen months past and it is not yet settled replied lucien i do not know when it can be settled but it is not in question now child it is the abbe i you we are in real peril nucingen saw you yes in the wood at vincennes said she did he recognize me no said lucien but he has fallen so desperately in love with you that he would sacrifice his coffers after dinner when he was describing how he had met you i was so foolish as to smile involuntarily and most imprudently for i live in a world like a savage surrounded by the traps of a hostile tribe carlos who spares me the pains of thinking regards the position as dangerous and he has undertaken to pay nucingen out if the baron takes it into his head to spy on us and he is quite capable of it he spoke to me of the incapacity of the police you have lighted a flame in an old chimney choked with soot and what does your spaniard propose to do asked esther very softly i do not know in the least said lucien he told me i might sleep soundly and leave it to him 
but he dared not look at esther if that is the case i will obey him with the dog-like submission i profess said esther putting her hand through lucien's arm and leading him into her bedroom saying at any rate i hope you dined well my lulu at that detestable baron's Aziz's cooking prevents my ever thinking a dinner good however famous the chef may be where i happen to dine however Karam did the dinner to-night as he does every sunday lucien involuntarily compared esther with clotilde the mistress was so beautiful so unfailingly charming that she had as yet kept at arm's length the monster who devours the most perennial loves satiety what a pity thought he to find one's wife in two volumes in one poetry delight love devotion beauty sweetness esther was fussing about as women do before going to bed she came and went and fluttered round singing all the time you might have thought her a humming-bird in the other a noble name family honours rank knowledge of the world and no earthly means of combining them cried lucien to himself next morning at seven when the poet awoke in the pretty pink and white room he found himself alone he rang and europe hurried in what are monsieur's orders esther madame went off this morning at a quarter to five by monsieur l'abbe's order i admitted a new face carriage paid a woman no sir an english woman one of those people who do their day's work by night and we are ordered to treat her as if she were madame what can you have to say to such hack poor madame how she cried when she got into the carriage well it has to be done cried she i left that poor dear boy asleep said she wiping away her tears europe if he had looked at me or spoken my name i should have stayed i could but have died with him i tell you sir i am so fond of madame that i did not show her the person who has taken her place some waiting-maids would have broken her heart by doing so and is the stranger there well sir she came in the chaise that took away madame and i hid her in my room in obedience to my instructions is she nice-looking so far as such a second-hand article can be but she will find her part easy enough if you Section 13 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter 13 The night before, ere going to bed, the all-powerful banker had given his orders to his valet, who, at seven in the morning, brought into him the notorious Louchard, the most famous of the commercial police, whom he left in a little sitting-room there the baron joined him in a dressing-gown and slippers you have made a fool of me he said in reply to this official's greeting i could not help myself monsieur le baron i do not want to lose my place and i had the honour of explaining to you that i could not meddle in a matter that had nothing to do with my functions what did i promise you to put you into communication with one of our agents who as it seemed to me would be best able to serve you but you know monsieur le baron the sharp lines that divide men of different trades if you build a house you do not set a carpenter to do smith's work well there are two branches of the police the political police and the judicial police the political police never interfere with the other branch and vice versa if you apply to the chief of the political police he must get permission from the minister to take up our business 
and you would not dare to explain it to the head of the police throughout the kingdom a police agent who should act on his own account would lose his place well the ordinary police are quite as cautious as the political police so no one whether in the home office or at the prefecture of police ever moves excepting in the interests of the state or for the ends of justice if there is a plot or a crime to be followed up then indeed the heads of the corps are at your service but you must understand monsieur le baron that they have other fish to fry than looking after the fifty thousand love affairs in paris as to me and my men our only business is to arrest debtors and as soon as anything else is to be done we run enormous risks if we interfere with the peace and quiet of any man or woman i sent you one of my men but i told you i could not answer for him you instructed him to find a particular woman in paris contenson bled you of a thousand franc note and did not even move you might as well look for a needle in the river as for a woman in paris who is supposed to haunt vincennes and of whom the description answers to every pretty woman in the capital and could not contenson have told me the truth instead of making me plead out one thousand franc listen to me monsieur le baron said louchard will you give me a thousand crowns i will give you sell you a piece of advice is it vert one thousand crowns your advice asked nucingen i am not to be caught monsieur le baron answered louchard you are in love you want to discover the object of your passion you are getting as yellow as a lettuce without water two physicians came to see you yesterday your man tells me who think your life is in danger now i alone can put you in the hands of a clever fellow but the deuce is in it if your life is not worth a thousand crowns tell me the name of that clever fellow and depend on my generosity louchard took up his hat bowed and left the room what ein teufel cried nucingen come back look here take notice said louchard before taking the money i am only selling a piece of information pure and simple i can give you the name and address of the only man who is able to be of use to you but he is a master get out mit you cried nucingen there is not no name that is vert one thousand crowned but that von Warschild and that only bennett is sign at the bottom of a bank bill i shall give you one thousand franc louchard a little weasel who had never been able to purchase an office as lawyer notary clerk or attorney leered at the baron in a significant fashion to you a thousand crowns or let it alone you will get them back in a few seconds on the bourse said he i will give you one thousand franc repeated the baron you would cheapen a gold mine said louchard bowing and leaving i shall get that address for five hundred franc cried the baron who desired his servant to send his secretary to him tourcaret is no more in these days the smallest banker like the greatest exercises his acumen in the smallest transactions he bargains over art beneficence and love he would bargain with the pope for a dispensation thus as he listened to louchard nucingen had hastily concluded that contenson louchard's right-hand man must certainly know the address of that master spy contenson would tell him for five hundred francs what louchard wanted to see a thousand crowns for the rapid calculation plainly proves that if the man's heart was in possession of love his head was still that of the lynx stock jobber go your own self monsieur said the baron to his secretary to contenson that spy of louchard's the bailiff man but go in one capriolet very quick and bring him here quick to me i shall wait go out to the garden 
here is that key for no man shall see that man in here you shall take him into that little garten house try to do that little business very clever visitors called to see nucingen on business but he waited for contenson he was dreaming of esther telling himself that before long he would see again the woman who had aroused in him such unhoped-for emotions and he sent everybody away with vague replies and double-edged promises contenson was to him the most important person in paris and he looked out into the garden every minute finally after giving orders that no one else was to be admitted he had his breakfast served in the summer-house at one corner of the garden in the banker's office the conduct and hesitancy of the most knowing the most clear-sighted the shrewdest of paris financiers seemed inexplicable what ails the chief said a stockbroker to one of the head clerks no one knows they are anxious about his health it would seem yesterday madame la baronne got desplein and bianchon to meet one day when sir isaac newton was engaged in physicking one of his dogs named beauty who as is well known destroyed a vast amount of work and whom he reproved only in these words ah beauty you little know the mischief you have done some strangers called to see him but they at once retired respecting the great man's occupation in every more or less lofty life there is a little dog beauty when the marechal de richelieu came to pay his respects to louis the fifteenth after taking mahon one of the greatest feats of arms of the eighteenth century the king said to him have you heard the great news poor lansmat is dead lansmat was a gatekeeper in the secret of the king's intrigues the bankers of paris never knew how much they owed to contenson that spy was the cause of nucingen's allowing an immense loan to be issued in which his share was allotted to him and which he gave over to them the stock jobber could aim at a fortune any day with the artillery of speculation but the man was a slave to the hope of happiness the great banker drank some tea and was nibbling at a slice of bread and butter as a man does whose teeth have for long been sharpened by appetite when he heard a carriage stop at the little garden gate in a few minutes his secretary brought in contenson whom he had run to earth in a cafe not far from saint pelagie where the man was breakfasting on the strength of a bribe given to him by an imprisoned debtor for certain allowances that must be paid for contenson you must know was a whole poem a paris poem merely to see him would have been enough to tell you that beaumarchais figaro moliere's mascaril marivaux's frontin and dancourt's la fleur those great representatives of audacious swindling of cunning driven to bay of stratagem rising again from the ends of its broken wires were all quite second-rate by comparison with this giant of cleverness and meanness when in paris you find a real type he is no longer a man he is a spectacle no longer a factor in life but a whole life many lives bake a plaster cast four times in a furnace and you get a sort of bastard imitation of florentine bronze well the thunderbolts of numberless disasters the pressure of terrible necessities had bronzed contenson's head as though sweating in an oven had three times overstained his skin closely set wrinkles that could no longer be relaxed made eternal furrows whiter in their cracks the yellow face was all wrinkles the bald skull resembling voltaire's was as parched as a death's head and but for a few hairs at the back it would have seemed doubtful whether it was that of a living man under a rigid brow a pair of chinese eyes like those of an image under a glass shade in a tea-shop artificial eyes which sham life but never vary moved but expressed nothing 
the nose as flat as that of a skull sniffed at fate and the mouth as thin-lipped as a miser's was always open but as expressionless as the grin of a letter-box contenson as apathetic as a savage with sunburned hands affected that diogenes-like indifference which can never bend to any formality of respect and what a commentary on his life was written on his dress for any one who can decipher a dress above all what trousers made by long wear as black and shiny as the camlet of which lawyers gowns are made a waistcoat bought in an old clothes shop in the temple with a deep embroidered collar a rusty black coat and everything well brushed clean after a fashion and graced by a watch and an imitation gold chain contenson allowed a triangle of shirt to show with pleats in which glittered a sham diamond pin his black velvet stock set stiff like a gorget over which lay rolls of flesh as red as that of a carabee his silk hat was as glossy as satin but the lining would have yielded grease enough for two street lamps if some grocer had bought it to boil down but to enumerate these accessories is nothing if only i could give an idea of the air of immense importance that contenson contrived to impart to them there was something indescribably knowing in the collar of his coat and the fresh blacking on a pair of boots with gaping soles to which no language can do justice however to give some notion of this medley of effect it may be added that any man of intelligence would have felt only on seeing contenson that if instead of being a spy he had been a thief all these odds and ends instead of raising a smile would have made one shudder with horror judging only from his dress the observer would have said to himself that is a scoundrel he gambles he drinks he is full of vices but he does not get drunk he does not cheat he is neither a thief nor a murderer and contenson remained inscrutable till the word spy suggested itself this man had followed as many unrecognized trades as there are recognized ones the sly smile on his lips the twinkle of his green eyes the queer twitch of his snub nose showed that he was not deficient in humor he had a face of sheet tin and his soul must probably be like his face every movement of his countenance was a grimace wrung from him by politeness rather than by any expression of an inmost impulse he would have been alarming if he had not seemed so droll contenson one of the most curious products of the scum that rises to the top of the seething paris cauldron where everything ferments prided himself on being above all things a philosopher he would say without any bitter feeling i have great talents but of what use are they i might as well have been an idiot and he blamed himself instead of accusing mankind find if you can many spies who have not had more venom about them than contenson had circumstances are against me he would say to his chiefs we might be fine crystal we are but grains of sand that is all his indifference to dress had some sense he cared no more about his everyday clothes than an actor does he excelled in disguising himself in make-up he could have given frederic lemaitre a lesson for he could be a dandy when necessary formerly in his younger days he must have mingled in the out at elbows society of people living on a humble scale he expressed excessive disgust for the criminal police corps for under the empire he had belonged to fouche's police and looked upon him as a great man since the suppression of this government department he had devoted his energies to the tracking of commercial defaulters 
but his well-known talents and acumen made him a valuable auxiliary and the unrecognized chiefs of the political police had kept his name on their lists contenson like his fellows was only a super in the dramas of which the leading parts were played by his chief when a political investigation was in the wind gauvet said nucingen dismissing his secretary with a wave of the hand why should this man live in a mansion and i in a lodging wondered contenson to himself he has dodged his creditors three times he has robbed them i never stole a farthing i am a cleverer fellow than he is contenson mein freund said the baron you have what you call plead me of one thousand franc note my girl owed god and the devil what you have a girl a mistress cried nucingen looking at contenson with admiration not unmixed with envy i am but sixty-six replied contenson as a man whom vice has kept young as a bad example and what do she do she helps me said contenson when a man is a thief and an honest woman loves him either she becomes a thief or he becomes an honest man i have always been a spy and you want money always asked nucingen always said contenson with a smile it is part of my business to want money as it is yours to make it we shall easily come to an understanding you find me a little and i will undertake to spend it you shall be the well and i the bucket would you like to have one note for five hundred franc what a question but what a fool am i you do not offer it out of a disinterested desire to repair the slights of fortune not at all i give it besides the one thousand franc note what you plead me off that makes fifteen hundred francs that i give you very good you give me the thousand francs i have had and you will add five hundred francs yes so said nucingen nodding but that still leaves only five hundred francs said contenson imperturbably that i gif added the baron that i take very good and what monsieur le baron do you want for it i have been told that there was in paris one man vat could find the woman vat i love and that you know his address a real master to spy very true well then give me that address and i give you five hundred franc where are they said contenson here they are said the baron drawing a note out of his pocket all right hand them over said contenson holding out his hand nothing for nothing let us see the man and you get the money you might sell to me many address at that price contenson began to laugh to be sure you have a right to think that of me said he with an air of blaming himself the more rascally our business is the more honesty is necessary but look here monsieur le baron make it six hundred and i will give you a bit of advice give it and trust to my generosity i will risk it contenson said but it is playing high in such matters you see we have to work underground you say quick march you are rich you think that money can do everything well money is something no doubt still money can only buy men as the two or three best heads in our force so often say and there are many things you would never think of which money cannot buy you cannot buy good luck so good police work is not done in this style will you show yourself in a carriage with me we should be seen chance is just as often for us as against us really truly said the baron why of course sir a horseshoe picked up in the street led the chief of the police to the discovery of the infernal machine well if we were to go to-night in a hackney coach to 
monsieur de saint-germain he would not like to see you walk in any more than you would like to be seen going there that is true said the baron ah he is the greatest of the great such another as the famous corentin fouche's right arm who was some say his natural son born while he was still a priest but that is nonsense fouche knew how to be a priest as he knew how to be a minister well you will not get this man to do anything for you you see for less than ten thousand franc notes think of that but he will do the job and do it well neither seen nor heard as they say i ought to give monsieur de saint-germain notice and he will fix a time for your meeting in some place where no one can see or hear for it is a dangerous game to play policeman for private interests still what is to be said he is a good fellow the king of good fellows and a man who has undergone much persecution and for having saved his country too like me like all who helped to save it well then write and name the happy day said the baron smiling at his humble jest and monsieur le baron will allow me to drink his health said contenson with a manner at once cringing and threatening jean cried the baron to the gardener go and tell georges to send me one twenty francs and bring him to me still monsieur le baron if you have no more information than you have just given me i doubt whether the great man can be of any use to you i know of others replied the baron with a cunning look i have the honor to bid you good morning monsieur le baron said contenson taking the twenty-franc piece i shall have the honor of calling again to tell georges where you are to go this evening for we never write anything in such cases when they are well managed it is funny how sharp these rascals are Section 14 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac Translated by James Waring This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary Esther Happy Chapter 14 When he left the Baron, Contenson went quietly from the Rue Saint-Lazare to the Rue Saint-Honoré, as far as the Café David. He looked in through the windows, and saw an old man who was known there by the name of Le Père Cancoel. The Café David, at the corner of the Rue de la Monnaie and the Rue Saint-Honoré, enjoyed a certain celebrity during the first thirty years of the century, though its fame was limited to the quarter known as that of the Bourdonnais. Here certain old retired merchants and large shopkeepers still in trade were wont to meet, the Camusots, the Lubas, the Pilaros, the Papineaus, and a few house-owners like little old Molineux. Now and again old Guillaume might be seen there, coming from the Rue du Colombier. Politics were discussed in a quiet way, but cautiously, for the opinions of the Café David were liberal. The gossip of the neighborhood was repeated. Men so urgently feel the need of laughing at each other. This café, like all cafés for that matter, had its eccentric character in the person of the said Père Cancoel, who had been regular in his attendance there since 1811, and who seemed to be so completely in harmony with the good folks who assembled there that they all talked politics in his presence without reserve. Sometimes this old fellow, whose guilelessness was the subject of much laughter to the customers, would disappear for a month or two but his absence never surprised anybody and was always attributed to his infirmities or his great age for he looked more than sixty in eighteen eleven what has become of old Concoel? one or another would ask of the manageress at the desk i quite expect that one fine day we shall read in the advertisement sheet that he is dead she would reply 
old conquerwell bore a perpetual certificate of his native province in his accent he spoke of un statue a statue le peuple the people and said tour for turc his name was that of a tiny estate called les conquelles a word meaning cockchafer in some districts situated in the department of vaucluse whence he had come at last every one had fallen into the habit of calling him conquel instead of des conquel and the old man took no offence for in his opinion the nobility had perished in seventeen ninety three and besides the land of les conquel did not belong to him he was a younger son's younger son nowadays old conquel's costume would look strange but between eighteen eleven and eighteen twenty it astonished no one the old man wore shoes with cut steel buckles silk stockings with stripes round the leg alternately blue and white corded silk knee-breeches with oval buckles cut to match those on his shoes a white embroidered waistcoat an old coat of olive-brown with metal buttons and a shirt with a flat pleated frill completed his costume in the middle of the shirt frill twinkled a small gold locket in which might be seen under glass a little temple worked in hair one of those pathetic trifles which give men confidence just as a scarecrow frightens sparrows most men like other animals are frightened or reassured by trifles old conquel's breeches were kept in place by a buckle which in the fashion of the last century tightened them across the stomach from the belt hung on each side a short steel chain composed of several finer chains and ending in a bunch of seals his white neckcloth was fastened behind by a small gold buckle finally on his snowy and powdered hair he still in eighteen sixteen wore the municipal cocked hat which m Truy, the president of the law courts also used to wear but pere conquel had recently substituted for this hat so dear to old men the undignified top hat which no one dares to rebel against the good man thought he owed so much as this to the spirit of the age a small pigtail tied with a ribbon had traced a semicircle on the back of his coat the greasy mark being hidden by powder if you looked no further than the most conspicuous feature of his face a nose covered with excrescences red and swollen enough to figure in a dish of truffles you might have inferred that the worthy man had an easy temper foolish and easy-going that of a perfect gaby and you would have been deceived like all at the cafe david where no one had ever remarked the studious brow the sardonic mouth and the cold eyes of this old man petted by his vices and as calm as vitellius whose imperial and portly stomach reappeared in him palagenetically so to speak in eighteen sixteen a young commercial traveller named gaudissart who frequented the cafe david sat drinking from eleven o'clock till midnight with a half-pay officer he was so rash as to discuss a conspiracy against the bourbons a rather serious plot then on the point of execution there was no one to be seen in the cafe but pere conquel who seemed to be asleep two waiters who were dozing and the accountant at the desk within four-and-twenty hours gaudissart was arrested the plot was discovered two men perished on the scaffold neither gaudissart nor any one else ever suspected that worthy old conquel of having peached the waiters were dismissed for a year they were all on their guard and afraid of the police as pere conquel was too indeed he talked of retiring from the cafe david such horror had he of the police contenson went into the cafe asked for a glass of brandy and did not look at conquel who sat reading the papers but when he had gulped down the brandy he took out the baron's gold piece and called the waiter by rapping three short raps on the table 
the lady at the desk and the waiter examined the coin with a minute care that was not flattering to contenson but their suspicions were justified by the astonishment produced on all the regular customers by contenson's appearance was that gold got by theft or by murder this was the idea that rose to some clear and shrewd minds as they looked at contenson over their spectacles while affecting to read the news contenson who saw everything and never was surprised at anything scornfully wiped his lips with a bandana in which there were but three darns took his change slipped all the coppers into his side pocket of which the lining once white was now as black as the cloth of the trousers and did not leave one for the waiter what a gallows bird said pere canquoel to his neighbor monsieur pillerault pshaw said monsieur camusot to all the company for he alone had expressed no astonishment it is contenson louchard's right-hand man the police agent we employ in business the rascals want to nab some one who is hanging about perhaps it would seem necessary to explain here the terrible and profoundly cunning man who was hidden under the guise of pere canquoel as vautrin was hidden under that of the abbe carlos born at canquoel the only possession of his family which was highly respectable this southerner's name was peyrade he belonged in fact to the younger branch of the peyrade family an old but impoverished house of franche comte still owning the little estate of la peyrade the seventh child of his father he had come on foot to paris in seventeen seventy two at the age of seventeen with two crowns of six francs in his pocket prompted by the vices of an ardent spirit and the coarse desire to get on which brings so many men to paris from the south as soon as they understand that their father's property can never supply them with means to gratify their passions it is enough to say of peyrade's youth that in seventeen eighty two he was in the confidence of chiefs of the police and the hero of the department highly esteemed by messieurs lenoir and d'albert the last lieutenant-generals of police the revolution had no police it needed none espionage though common enough was called public spirit the directorate a rather more regular government than that of the committee of public safety was obliged to reorganize the police and the first consul completed the work by instituting a prefect of police and a department of police supervision peyrade a man knowing the traditions collected the force with the assistance of a man named corentin a far cleverer man than peyrade though younger but he was a genius only in the subterranean ways of police inquiries in eighteen hundred and eight the great services peyrade was able to achieve were rewarded by an appointment to the eminent position of chief commissioner of police at antwerp in napoleon's mind this sort of police governorship was equivalent to a minister's post with the duty of superintending holland at the end of the campaign of eighteen hundred and nine peyrade was removed from antwerp by an order in council from the emperor carried in a chaise to paris between two gendarmes and imprisoned in la force two months later he was let out on bail furnished by his friend corentin after having been subjected to three examinations each lasting six hours in the office of the head of the police did peyrade owe his overthrow to the miraculous energy he displayed in aiding fouché in the defence of the french coast when threatened by what was known at the time as the valcarin expedition when the duke of otranto manifested such abilities as alarmed the emperor fouché thought it probable even then and now when everybody knows what went on in the cabinet council called together by cambacere it is absolutely certain the ministers thunderstruck by the news of england's attempt a retaliation on napoleon for the boulogne expedition and taken by surprise when the master was entrenched in the island of lobo 
where all europe believed him to be lost had not an idea which way to turn the general opinion was in favor of sending post-haste to the emperor fouche alone was bold enough to sketch a plan of campaign which in fact he carried into execution do as you please said cambaceret but i who prefer to keep my head on my shoulders shall send a report to the emperor it is well known that the emperor on his return found an absurd pretext at a full meeting of the council of state for discarding his minister and punishing him for having saved france without the sovereign's help from that time forth napoleon had doubled the hostility of prince de talleyrand and the duke of otranto the only two great politicians formed by the revolution who might perhaps have been able to save napoleon in eighteen thirteen to get rid of peyrade he was simply accused of connivance in favoring smuggling and sharing certain profits with the great merchants such an indignity was hard on a man who had earned the marshal's baton of the police department by the great services he had done this man who had grown old in active business knew all the secrets of every government since seventeen seventy five when he had entered the service the emperor who believed himself powerful enough to create men for his own uses paid no heed to the representation subsequently laid before him in favor of a man who was reckoned as one of the most trustworthy most capable and most acute of the unknown genii whose task it is to watch over the safety of a state he thought he could put contenson in peyrade's place but contenson was at that time employed by corentin for his own benefit peyrade felt the blow all the more keenly because being greedy and a libertine he had found himself with regard to women in the position of a pastry-cook who loves sweetmeats his habits of vice had become to him a second nature he could not live without a good dinner without gambling in short without the life of an unpretentious fine gentleman in which men of powerful faculties so generally indulge when they have allowed excessive dissipation to become a necessity hitherto he had lived in style without ever being expected to entertain and living well for no one ever looked for a return from him or from his friend corentin he was cynically witty and he liked his profession he was a philosopher and besides a spy whatever grade he may hold in the machinery of the police can no more return to a profession regarded as honorable or liberal than a prisoner from the hulks can once branded once matriculated spies and convicts like deacons have assumed an indelible character there are beings on whom social conditions impose an inevitable fate peyrade for his further woe was very fond of a pretty little girl whom he knew to be his own child by a celebrated actress to whom he had done a signal service and who for three months had been grateful to him peyrade who had sent for his child from antwerp now found himself without employment in paris and with no means beyond a pension of twelve hundred francs a year allowed him by the police department as lenoir's old disciple he took lodgings in the rue des moineaux on the fourth floor five little rooms at a rent of two hundred and fifty francs if any man should be aware of the uses and sweets of friendship is it not the moral leper known to the world as a spy to the mob as a mouchard to the department as an agent peyrade and corentin were such friends as orestes and pylades peyrade had trained corentin as vien trained david but the pupil soon surpassed his master they had carried out more than one undertaking together peyrade happy at having discerned corentin's superior abilities had started him in his career by preparing a success for him he obliged his disciple to make use of a mistress who had scorned him as a bait to catch a man see the chouans 
and corentin at that time was hardly five-and-twenty corentin who had been retained as one of the generals of whom the minister of police is the high constable still held under the duc de rovigo the high position he had filled under the duke of otranto now at that time the general police and the criminal police were managed on similar principles when any important business was on hand an account was opened as it were for the three four five really capable agents the minister on being warned of some plot by whatever means would say to one of his colonels of the police force how much will you want to achieve this or that result corentin or contenson would go into the matter and reply twenty thirty or forty thousand francs then as soon as the order was given to go ahead all the means and the men were left to the judgment of corentin or the agent selected and the criminal police used to act in the same way to discover crimes with the famous vidoc both branches of the police chose their men chiefly from among the ranks of well-known agents who have matriculated in the business and are as it were as soldiers of the secret army so indispensable to a government in spite of the public orations of philanthropists or narrow-minded moralists but the absolute confidence placed in two men of the temper of peyrade and corentin conveyed to them the right of employing perfect strangers under the risk moreover of being responsible to the minister in all serious cases peyrade's experience and acumen were too valuable to corentin who after the storm of eighteen twenty had blown over employed his old friend constantly consulted him and contributed largely to his maintenance corentin managed to put about a thousand francs a month into peyrade's hands peyrade on his part did corentin good service in eighteen sixteen corentin on the strength of the discovery of the conspiracy in which the bonapartist gaudissart was implicated tried to get peyrade reinstated in his place at the police office but some unknown influence was working against peyrade this was the reason why in their anxiety to make themselves necessary peyrade corentin and contenson at the duke of otranto's instigation had organized for the benefit of louis the eighteenth a sort of opposition police in which very capable agents were employed louis the eighteenth died possessed of secrets which will remain secrets from the best informed historians the struggle between the general police of the kingdom and the king's opposition police led to many horrible disasters of which a certain number of executions sealed the secrets this is neither the place nor the occasion for entering into details on this subject for these scenes of paris life are not scenes of political life enough has been said to show what were the means of living of the man who at the cafe david was known as good old Conquel, and by what threads he was tied to the terrible and mysterious powers of the police between eighteen seventeen and eighteen twenty two corentin contenson peyrade and their myrmidons were often required to keep watch over the minister of police himself this perhaps explains why the minister declined to employ peyrade and contenson on whom corentin contrived to cast the minister's suspicions in order to be able to make use of his friend when his reinstatement was evidently out of the question the ministry put their faith in corentin they enjoined him to keep an eye on peyrade which amused louis the eighteenth corentin and peyrade were then masters of the position contenson long attached to peyrade was still at his service he had joined the force of the commercial police the garde du commerce by his friend's orders and in fact as a result of the sort of zeal that is inspired by a profession we love these two chiefs liked to place their best men in those posts where information was most likely to flow in 
and indeed contenson's vices and dissipated habits which had dragged him lower than his two friends consumed so much money that he needed a great deal of business contenson without committing any indiscretion had told louchard that he knew the only man who was capable of doing what the baron de nucingen required peyrade was in fact the only police agent who could act on behalf of a private individual with impunity at the death of louis the eighteenth peyrade had not only ceased to be of consequence but had lost the profits of his position as spy in ordinary to his majesty believing himself to be indispensable he had lived fast women high feeding and the club the cercle des étrangers had prevented this man from saving and like all men cut out for debauchery he enjoyed an iron constitution but between eighteen twenty six and eighteen twenty nine when he was nearly seventy-four years of age he had stuck half-way to use his own expression year by year he saw his comforts dwindling he followed the police department to its grave and saw with regret that charles the tenth's government was departing from its good old traditions every session saw the estimates pared down which were necessary to keep up the police out of hatred for that method of government and a firm determination to reform that institution it is as if they thought they could cook in white gloves said peyrade to corentin in eighteen twenty two this couple foresaw eighteen thirty they knew how bitterly louis the eighteenth hated his successor which accounts for his recklessness with regard Section fifteen of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy. Chapter fifteen. As Peyrad grew older, his love for his natural daughter had increased. For her sake, he had adopted his citizen guise for he intended that his lady should marry respectably so for the last three years he had been especially anxious to find a corner either at the prefecture of police or in the general police office some ostensible and recognized post he had ended by inventing a place of which the necessity as he told corentin would sooner or later be felt he was anxious to create an inquiry office at the prefecture of police to be intermediate between the paris police in the strictest sense the criminal police and the superior general police so as to enable the supreme board to profit by the various scattered forces no one but peyrade at his age and after fifty-five years of confidential work could be the connecting link between the three branches of the police or the keeper of the records to whom political and judicial authority alike could apply for the elucidation of certain cases by this means peyrade hoped with corentin's assistance to find a husband and scrape together a portion for his little didi corentin had already mentioned the matter to the director-general of the police forces of the realm without naming peyrade and the director-general a man from the south thought it necessary that the suggestion should come from the chief of the city police at the moment when contenson struck three raps on the table with the gold piece a signal conveying i want to speak to you the senior was reflecting on this problem by whom and under what pressure can the prefet of police be made to move and he looked like a noodle studying his courrier francais poor fouche 
thought he to himself as he made his way along the rue saint honore that great man is dead our go-betweens with louis the eighteenth are out of favor and besides as corentin said only yesterday nobody believes in the activity or the intelligence of a man of seventy oh why did i get into a habit of dining at verrie's of drinking choice wines of singing la mer gaudichon of gambling when i am in funds to get a place and keep it as corentin says it is not enough to be clever you must have the gift of management poor dear m lenoir was right when he wrote to me in the matter of the queen's necklace you will never do any good when he heard that i did not stay under that slut oliva's bed if the venerable pere Conquel, he was called so in the house lived on in the rue des moineaux on a fourth floor you may depend on it he had found some peculiarity in the arrangement of the premises which favored the practice of his terrible profession the house standing at the corner of the rue saint roch had no neighbors on one side and as the staircase up the middle divided it into two there were on each floor two perfectly isolated rooms those two rooms looked out on the rue saint roch there were garret rooms above the fourth floor one of them a kitchen and the other a bedroom for pere conquel's only servant a fleming named cat formerly lydie's wet nurse old conquel had taken one of the outside rooms for his bedroom and the other for his study the study ended at the party wall a very thick one the window opening on the rue des moineaux looked on a blank wall at the opposite corner as this study was divided from the stairs by the whole width of peyrade's bedroom the friends feared no eye no ear as they talked business in this study made on purpose for his detestable trade peyrade as a further precaution had furnished cat's room with a thick straw bed a felt carpet and a very heavy rug under the pretext of making his child's nurse comfortable he had also stopped up the chimney warming his room by a stove with a pipe through the wall to the rue saint roch finally he laid several rugs on his floor to prevent the slightest sound being heard by the neighbors beneath an expert himself in the tricks of spies he sounded the outer wall the ceiling and the floor once a week examining them as if he were in search of noxious insects it was the security of this room from all witnesses or listeners that had made corentin select it as his council chamber when he did not hold a meeting in his own room where corentin lived was known to no one but the chief of the superior police and to peyrade he received there such personages as the ministry or the king selected to conduct very serious cases but no agent or subordinate ever went there and he plotted everything connected with their business at peyrade's in this unpretentious room schemes were matured and resolutions passed which would have furnished strange records and curious dramas if only walls could talk between eighteen sixteen and eighteen twenty six the highest interests were discussed there there first germinated the events which grew to weigh on france there peyrade and corentin with all the foresight and more than all the information of bellard the attorney-general had said even in eighteen nineteen if louis the eighteenth does not consent to strike such or such a blow to make away with such or such a prince is it because he hates his brother he must wish to leave him heir to a revolution peyrade's door was graced with a slate on which very strange marks might sometimes be seen 
figures scrawled in chalk this sort of devil's algebra bore the clearest meaning to the initiated lydie's rooms opposite to peyrade's shabby lodging consisted of an ante-room a little drawing-room a bedroom and a small dressing-room the door like that of peyrade's room was constructed of a plate of sheet iron three lines thick sandwiched between two strong oak planks fitted with locks and elaborate hinges making it as impossible to force it as if it were a prison door thus though the house had a public passage through it with a shop below and no doorkeeper lydie lived there without a fear the dining-room the little drawing-room and her bedroom every window balcony a hanging garden were luxurious in their dutch cleanliness the flemish nurse had never left lydie whom she called her daughter the two went to church with the regularity that gave the royalist grocer who lived below in the corner shop an excellent opinion of the worthy conquel the grocer's family kitchen and counter jumpers occupied the first floor and the entresol the landlord inhabited the second floor and the third had been let for twenty years past to a lapidary each resident had a key of the street door the grocer's wife was all the more willing to receive letters and parcels addressed to these three quiet households because the grocer's shop had a letter-box without these details strangers or even those who know paris well could not have understood the privacy and quietude the isolation and safety which made this house exceptional in paris after midnight pere conquel could hatch plots receive spies or ministers wives or hussies without any one on earth knowing anything about it peyrade of whom the flemish woman would say to the grocer's cook he would not hurt a fly was regarded as the best of men he grudged his daughter nothing lydie who had been taught music by schmucke was herself a musician capable of composing she could wash in a sepia drawing and paint in gouache and water-colour every sunday peyrade dined at home with her on that day this worthy was wholly paternal lydie religious but not a bigot took the sacrament at easter and confessed every month still she allowed herself from time to time to be treated to the play she walked in the tuileries when it was fine these were all her pleasures for she led a sedentary life lydie who worshipped her father knew absolutely nothing of his sinister gifts and dark employments not a wish had ever disturbed this pure child's pure life slight and handsome like her mother gifted with an exquisite voice and a delicate face framed in fine fair hair she looked like one of those angels mystical rather than real which some of the early painters grouped in the background of the holy family the glance of her blue eyes seemed to bring a beam from the sky on those she favoured with a look her dress quite simple with no exaggeration of fashion had a delightful middle-class modesty picture to yourself an old satan as the father of an angel and purified in her divine presence and you will have an idea of peyrade and his daughter if anybody had soiled this jewel her father would have invented to swallow him alive one of those dreadful plots in which under the restoration the unhappy wretches were trapped who were designated to die on the scaffold a thousand crowns were ample maintenance for lydie and kat whom she called nurse as peyrade turned into the rue des moineaux he saw contenson he outstripped him went upstairs before him heard the man's steps on the stairs 
and admitted him before the woman had put her nose out of the kitchen door a bell rung by the opening of a glass door on the third story where the lapidary lived warned the residents on that and the fourth floors when a visitor was coming to them it need hardly be said that after midnight peyrade muffled this spell what is up in such a hurry philosopher philosopher was the nickname bestowed on contenson by peyrade and well merited by the epictetus among police agents the name of contenson alas hid one of the most ancient names of feudal normandy well there is something like ten thousand francs to be netted what is it political no a piece of idiocy baron de nucingen you know the old certified swindler is neighing after a woman he saw in the bois de vincennes and she has got to be found or he will die of love they had a consultation of doctors yesterday by what his man tells me i have already eased him of a thousand francs under pretence of seeking the fair one and contenson related nucingen's meeting with esther adding that the baron had now some further information all right said peyrade we will find his dulcinea tell the baron to come to-night in a carriage to the champs-elysees the corner of the avenue de gabriel and the allée de marigny peyrade saw contenson out and knocked at his daughter's rooms as he always knocked to be let in he was full of glee chance had just offered the means at last of getting the place he longed for he flung himself into a deep armchair after kissing lydie on the forehead and said play me something lydie played him a composition for the piano by beethoven that is very well played my pet said he taking lydie on his knees do you know that we are one and twenty years old we must get married soon for our old daddy is more than seventy i am quite happy here said she you love no one but your ugly old father asked peyrade why whom should i love i am dining at home my darling go and tell cat i am thinking of settling of getting an appointment and finding a husband worthy of you some good young man very clever whom you may some day be proud of i have never seen but one yet that i should have liked for a husband you have seen one then yes in the tuileries replied lydie he walked past me he was giving his arm to the comtesse de serizy and his name is lucien de Rubempre. i was sitting with cat under a lime tree thinking of nothing there were two ladies sitting by me and one said to the other there are madame de serizy and that handsome lucien de Rubempre." i looked at the couple that the two ladies were watching oh my dear said the other some women are very lucky that woman is allowed to do everything she pleases just because she was a de Roncarol, and her husband is in power but my dear said the other lady lucien costs her very dear what did she mean papa just nonsense such as people of fashion will talk replied peyrade with an air of perfect candour perhaps they were alluding to political matters well in short you asked me a question so i answer you if you want me to marry find me a husband just like that young man silly child replied her father the fact that a man is handsome is not always a sign of goodness young men gifted with an attractive appearance meet with no obstacles at the beginning of life so they make no use of any talent 
they are corrupted by the advances made to them by society and they have to pay interest later for their attractiveness what i should like for you is what the middle classes the rich and the fools leave unholpen and unprotected what father an unrecognized man of talent but there child i have it in my power to hunt through every garret in paris and carry out your programme by offering for your affection a man as handsome as the young scamp you speak of but a man of promise with a future before him destined to glory and fortune by the way i was forgetting i must have a whole flock of nephews and among them there must be one worthy of you i will write or get some one to write to provence a strange coincidence at this moment a young man half dead of hunger and fatigue who had come on foot from the department of vaucluse a nephew of pere Conquewell's in search of his uncle was entering paris through the barriere de l'italie in the day-dreams of the family ignorant of this uncle's fate peyrade had supplied the text for many hopes he was supposed to have returned from india with millions stimulated by these fireside romances this grand-nephew named theodore had started on Section 16 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy, Chapter 16. After enjoying for some hours the joys of paternity, Peyrade, his hair washed and dyed, for his powder was a disguise, dressed in a stout coarse blue frock coat buttoned up to the chin and a black cloak shod in strong thick-soled boots furnished himself with a private card and walked slowly along the avenue gabrielle where contenson dressed as an old costermonger woman met him in front of the gardens of the elysee bourbon monsieur de saint germain said contenson giving his old chief the name he was officially known by you have put me in the way of making five hundred pieces francs but what i came here for was to tell you that that damned baron before he gave me the shiners had been to ask questions at the house the prefecture of police i shall want you no doubt replied peyrade look up numbers seven ten and twenty one we can employ those men without any one finding it out either at the police ministry or at the prefecture contenson went back to a post near the carriage in which monsieur de nucingen was waiting for peyrade i am monsieur de saint germain said peyrade to the baron raising himself to look over the carriage door ver gut get in mit me replied the baron ordering the coachman to go on slowly to the arc de l'etoile you have been to the prefecture of police monsieur le baron that was not fair might i ask what you said to monsieur le prefet and what he said in reply asked peyrade before i should give five hundred francs to a felon like contenson i want to know if he had earned them i simply said to the prefet of police that i want to employ an agent named peyrat to go abroad in a delicate matter and should i trust him unlimited the prefet told me you was a very clever man and very honest man and that was everything and now that you have learned my true name monsieur le baron will you tell me what it is you want when the baron had given a long and copious explanation in his hideous polish jew dialect of his meeting with esther and the cry of the man behind the carriage and his vain efforts 
he ended by relating what had occurred at his house the night before lucien's involuntary smile and the opinion expressed by bianchon and some other young dandies that there must be some acquaintance between him and the unknown fair listen to me monsieur le baron you must in the first instance place ten thousand francs in my hands on account for expenses for to you this is a matter of life or death and as your life is a business manufactory nothing must be left undone to find this woman for you oh you are caught ja i am caught if more money is wanted baron i will let you know put your trust in me said peyrade i am not a spy as you perhaps imagine in eighteen hundred and seven i was commissioner-general of police at antwerp and now that louis the eighteenth is dead i may tell you in confidence that for seven years i was the chief of his counter-police so there is no beating me down you must understand monsieur le baron that it is impossible to make any estimate of the cost of each man's conscience before going into the details of such an affair be quite easy i shall succeed do not fancy that you can satisfy me with a sum of money i want something for my reward so long as that is not a kingdom said the baron it is less than nothing to you then i am your man you know the kellers oh very well francois keller is the comte de gondreville's son-in-law and the comte de gondreville and his son-in-law dine with you yesterday who der teufel told you dat cried the baron dat will be georges he is always a gossip peyrade smiled and the banker at once formed strange suspicions of his manservant the comte de gondreville is quite in a position to obtain me a place i covet at the prefecture of police within forty-eight hours the prefet will have noticed that such a place is to be created said peyrade in continuation ask for it for me get the comte de gondreville to interest himself in the matter with some degree of warmth and you will thus repay me for the service i am about to do you i ask your word only for if you fail me sooner or later you will curse the day you were born you have peyrade's word for that i give you my word of honour to do what is possible if i do no more for you than is possible it will not be enough well well i will act quite frankly frankly that is all i ask said peyrade and frankness is the only thing at all new that you and i can offer to each other frankly echoed the baron where shall i put you down at the corner of the pont louis the sixteenth to the pont de la chambre said the baron to the footman at the carriage door then i am to get that unknown person said the baron to himself as he drove home what a queer business thought peyrade going back on foot to the palais royal where he intended trying to multiply his ten thousand francs by three to make a little fortune for lydie here i am required to look into the private concerns of a very young man who has bewitched my little girl by a glance he is i suppose one of those men who have an eye for a woman said he to himself using an expression of a language of his own in which his observations or corentins were summed up in words that were anything rather than classical but for that very reason energetic and picturesque the baron de nucingen when he went in was an altered man he astonished his household and his wife by showing them a face full of life and colour so cheerful did he feel our shareholders had better look out for themselves said du tillet to rastignac 
they were all at tea in delphine de nucingen's boudoir having come in from the opera ja said the baron smiling i feel very much that i shall do some business then you have seen the fair being asked madame de nucingen no said he i have only hoped to see her do men ever love their wives so cried madame de nucingen feeling or affecting to feel a little jealous when you have got her you must ask us to sup with her said du tillet to the baron for i am very curious to study the creature who has made you so young as you are she is a chef d'offre of creation replied the old banker he will be swindled like a boy said rastignac in delphine's ear who he makes quite enough money to to give a little back i suppose said du tillet interrupting the baroness nucingen was walking up and down the room as if his legs had the fidgets now is your time to make him pay your fresh debts said rastignac in the baroness's ear at this very moment carlos was leaving the rue tebou full of hope he had been there to give some last advice to Europe, who was to play the principal part in the farce devised to take in the baron de nucingen he was accompanied as far as the boulevard by lucien who was not at all easy at finding this demon so perfectly disguised that even he had only recognized him by his voice where the devil did you find a handsomer woman than esther he asked his evil genius my boy there is no such thing to be found in paris such a complexion is not made in france i assure you i am still quite amazed venus calipige has not such a figure a man would lose his soul for her but where did she spring from she was the handsomest girl in london drunk with gin she killed her lover in a fit of jealousy the lover was a wretch of whom the london police are well quit and this woman was packed off to paris for a time to let the matter blow over the hussy was well brought up the daughter of a clergyman she speaks french as if it were her mother tongue she does not know and never will know why she is here she was told that if you took a fancy to her she might fleece you of millions but that you were as jealous as a tiger and she was told how esther lived but supposing nucingen should prefer her to esther ah it is out at last cried carlos you dread now lest what dismayed you yesterday should not take place after all be quite easy that fair and fair-haired girl has blue eyes she is the antipodes of the beautiful jewess and only such eyes as esther's could ever stir a man so rotten as nucingen what the devil you could not hide an ugly woman when this puppet has played her part i will send her off in safe custody to rome or to madrid where she will be the rage if we have her only for a short time said lucien i will go back to her go my boy amuse yourself you will be a day older to-morrow for my part i must wait for some one whom i have instructed to learn what is going on at the baron de nucingen's who his valet's mistress for after all we must keep ourselves informed at every moment of what is going on in the enemy's camp at midnight paccard esther's tall chasseur met carlos on the pont des arts the most favorable spot in all paris for saying a few words which no one must overhear all the time they talked the servant kept an eye on one side while his master looked out on the other 
the baron went to the prefecture of police this morning between four and five said the man and he boasted this evening that he should find the woman he saw in the bois de vincennes he had been promised it we are watched said carlos by whom they have already employed louchard the bailiff that would be child's play replied carlos we need fear nothing but the guardians of public safety the criminal police and so long as that is not set in motion we can go on that is not all what else our chums of the hulks i saw la Pouraille yesterday he has choked off a married couple and has bagged ten thousand five-franc pieces in gold he will be nabbed said jacques collin that is the rue boucher crime what is the order of the day said paccard with the respectful demeanour a marshal must have assumed when taking his orders from louis the eighteenth you must get out every evening at ten o'clock replied herrera make your way pretty briskly to the bois de vincennes the bois de meudon and de ville if any one should follow you let them do it be free of speech chatty open to a bribe talk about rubempre's jealousy and his mad passion for madame saying that he would not on any account have it known that he had a mistress of that kind enough must i have any weapons never exclaimed carlos vehemently a weapon of what use would that be to get us into a scrape do not under any circumstances use your hunting knife when you know that you can break the strongest man's legs by the trick i showed you when you can hold your own against three armed warders feeling quite sure that you can account for two of them before they have got out flint and steel what is there to be afraid of have not you your cane to be sure said the man paccard nicknamed the old guard old wide awake or the right man a man with legs of iron arms of steel italian whiskers hair like an artist's a beard like a sapper's and a face as colourless and immovable as contenson's kept his spirit to himself and rejoiced in a sort of drum-major appearance which disarmed suspicion a fugitive from poissy or melun has no such serious self-consciousness and belief in his own merit as giafar to the haroun el rashid of the hulks he served him with the friendly admiration which peyrade felt for corentin this huge fellow with a small body in proportion to his legs flat-chested and lean of limb stalked solemnly about on his two long pins whenever his right leg moved his right eye took in everything around him with the placid swiftness peculiar to thieves and spies the left eye followed the right eye's example wiry nimble ready for anything at any time but for a weakness of dutch courage paccard would have been perfect jacques collin used to say so completely was he endowed with the talents indispensable to a man at war with society but the master had succeeded in persuading his slave to drink only in the evening on going home at night paccard tippled the liquid gold poured into small glasses out of a pot-bellied stone jar from danzig we will make them open their eyes said paccard putting on his grand hat and feathers after bowing to carlos whom he called his confessor these were the events which had led three men so clever each in his way as jacques collin peyrade and corentin to a hand-to-hand -hand fight on the same ground each exerting his talents in a struggle for his own passions or interests it was one of those obscure but terrible conflicts on which are expended in marches and countermarches in strategy skill hatred and vexation 
the powers that might make a fine fortune men and means were kept absolutely secret by peyrade seconded in this business by his friend corentin a business they thought but a trifle and so as to them history is silent as it is on the true causes of many revolutions but this was the result five days after m de nucingen's interview with peyrade in the champs elysees a man of about fifty called in the morning stepping out of a handsome cab and flinging the reins to his servant he had the dead white complexion which a life in the world gives to diplomats was dressed in blue cloth and had a general air of fashion almost that of a minister of state he inquired of the servant who sat on a bench on the steps whether the baron de nucingen were at home and the man respectfully threw open the splendid plate-glass doors your name sir said the footman tell the baron that i have come from the avenue gabriel said corentin if anybody is with him be sure not to say so too loud or you will find yourself out of place a minute later the man came back and led corentin by the back passages to the baron's private room corentin and the banker exchanged impenetrable glances and both bowed politely monsieur le baron said corentin i come in the name of peyrade vergat said the baron fastening the bolts of both doors monsieur de rubempre's mistress lives in the rue taitbout in the apartment formerly occupied by mademoiselle de bellefoy monsieur de granville's ex-mistress the attorney-general that so near to me exclaimed the baron that is very strange i can quite understand your being crazy about that splendid creature it was a pleasure to me to look at her replied corentin lucien is so jealous of the girl that he never allows her to be seen and she loves him devotedly for in four years since she succeeded la belle foy in those rooms inheriting her furniture and her profession neither the neighbors nor the porter nor the other tenants in the house have ever set eyes on her my lady never stirs out but at night when she sets out the blinds of the carriage are pulled down and she is closely veiled lucien has other reasons besides jealousy for concealing this woman he is to be married to clotilde de grandlieu and he is at this moment madame de serizy's favorite fancy he naturally wishes to keep a hold on his fashionable mistress and on his promised bride so you are master of the position for lucien will sacrifice his pleasure to his interests and his vanity you are rich this is probably your last chance of happiness be liberal you can gain your end through her waiting-maid give the slut ten thousand francs she will hide you in her mistress's bedroom it must be quite worth that to you no figure of speech could describe the short precise tone of finality in which corentin spoke the baron could not fail to observe it and his face expressed his astonishment an expression he had long expunged from his impenetrable features i have also to ask you for five thousand francs for my friend peyrade who has dropped five of your thousand franc notes a tiresome accident corentin went on in a lordly tone of command peyrade knows his paris too well to spend money in advertising and he trusts entirely to you but this is not the most important point added corentin checking himself in such a way as to make the request for money seem quite a trifle if you do not want to end your days miserably get the place for peyrade that he asked you to procure for him and it is a thing you can easily do the chief of the general police must have had notice of the matter yesterday 
all that is needed is to get combreville to speak to the prefet of police very well just say to malin comte de gondreville that it is to oblige one of the men who relieved him of messieurs de simeuse and he will work it here then monsieur said the baron taking out five thousand franc notes and handing them to corentin the waiting maid is great friends with a tall chasseur named paccard living in the rue de provence over a carriage builders he goes out as a duke to persons who give themselves princely airs you can get at madame van bogseck's woman through paccard a brawny piemontese who has a liking for vermouth this information gracefully thrown in as a postscript was evidently the return for the five thousand francs the baron was trying to guess corentin's place in life for he quite understood that the man was rather a master of spies than a spy himself but corentin remained to him as mysterious as an inscription is to an archaeologist when three-quarters of the letters are missing what is that maid called he asked eugenie replied corentin who bowed and withdrew the baron in a transport of joy left his business for the day shut up his office and went up to his rooms in the happy frame of mind of a young man of twenty looking forward to his first meeting with his first mistress the baron took all the thousand franc notes out of his private cash-box a sum sufficient to make the whole village happy fifty-five thousand francs and stuffed them into the pocket of his coat but a millionaire's lavishness can only be compared with his eagerness for gain as soon as a whim or a passion is to be gratified money is dross to a croesus in fact he finds it harder to have whims than gold a keen pleasure is the rarest thing in these satiated lives full of the excitement that comes of great strokes of speculation in which these dried-up hearts have burned themselves out for instance one of the richest capitalists in paris one day met an extremely pretty little working girl her mother was with her but the girl had taken the arm of a young fellow in very doubtful finery with a very smart swagger the millionaire fell in love with the girl at first sight he followed her home he went in he heard all her story a record of alternations of dancing at mabille and days of starvation of play-going and hard work he took an interest in it and left five thousand franc notes under a five franc piece an act of generosity abused next day a famous upholsterer brachon came to take the damsel's orders furnished rooms that she had chosen and laid out twenty thousand francs she gave herself up to the wildest hopes dressed her mother to match and flattered herself she would find a place for her ex-lover in an insurance office she waited a day two days then a week two weeks she thought herself bound to be faithful she got into debt the capitalist called away to holland had forgotten the girl he never went once to the paradise where he had placed her and from which she fell as low as it is possible to fall even in paris nucingen did not gamble nucingen did not patronize the arts nucingen had no hobby thus he flung himself into his passion for esther with a headlong blindness Section 17 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. 
Esther Happy Chapter Seventeen After his breakfast, the Baron sent for Georges, his body servant, and desired him to go to the Rue Tebou and ask Mademoiselle Eugenie, Madame Van Bogseck's maid, to come to his office on a matter of importance you shall look out for her he added and make her walk up to my room and tell her i shall make her fortune georges had the greatest difficulty in persuading europe eugenie to come madame never lets me go out said she i might lose my place and so forth and georges sang her praises loudly to the baron who gave him ten louis if madame goes out without her this evening said georges to his master whose eyes glowed like carbuncles she will be here by ten o'clock goot you shall come to dress me at nine o'clock and do my hair i shall look so goot as possible i believe i shall really see that mistress or money is not money any more the baron spent an hour from noon till one in dyeing his hair and whiskers at nine in the evening having taken a bath before dinner he made a toilet worthy of a bridegroom and scented himself a perfect adonis madame de nucingen informed of this metamorphosis gave herself the treat of inspecting her husband good heavens cried she what a ridiculous figure do at least put on a black satin stock instead of that white neckcloth which makes your whiskers look so black besides it is so empire quite the old fogey you look like some superannuated parliamentary council and take off these diamond buttons they are worth a hundred thousand francs apiece that slut will ask you for them and you will not be able to refuse her and if a baggage is to have them i may as well wear them as earrings the unhappy banker struck by the wisdom of his wife's reflections obeyed reluctantly ridiculous ridiculous i have never told you that you shall be ridiculous when you dressed yourself so smart to see your little monsieur de rastignac i should hope that you never saw me make myself ridiculous am i the woman to make such blunders in the first syllable of my dress come turn about button your coat up to the neck all but the top two buttons as the duc de maufrigneuse does in short try to look young monsieur said georges here is mademoiselle eugenie adieu madame said the banker and he escorted his wife as far as her own rooms to make sure that she should not overhear their conference on his return he took europe by the hand and led her into his room with a sort of ironical respect well my child you are a happy creature for you are the maid of that most beautiful woman in the world and your fortune shall be made if you will talk to her for me and in mine interests i would not do such a thing for ten thousand francs exclaimed europe i would have you to know monsieur le baron that i am an honest girl oh yes i expect to pay dear for your honesty in business that is what we call curiosity and that is not everything europe went on if you should not take madame's fancy and that is on the cards she would be angry and i am done for and my place is worth a thousand francs a year the capital to make ein thousand franc is twenty thousand franc and if i shall give you dat you shall not lose nothing well to be sure if that is the tone you take about it my worthy old fellow said europe that is quite another story where is the money here replied the baron holding up the banknotes one at a time he noted the flash struck by each in turn from europe's eyes betraying the greed he had counted on that pays for my place but how about my principles my conscience said europe 
cocking her crafty little nose and giving the baron a serio-comic leer your conscience shall not be paid for so much as your place but i shall say five thousand franc more said he adding five thousand franc notes no no twenty thousand for my conscience and five thousand for my place if i lose it just what you please said he adding the five notes but to earn them you shall hide me in your lady's room by night then she shall be long if you swear never to tell who let you in i agree but i warn you of one thing madame is as strong as a turk she is madly in love with monsieur de rubempre and if you paid a million francs in banknotes she would never be unfaithful to him it is very silly but that is her way when she is in love she is worse than an honest woman i tell you when she goes out for a drive in the woods at night monsieur very seldom stays at home she is gone out this evening so i can hide you in my room if madame comes in alone i will fetch you you can wait in the drawing-room i will not lock the door into her room and then well the rest is your concern so be ready i shall pay you the twenty-five thousand francs in that drawing-room you give i give indeed said europe you are so confiding as all that on my word oh you will have your chance to fleece me yet we shall be friends well then be in the rue taitbout at midnight but bring thirty thousand francs about you a waiting woman's honesty like a hackney cab is much dearer after midnight it shall be more prudent if i give you a check on my bank no no said europe notes or the bargain is off so at one in the morning the baron de nucingen hidden in the garret where europe slept was suffering all the anxieties of a man who hopes to triumph his blood seemed to him to be tingling in his toe-nails and his head ready to burst like an overheated steam engine i had more than one hundred thousand crowns worth of enjoyment in my mind he said to du tillet when telling him the story he listened to every little noise in the street and at two in the morning he heard his mistress's carriage far away on the boulevard his heart beat vehemently under his silk waistcoat as the gate turned on its hinges he was about to behold the heavenly the glowing face of his esther the clatter of the carriage step and the slam of the door struck upon his heart he was more agitated in expectation of this supreme moment than he would have been if his fortune had been at stake ha ha cried he this is what i call to live it is too much to live i shall be incapable of everything madame is alone come down said europe looking in above all make no noise great elephant great elephant he repeated laughing and walking as if he trod on red-hot iron europe led the way carrying a candle here count them said the baron when he reached the drawing-room holding out the notes to europe europe took the thirty notes very gravely and left the room locking the banker in nucingen went straight to the bedroom where he found the handsome english woman is that you lucien said she nein mein beauty said nucingen but he said no more he stood speechless on seeing a woman the very antipodes to esther fair hair where he had seen black slenderness where he had admired a powerful frame a soft english evening where he had looked for the bright sun of arabia hey day where have you come from who are you what do you want cried the englishwoman pulling the bell which made no sound the bells they are in cotton wool but have not any fear 
i shall go they said he dat is dirty tousand franc i have thrown in de water are you dat mistress of monsieur lucien de rubempre rather my son said the lady who spoke french well but vat vas you she went on mimicking nucingen's accent ein man vat is very much took in replied he lamentably is a man took in then he finds a pretty woman asked she with a laugh permit me to send you to-morrow some jewels as a souvenir of de baron von nucingen don't know him said she laughing like a crazy creature but the jewels will be welcome my fat burglar friend you shall know him good night madame you are a tidbit for ein king but i am only a poor banker more than sixty year old and you have made me feel but power the woman i love half over me since your to fine beauty have not made me forget her well that is very pretty vat you say replied the englishwoman it is not so pretty vat she is dat i say it too you spoke of thirty thousand francs to whom did you give them to dat hussy your maid the englishwoman called europe who was not far off oh shrieked europe a man in madame's room and he is not monsieur how shocking did he give you thirty thousand francs to let him in no madame for we are not worth it the pair of us and europe set to screaming thief so determinedly that the banker made for the door in a fright and europe tripping him up rolled him down the stairs old wretch cried she you would tell tales to my mistress thief thief stop thief the enamoured baron in despair succeeded in getting unhurt to his carriage which he had left on the boulevard but he was now at his wit's end as to whom to apply to and pray madame did you think to get my earnings out of me said europe coming back like a fury to the lady's room i know nothing of french customs said the englishwoman but one word from me to-morrow to monsieur and you madame would find yourself in the streets retorted europe insolently that damn maid said the baron to georges who naturally asked his master if all had gone well have do me out of dirty thousand franc but it was my own fault my own great fault and so monsieur's dress was all wasted the deuce is in it i should advise you monsieur le baron not to have taken your tonic for nothing georges i shall be dying of despair i have cold i have ice on mein heart no more of esther mein good friend section eighteen of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary esther happy chapter eighteen two days after this scene which europe related far more amusingly than it can be written because she told it with much mimicry carlos and lucien were breakfasting tete-a-tete -tete. my dear boy neither the police nor anybody else must be allowed to poke a nose into our concerns said herrera in a low voice as he lighted his cigar from lucien's it would not agree with us i have hit on a plan daring but effectual to keep our baron and his agents quiet you must go to see madame de serizy and make yourself very agreeable to her tell her in the course of conversation that to oblige rastignac who has long been sick of madame de nucingen you have consented to play fence for him to conceal a mistress 
monsieur de nucingen desperately in love with this woman rastignac keeps hidden that will make her laugh has taken it into his head to set the police to keep an eye on you on you who are innocent of all his tricks and whose interest with the grandlieus may be seriously compromised then you must beg the countess to secure her husband's support for he is a minister of state to carry you to the prefecture of police when you have got there face to face with the prefet make your complaint but as a man of political consequence who will sooner or later be one of the motor powers of the huge machine of government you will speak of the police as a statesman should admiring everything the prefet included the very best machines make oil stains or splutter do not be angry till the right moment you have no sort of grudge against monsieur le prefet but persuade him to keep a sharp lookout on his people and pity him for having to blow them up the quieter and more gentlemanly you are the more terrible will the prefet be to his men then we shall be left in peace and we may send for esther back for she must be belling like the does in the forest the prefet at that time was a retired magistrate retired magistrates make far too young prefets partisans of the right riding the high horse on points of law they are not light-handed in arbitrary action such as critical circumstances often require cases in which the prefet should be as prompt as a fireman called to a conflagration so face to face with the vice-president of the council of state the prefet confessed to more faults than the police really has deplored its abuses and presently was able to recollect the visit paid to him by the baron de nucingen and his inquiries as to peyrade the prefet while promising to check the rash zeal of his agents thanked lucien for having come straight to him promised secrecy and affected to understand the intrigue a few fine speeches about personal liberty and the sacredness of home life were bandied between the prefet and the minister monsieur de serizy observing in conclusion that though the high interests of the kingdom sometimes necessitated illegal action in secret crime began when these state measures were applied to private cases next day just as peyrade was going to his beloved cafe david where he enjoyed watching the bourgeois eat as an artist watches flowers open a gendarme in private clothes spoke to him in the street i was going to fetch you said he in his ear i have orders to take you to the prefecture peyrade called a hackney cab and got in without saying a single word followed by the gendarme the prefet treated peyrade as though he were the lowest warder on the hulks walking to and fro in a side path of the garden of the prefecture which at that time was on the quai des orfèvres it is not without good reason monsieur that since eighteen thirty you have been kept out of office do not you know to what risk you expose us not to mention yourself the lecture ended in a thunderstroke the prefet sternly informed poor peyrade that not only would his yearly allowance be cut off but that he himself would be narrowly watched the old man took the shock with an air of perfect calm nothing can be more rigidly expressionless than a man struck by lightning peyrade had lost all his stake in the game he had counted on getting an appointment and he found himself bereft of everything but the alms bestowed by his friend corentin i have been the prefet of police myself i think you perfectly right said the old man quietly to the functionary who stood before him in his judicial majesty and who answered with a significant shrug 
but allow me without any attempt to justify myself to point out that you do not know me at all peyrade went on with a keen glance at the prefet your language is either too severe to a man who has been the head of the police in holland or not severe enough for a mere spy but monsieur le prefet peyrade added after a pause while the other kept silence bear in mind what i now have the honour to tell you i have no intention of interfering with your police nor of attempting to justify myself but you will presently discover that there is some one in this business who is being deceived at this moment it is your humble servant by and by you will say it was i and he bowed to the chief who sat passive to conceal his amazement peyrade returned home his legs and arms feeling broken and full of cold fury with the baron nobody but that burly banker could have betrayed a secret contained in the minds of contenson peyrade and corentin the old man accused the banker of wishing to avoid paying now that he had gained his end a single interview had been enough to enable him to read the astuteness of this most astute of bankers he tries to compound with every one even with us but i will be revenged thought the old fellow i have never asked a favor of corentin i will ask him now to help me to be revenged on that imbecile money-box curse the baron well you will know the stuff i am made of one fine morning when you find your daughter disgraced but does he love his daughter i wonder by the evening of the day when this catastrophe had upset the old man's hopes he had aged by ten years as he talked to his friend corentin he mingled his lamentations with tears wrung from him by the thought of the melancholy prospects he must bequeath to his daughter his idol his treasure his peace offering to god we will follow the matter up said corentin first of all we must be sure that it was the baron who peached were we wise in enlisting gondreville's support that old rascal owes us too much not to be anxious to swamp us indeed i am keeping an eye on his son-in-law keller a simpleton in politics and quite capable of meddling in some conspiracy to overthrow the elder branch to the advantage of the younger i shall know to-morrow what is going on at nucingen's whether he has seen his beloved and to whom we owe this sharp pull-up do not be out of heart in the first place the prefet will not hold his appointment much longer the times are big with revolution and revolutions make good fishing for us a peculiar whistle was just then heard in the street that is contenson said peyrade who put a light in the window and he has something to say that concerns me a minute later the faithful contenson appeared in the presence of the two gnomes of the police whom he revered as though they were two genii what is up asked corentin a new thing i was coming out of one thirteen where i lost everything when whom do i spy under the gallery georges the man has been dismissed by the baron who suspects him of treachery that is the effect of a smile i gave him said peyrade bah when i think of all the mischief i have known caused by smiles said corentin to say nothing of that caused by a whiplash said peyrade referring to the simeuse case in un tenable's affair but come contenson what is going on this is what is going on said contenson i made georges blab by getting him to treat me to an endless series of liqueurs of every colour i left him tipsy i must be as full as a still myself our baron has been to the rue taitbout crammed with pastilles du serail 
there he found the fair one you know of but a good joke the english beauty is not his fair unknown and he has spent thirty thousand francs to bribe the lady's maid a piece of folly that creature thinks itself a great man because it does mean things with great capital reverse the proposition and you have the problem of which a man of genius is the solution the baron came home in a pitiable condition next day georges to get his finger in the pie said to his master why monsieur le baron do you employ such blackguards if you would only trust to me i would find the unknown lady for your description of her is enough i shall turn paris upside down go ahead says the baron i shall reward you handsomely georges told me the whole story with the most absurd details but man is born to be rained upon next day the baron received an anonymous letter something to this effect monsieur de nucingen is dying of love for an unknown lady he has already spent a great deal utterly in vain if you will repair at midnight to the end of the neuilly bridge and get into the carriage behind which the chasseur he saw at vincennes will be standing allowing himself to be blindfolded he will see the woman he loves as his wealth may lead him to suspect the intentions of persons who proceed in such a fashion he may bring as an escort his faithful georges and there will be nobody in the carriage off the baron goes taking georges with him but telling him nothing they both submit to have their eyes bound up and their heads wrapped in veils the baron recognizes the man-servant two hours later the carriage going at the pace of louis the eighteenth god rest his soul he knew what was meant by the police he did pulled up in the middle of a wood the baron had the handkerchief off and saw in a carriage standing still his adored fair when with she vanished and the carriage at the same lively pace brought him back to the new year bridge where he found his own someone had slipped into georges's hand a note to this effect how many banknotes will the baron part with to be put into communication with his unknown fare georges handed this to his master and the baron never doubting that georges was in collusion with me or with you monsieur peyrade to drive a hard bargain turned him out of the house what a fool that banker is he ought not to have sent away georges before he had known the unknown then georges saw the woman said corentin yes replied contenson well cried peyrade and what is she like oh said contenson he said but one word a son of loveliness we are being tricked by some rascals who beat us at the game said peyrade those villains mean to sell their woman very dear to the baron ja mein herr said contenson and so when i heard you got slapped in the face at the prefecture i made georges blab i should like very much to know who it is that has stolen a march on me said peyrade we would measure our spurs we must play eavesdropper said contenson he is right said peyrade we must get into chinks to listen and wait we will study that side of the subject cried corentin for the present i am out of work you peyrade be a very good boy we must always obey monsieur le prefet monsieur de nucingen wants bleeding said contenson he has too many banknotes in his veins but it was lydie's marriage portion i looked for there said peyrade in a whisper to corentin now come along contenson let us be off and leave our daddy to bye-bye bye-bye monsieur said contenson to corentin on the doorstep what a queer piece of brokerage our good friend was planning 
<laughs> what marry a daughter with the price of <laughs> it would make a pretty little play and very moral too entitled a girl's dower you are highly organized animals indeed replied corentin what years you have certainly social nature arms all her species with the qualities needed for the duties she expects of them society is second nature that is a highly philosophical view to take cried contenson a professor would work it up into a system let us find out all we can replied corentin with a smile as he made his way down the street with the spy as to what goes on at m de nucingen's with regard to this girl the main facts never mind the details just watch to see if his chimneys are smoking said contenson such a man as the baron de nucingen cannot be happy incognito replied corentin and besides we for whom men are but cards ought never to be tricked by them by gad it would be the condemned jailbird amusing himself by cutting the executioner's throat you always have something droll to say replied corentin with a dim smile that faintly wrinkled his set white face this business was exceedingly important in itself apart from its consequences if it were not the baron who had betrayed peyrade who could have had any interest in seeing the prefet of police from corentin's point of view it seemed suspicious were there any traitors among his men and as he went to bed he wondered what peyrade too was considering who can have gone to complain to the prefet whom does the woman belong to and thus without knowing each other jacques collin peyrade and corentin were converging to a common point while the unhappy esther nucingen and lucien were inevitably entangled in the struggle which had already begun and of which the point of pride peculiar to police agents was making a war to the death thanks to europe's cleverness the more pressing half of the sixty thousand francs of debt owed by esther and lucien was paid off the creditors did not even lose confidence lucien and his evil genius could breathe for a moment like some pool they could start again along the edge of the precipice where the strong man was guiding the weak man to the gibbet or to fortune we are staking now said carlos to his puppet to win or lose Section 19 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy. Chapter 19. For some time, Lucien, by his terrible mentor's orders, had been very attentive to Madame de Serizy it was in fact indispensable that lucien should not be suspected of having kept a woman for his mistress and in the pleasure of being loved and the excitement of fashionable life he found a spurious power of forgetting he obeyed mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu by never seeing her excepting in the bois or the champs elysees on the day after esther was shut up in the park-keeper's house the being who was to her so enigmatic and terrible who weighed upon her soul came to desire her to sign three pieces of stamped paper made terrible by these fateful words on the first accepted payable for sixty thousand francs on the second accepted payable for a hundred and twenty thousand francs on the third accepted payable for a hundred and twenty thousand francs 
three hundred thousand francs in all by writing bon pour you simply promise to pay the word accepted constitutes a bill of exchange and makes you liable to imprisonment the word entails on the person who is so imprudent as to sign the risk of five years imprisonment a punishment which the police magistrate hardly ever inflicts and which is reserved at the assizes for confirmed rogues the law of imprisonment for debt is a relic of the days of barbarism which combines with its stupidity the rare merit of being useless inasmuch as it never catches swindlers the point said the spaniard to esther is to get lucien out of his difficulties we have debts to the tune of sixty thousand francs and with these three hundred thousand francs we may perhaps pull through having antedated the bills by six months carlos had had them drawn on esther by a man whom the county court had misunderstood and whose adventures in spite of the excitement they had caused were soon forgotten hidden lost in the uproar of the great symphony of july eighteen thirty this young fellow a most audacious adventurer the son of a lawyer's clerk of boulogne near paris was named georges marie d'estourny his father obliged by adverse circumstances to sell his connection died in eighteen twenty four leaving his son without the means of living after giving him a brilliant education the folly of the lower middle class at twenty-three the clever young law student had denied his paternity by printing on his cards georges d apostrophe estourny this card gave him an odor of aristocracy and now as a man of fashion he was so impudent as to set up a tilbury and a groom and haunt the clubs one line will account for this he gambled on the bourse with the money entrusted to him by the kept women of his acquaintance finally he fell into the hands of the police and was charged with playing at cards with too much luck he had accomplices youths whom he had corrupted his compulsory satellites accessory to his fashion and his credit compelled to fly he forgot to pay his differences on the bourse all paris the paris of the stock exchange and clubs was still shaken by this double stroke of swindling in the days of his splendor georges d'estourny a handsome youth and above all a jolly fellow as generous as a brigand chief had for a few months protected la torpille the false abbe based his calculations on esther's former intimacy with this famous scoundrel an incident peculiar to women of her class georges d'estourny whose ambition grew bolder with success had taken under his patronage a man who had come from the depths of the country to carry on a business in paris and whom the liberal party were anxious to indemnify for certain sentences endured with much courage in the struggle of the press with charles the tenth's government the persecution being relaxed however during the martignac administration the sieur cerizet had then been pardoned and he was henceforth known as the brave cerizet cerizet then being patronized for form's sake by the big wigs of the left founded a house which combined the business of a general agency with that of a bank and a commission agency it was one of those concerns which in business remind one of the servants who advertise in the papers as being able and willing to do everything cerizet was very glad to ally himself with georges d'estourny who gave him hints esther in virtue of the anecdote about nonon might be regarded as the faithful guardian of part of georges d'estourny's fortune an endorsement in the name of georges d'estourny 
made carlos herrera master of the money he had created this forgery was perfectly safe so long as mademoiselle esther or some one for her could or was bound to pay after making inquiries as to the house of cerizet carlos perceived that he had to do with one of those humble men who are bent on making a fortune but lawfully cerizet with whom d'estourny had really deposited his monies had in hand a considerable sum with which he was speculating for a rise on the bourse a state of affairs which allowed him to style himself a banker such things are done in paris a man may be despised but money never carlos went off to cerizet intending to work him after his manner for as it happened he was master of all this worthy's secrets a meet partner for d'estourny cerizet the brave lived in an entresol in the rue du gros chenet and carlos who had himself mysteriously announced as coming from georges d'estourny found the self-styled banker quite pale at the name the abbe saw in this humble private room a little man with thin light hair and recognized him at once from lucien's description as the judas who had ruined david sechard can we talk here without risk of being overheard said the spaniard now metamorphosed into a red-haired englishman with blue spectacles as clean and prim as a puritan going to meeting why monsieur said cerizet who are you mr william barker a creditor of monsieur d'estourny's and i can prove to you the necessity for keeping your doors closed if you wish it we know monsieur all about your connections with the petit clos the cointets and the sechards of angouleme on hearing these words cerizet rushed to the door and shut it flew to another leading into a bedroom and bolted it then he said to the stranger speak lower monsieur and he studied the sham englishman as he asked him what do you want with me dear me said william barker every one for himself in this world you had the money of that rascal d'estourny be quite easy i have not come to ask for it but that scoundrel who deserves hanging between you and me gave me these bills saying that there might be some chance of recovering the money and as i do not choose to prosecute in my own name he told me you would not refuse to back them cerizet looked at the bills but he is no longer at frankfort said he i know it replied barker but he may still have been there at the date of those bills i will not take the responsibility said cerizet i do not ask such a sacrifice of you replied barker you may be instructed to receive them endorse them and i will undertake to recover the money i am surprised that d'estourny should show so little confidence in me said cerizet in his position replied barker you can hardly blame him for having put his eggs in different baskets can you believe the little broker began as he handed back to the englishman the bills of exchange formally accepted i believe that you will take good care of his money said barker i am sure of it it is already on the green table of the bourse my fortune depends on your appearing to lose it said barker sir cried cerizet look here my dear monsieur cerizet said barker coolly interrupting him you will do me a service by facilitating this payment be so good as to write me a letter in which you tell me that you are sending me these bills receipted on d'estourny's account and that the collecting officer is to regard the holder of the letter as the possessor of the three bills 
will you give me your name no names replied the english capitalist put the bearer of this letter and these bills you will be handsomely repaid for obliging me how said cerizet in one word you mean to stay in france do not you yes monsieur well georges d'estourny will never re-enter the country pray why there are five persons at least to my knowledge who would murder him and he knows it then no wonder he is asking me for money enough to start him trading to the indies cried cerizet and unfortunately he has compelled me to risk everything in state speculation we already owe heavy differences to the house of dutier i live from hand to mouth withdraw your stakes oh if only i had known this sooner exclaimed cerizet i have missed my chance one last word said barker keep your own counsel you are capable of that but you must be faithful too which is perhaps less certain we shall meet again and i will help you to make a fortune having tossed this sordid soul a crumb of hope that would secure silence for some time to come carlos still disguised as barker betook himself to a bailiff whom he could depend on and instructed him to get the bills brought home to esther they will be paid all right said he to the officer it is an affair of honour only we want to do the thing regularly barker got a solicitor to represent esther in court so that judgment might be given in presence of both parties the collecting officer who was begged to act with civility took with him all the warrants for procedure and came in person to seize the furniture in the rue tebou where he was received by europe her personal liability once proved esther was ostensibly liable beyond dispute for three hundred and more thousand francs of debts in all this carlos displayed no great powers of invention the farce of false debts is often played in paris there are many sub gobsecs and sub gigonets who for a percentage will lend themselves to this subterfuge and regard the infamous trick as a jest in france everything even a crime is done with a laugh by this means refractory parents are made to pay or rich mistresses who might drive a hard bargain but who face to face with flagrant necessity or some impending dishonour pay up if with a bad grace maxime de troyes had often used such means borrowed from the comedies of the old stage carlos herrera who wanted to save the honour of his gown as well as lucien's had worked the spell by a forgery not dangerous for him but now so frequently practised that justice is beginning to object there is it is said a bourse for falsified bills near the palais Section twenty of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Esther Happy. Chapter twenty. Before entering on the question of the hundred thousand crowns that were to keep the door of the bedroom, Carlos determined first to extract a hundred thousand more from Monsieur de Nucingen and this was the way by his orders asie got herself up for the baron's benefit as an old woman fully informed as to the unknown beauty's affairs hitherto novelists of manners have placed on the stage a great many usurers but the female money-lender has been overlooked the madame la ressource of the present day 
a very singular figure euphemistically spoken of as a wardrobe purchaser a part that the ferocious asie could play for she had two old clothes shops managed by women she could trust one in the temple and the other in the rue neuve saint marc you must get into the skin of madame de saint esteve said he herrera wished to see as he dressed the go-between arrived in a dress of flowered damask made of the curtains of some dismantled boudoir and one of those shawls of indian design out of date worn and valueless which end their career on the backs of these women she had a collar of magnificent lace though torn and a terrible bonnet but her shoes were of fine kid in which the flesh of her fat feet made a roll of black lace stocking and my waist buckle she exclaimed displaying a piece of suspicious-looking finery prominent on her cook's stomach there's style for you and my front oh ma'am nourrisson has turned me out quite spiff be as sweet as honey at first said carlos be almost timid as suspicious as a cat and above all make the baron ashamed of having employed the police without betraying that you quake before the constable finally make your customer understand in more or less plain terms that you defy all the police in the world to discover his jewel take care to destroy your traces when the baron gives you a right to tap him on the stomach and call him a pot-bellied old rip you may be as insolent as you please and make him trot like a footman nucingen threatened by asie with never seeing her again if he attempted the smallest espionage met the woman on his way to the bourse in secret in a wretched entresol in the rue neuve saint marc how often and with what rapture have amorous millionaires trodden these squalid paths the pavements of paris know madame de saint esteve by tossing the baron from hope to despair by turns brought him to the point when he insisted on being informed of all that related to the unknown beauty at any cost meanwhile the law was put in force and with such effect that the bailiffs finding no resistance from esther put in an execution on her effects without losing a day lucien guided by his adviser paid the recluse at saint germain five or six visits the merciless author of all these machinations thought this necessary to save esther from pining to death for her beauty was now their capital when the time came for them to quit the park-keeper's lodge he took lucien and the poor girl to a place on the road whence they could see paris where no one could overhear them they all three sat down in the rising sun on the trunk of a felled poplar looking over one of the finest prospects in the world embracing the course of the seine with montmartre paris and saint denis my children said carlos your dream is over you little one will never see lucien again or if you should you must have known him only for a few days five years ago death has come upon me then said she without shedding a tear well you have been ill these five years said herrera imagine yourself to be consumptive and die without boring us with your lamentations but you will see you can still live and very comfortably too leave us lucien go and gather sonnets said he pointing to a field a little way off lucien cast a look of humble entreaty at esther one of the looks peculiar to such men weak and greedy with tender hearts and cowardly spirits esther answered with a bow of her head which said 
i will hear the executioner that i may know how to lay my head under the axe and i shall have courage enough to die decently the gesture was so gracious but so full of dreadful meaning that the poet wept esther flew to him clasped him in her arms drank away the tears and said be quite easy one of those speeches that are spoken with the manner the look the tones of delirium carlos then explained to her quite clearly without attenuation often with horrible plainness of speech the critical position in which lucien found himself his connection with the hotel grandlieu his splendid prospects if he should succeed and finally how necessary it was that esther should sacrifice herself to secure him this triumphant future what must i do cried she with the eagerness of a fanatic obey me blindly said carlos and what have you to complain of it rests with you to achieve a happy lot you may be what tullia is what your old friends florine mariette and la val noble are the mistress of a rich man whom you need not love when once our business is settled your lover is rich enough to make you happy happy said she raising her eyes to heaven you have lived in paradise for four years said he can you not live on such memories i will obey you said she wiping a tear from the corner of her eye for the rest do not worry yourself you have said it my love is a mortal disease that is not enough said carlos you must preserve your looks at a little past two and twenty you are in the prime of your beauty thanks to your past happiness and above all be the torpille again be roguish extravagant cunning merciless to the millionaire i put in your power listen to me that man is a robber on a grand scale he has been ruthless to many persons he has grown fat on the fortunes of the widow and the orphan you will avenge them asie is coming to fetch you in a hackney coach and you will be in paris this evening if you allow any one to suspect your connection with lucien you may as well blow his brains out at once you will be asked where you have been for so long you must say that you have been travelling with a desperately jealous englishman you used to have wit enough to humbug people find such wit again now have you ever seen a gorgeous kite the giant butterfly of childhood twinkling with gilding and soaring to the sky the children forget the string that holds it some passer-by cuts it the gaudy toy turns head over heels as the boys say and falls with terrific rapidity Section twenty one of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter one. For a whole week, Nussingen went almost every day to the shop in the Rue Neuf Saint Marc to bargain for the woman he was in love with here sometimes under the name of saint esteve sometimes under that of her tool madame nourrisson asie sat enthroned among beautiful clothes in that hideous condition when they have ceased to be dresses and are not yet rags the setting was in harmony with the appearance assumed by the woman for these shops are among the most hideous characteristics of paris you find there the garments tossed aside by the skinny hand of death you hear as it were 
the gasping of consumption under a shawl or you detect the agonies of beggary under a gown spangled with gold the horrible struggle between luxury and starvation is written on filmy laces you may picture the countenance of a queen under a plumed turban placed in an attitude that recalls and almost reproduces the absent features it is all hideous amid prettiness juvenal's lash in the hands of the appraiser scatters the shabby muffs the ragged furs of courtesans at bay there is a dunghill of flowers among which here and there we find a bright rose plucked but yesterday and worn for a day and on this an old hag is always to be seen crouching first cousin to usury the skinflint bargainer bald and toothless and ever ready to sell the contents so well is she used to sell the covering the gown without the woman or the woman without the gown here asie was in her element like the warder among convicts like a vulture red-beaked amid corpses more terrible than the savage horrors that made the passer-by shudder in astonishment sometimes at seeing one of their youngest and sweetest reminiscences hung up in a dirty shop window behind which a saint esteve sits and grins from vexation to vexation a thousand francs at a time the banker had gone so far as to offer sixty thousand francs to madame de saint esteve who still refused to help him with a grimace that would have outdone any monkey after a disturbed night after confessing to himself that esther completely upset his ideas after realizing some unexpected turns of fortune on the bourse he came to her one day intending to give the hundred thousand francs on which as he insisted but he was determined to have plenty of information for the money well have you made up your mind old higgler said as he clapping him on the shoulder the most dishonouring familiarity is the first tax these women levy on the frantic passions or griefs that are confided to them they never rise to the level of their clients they make them squat beside them on their mud heap as he it will be seen obeyed her master admirably need must said nucingen and you have the best of the bargain said as he women have been sold much dearer than this one to you relatively speaking there are women and women de marsay paid sixty thousand francs for coralie who is dead now the woman you want cost a hundred thousand francs when new but to you you old goat it is a matter of agreement but where is she ah you shall see i am like you a gift for a gift oh my good man your adored one has been extravagant these girls know no moderation your princess is at this moment what we call a fly by night a fly come come don't play the simpleton luchard is at her heels and i i have lent her fifty thousand francs twenty-five say cried the banker well of course twenty-five for fifty that is only natural replied asie to do the woman justice she is honesty itself she had nothing left but herself and says she to me my good madame saint esteve the bailiffs are after me no one can help me but you give me twenty thousand francs i will pledge my heart to you oh she has a sweet heart no one but me knows where it lies any folly on my part and i should lose my twenty thousand francs formerly she lived in the rue Tebou. before leaving her furniture was seized for costs those rascally bailiffs you know them you who are one of the great men on the bourse well before leaving she is no fool she let her rooms for two months 
to an english woman a splendid creature who had a little thing a me rubempre for a lover and he was so jealous that he only let her go out at night but as the furniture is to be seized the englishwoman has cut her stick all the more because she cost too much for a little whippersnapper like lucien you cry up de goots said nucingen naturally said asie i lend to the beauties and it pays for you get two commissions for one job asie was amusing herself by caricaturing the manners of a class of women who are even greedier but more wheedling and mealy-mouthed than the malay woman and who put a gloss of the best motives on the trade they ply as he affected to have lost all her illusions five lovers and some children and to have submitted to be robbed by everybody in spite of her experience from time to time she exhibited some pawn tickets to prove how much bad luck there was in her line of business she represented herself as pinched and in debt and to crown all she was so undisguisedly hideous that the baron at last believed her to be all she said she was well then i shall pay the hundred thousand and where shall i see her said he with the air of a man who has made up his mind to any sacrifice my fat friend you shall come this evening in your carriage of course opposite the gymnase it is on the way said asie stop at the corner of the rue saint barbe i will be on the lookout and we will go and find my mortgaged beauty with the black hair oh she has splendid hair has my mortgage if she pulls out her comb esther is covered as if it were a pall but though you are knowing in arithmetic you strike me as a muff in other matters and i advise you to hide the girl safely for if she is found she will be clapped into sainte pelagie the very next day and they are looking for her shall it not be possible to get hold of the bills said the incorrigible bill-broker the bailiffs have got them but it is impossible the girl has had a passion and has spent some money left in her hands which she is now called upon to pay by the poker a queer thing is a heart of two and twenty fairgoot fairgoot i shall arrange all that said nucingen assuming a cunning look it is quite settled that i shall protect her well old noodle it is your business to make her fall in love with you and you certainly have ample means to buy sham love as good as the real article i will place your princess in your keeping she is bound to stick to you and after that i don't care but she is accustomed to luxury and the greatest consideration i tell you my boy she is quite the lady if not should i have given her twenty thousand francs very good it is a bargain till this evening the baron repeated the bridal toilet he had already once achieved but this time being certain of success he took a double dose of pillules at nine o'clock he found the dreadful woman at the appointed spot and took her into his carriage where to said the baron where echoed asie rue de la perle in the marais an address for the nonce for your pearl is in the mud but you will wash her clean having reached the spot the false madame de saint esteve said to nucingen with a hideous smile we must go a short way on foot i am not such a fool as to have given you the right address you think of everything said the baron it is my business said she as he led nucingen to the rue barbette where in furnished lodgings kept by an upholsterer he was led up to the fourth floor on finding esther in a squalid room dressed as a workwoman and employed on some embroidery 
the millionaire turned pale at the end of a quarter of an hour while asie affected to talk in whispers to esther the young old man could hardly speak montemiselle said he at length to the unhappy girl will you be so good as to let me be your protector why i cannot help myself monsieur replied esther letting fall two large tears do not weep i shall make you the happiest of women only permit that i shall love you you shall see well well child the gentleman is reasonable said asie he knows that he is more than sixty and he will be very kind to you you see my beauty i have found you quite a father i had to say so as he whispered to the banker who was not best pleased you cannot catch swallows by firing a pistol at them come here she went on leading nucingen into the adjoining room you remember our bargain my angel nucingen took out his pocket-book and counted out the hundred thousand francs which carlos hidden in a cupboard was impatiently waiting for and which the cook handed over to him here are the hundred thousand francs our man stakes on asie now we must make him lay on europe said carlos to his confidant when they were on the landing and he vanished after giving his instruction to the malay who went back into the room she found esther weeping bitterly the poor girl like a criminal condemned to death had woven a romance of hope and the fatal hour had told my dear children said asie where do you mean to go for the baron de nucingen esther looked at the great banker with a start of surprise that was admirably acted ja mein kind i am dat baron von nucingen the baron de nucingen must not cannot remain in such a room as this as he went on listen to me your former maid eugenie eugenie from the rue Tebou? cried the baron just so the woman placed in possession of the furniture replied asie and who let the apartment to that handsome englishwoman ha ah, i understand said the baron madame's former waiting-maid as he went on respectfully alluding to esther will receive you very comfortably this evening and the commercial police will never think of looking for her in her old rooms which she left three months ago fear straight fear straight cried the baron and besides i know these commercial police and i know what sorts shall make them disappear you will find eugenie a sharp customer said asie i found her for madame ha ah, i know her cried the millionaire laughing she have fleeced me out of dirty thousand franc esther shuddered with horror in a way that would have led a man of any feeling to trust her with his fortune oh that was mine own fault the baron said i was seeking for you and he related the incident that had arisen out of the letting of esther's rooms to the englishwoman there now you see madame eugenie never told you all that the sly thing said asie still madame is used to the hussy she added to the baron keep her on all the same she drew nucingen aside and said if you give eugenie five hundred francs a month which will fill up her stocking finely you can know everything that madame does make her the lady's maid eugenie will be all the more devoted to you since she has already done you nothing attaches a woman to a man more than the fact that she has once fleeced him but keep a tight rein on eugenie she will do any earthly thing for money she is a dreadful creature and what of you i said asie i make both ends meet nucingen the astute financier had a bandage over his eyes he allowed himself to be led like a child 
the sight of that spotless and adorable esther wiping her eyes and pricking in the stitches of her embroidery as demurely as an innocent girl revived in the amorous old man the sensations he had experienced in the forest of vincennes he would have given her the key of his safe he felt so young his heart was so overflowing with adoration he only waited till asie should be gone to throw himself at the feet of this raphael's madonna this sudden blossoming of youth in the heart of a stockbroker of an old man is one of the social phenomena which must be left to physiology to account for crushed under the burden of business stifled under endless calculations and the incessant anxieties of million hunting young emotions revive with their sublime illusions sprout and flower like a forgotten cause or a forgotten seed whose effects whose gorgeous bloom are the sport of chance brought out by a late and sudden gleam of sunshine the baron a clerk by the time he was twelve years old in the ancient house of aldreger at strasbourg had never set foot in the world of sentiment so there he stood in front of his idol hearing in his brain a thousand modes of speech while none came to his lips till at length he acted on the brutal promptings of desire that betrayed a man of sixty-six will you come to rue Tebou? said he wherever you please monsieur said esther rising wherever i please he echoed in rapture you are an angel from the sky and i love you more as if i was a little man while i have gray hairs you had better say white for they are too fine a black to be only gray said asie get out foul dealer in human flesh you have got your monies do not slobber no more on this flower of love cried the banker indemnifying himself by this violent abuse for all the insolence he had submitted to you old rip i will pay you out for that speech said asie threatening the banker with a gesture worthy of the al at which the baron merely shrugged his shoulders between the lip of the pot and that of the guzzler there is often a viper and you will find me there she went on furious at nucingen's contempt millionaires whose money is guarded by the bank of france whose mansions are guarded by a squad of footmen whose person in the streets is safe behind the rampart of a coach with swift english horses fear no ill so the baron looked calmly at asie as a man who had just given her a hundred thousand francs this dignity had its effect asie beat a retreat growling down the stairs in highly revolutionary language she spoke of the guillotine what have you said to her asked the madonna a la broderie for she is a good soul she have sold you she have robbed you when we are beggared said she in a tone to rend the heart of a diplomat who has ever any money or consideration for us poor little thing said nucingen do not stop here a moment longer the baron offered her his arm he led her away just as she was and put her into his carriage with more respect perhaps than he would have shown to the handsome duchesse de montfrigneuse you shall have a fine carriage the prettiest carriage in paris said nucingen as they drove along everything that luxury shall supply shall be for you not any queen shall be more rich than what you shall be you shall be respected like a chairman bout i shall have you to be free do not weep listen to me i love you really truly with the purest love every tear of yours breaks my heart can one truly love a woman one has bought said the poor girl in the sweetest tones joseph was sold by his brothers for that he was so comely
Section twenty two of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter two. On arriving at the Rue Tebou, Esther could not return to the scene of her happiness without some pain. She remained sitting on a couch, motionless drying away her tears one by one and never hearing a word of the crazy speeches poured out by the banker he fell at her feet and she let him kneel without saying a word to him allowing him to take her hands as he would and never thinking of the sex of the creature who was rubbing her feet to warm them for nusingen found that they were cold this scene of scalding tears shed on the baron's head and of ice-cold feet that he tried to warm lasted from midnight till two in the morning eugenie cried the baron at last to europe persuade your missus that she shall go to bed no cried esther starting to her feet like a scared horse never in this house look here monsieur i know madame she is as gentle and kind as a lamb said europe to the baron only you must not rub her the wrong way you must get at her sideways she had been so miserable here you see how worn the furniture is let her go her own way furnish some pretty little house for her very nicely perhaps when she sees everything new about her she will feel a stranger there and think you better looking than you are and be angelically sweet oh madame has not her match and you may boast of having done a very good stroke of business a good heart genteel manners a fine instep and a skin a complexion ah and witty enough to make a condemned wretch laugh and madame can feel an attachment and then how she can dress well if it is costly still as they say you get your money's worth here all the gowns were seized everything she has is three months old but madame is so kind you see that i love her and she is my mistress but in all justice such a woman as she is in the midst of furniture that has been seized and for whom for a young scamp who has ruined her poor little thing she is not at all herself esther esther go to bed my angel if it is me vat frighten you i shall stay here on this sofa cried the baron fired by the purest devotion as he saw that esther was still weeping well then said esther taking the lynx's hand and kissing it with an impulse of gratitude which brought something very like a tear to his eye i shall be grateful to you and she fled into her room and locked the door there is something very strange in all that thought nucingen excited by his pillules what shall they say at home he got up and looked out of the window my carriage still is there it shall soon be daylight he walked up and down the room fat montame de nucingen should laugh at me when she should know how i have spent this night he applied his ear to the bedroom door thinking himself rather too much of a simpleton esther no reply mein gott and she is still weeping said he to himself as he stretched himself on the sofa about ten minutes after sunrise the baron de nucingen who was sleeping the uneasy slumbers that are snatched by compulsion in an awkward position on a couch was aroused with a start by europe from one of those dreams that visit us in such moments and of which the swift complications are a phenomenon inexplicable by medical physiology oh god help us madame she shrieked madame the soldiers gendarmes bailiffs they have come to take us at the moment when esther opened her door and appeared hurriedly wrapped in her dressing-gown her bare feet in slippers her hair in disorder lovely enough to bring the angel raphael to perdition the drawing-room door vomited into the room a gutter of human mire that came on on ten feet towards the beautiful girl 
who stood like an angel in some flemish church picture one man came foremost contenson the horrible contenson laid his hand on esther's dewy shoulder you are mademoiselle van he began europe by a backhanded slap on contenson's cheek sent him sprawling to measure his length on the carpet and with all the more effect because at the same time she caught his leg with the sharp kick known to those who practice the art as a coup de savate hands off cried she no one shall touch my mistress she has broken my leg yelled contenson picking himself up i will have damages from the group of bombelis looking like what they were all standing with their horrible hats on their yet more horrible heads with mahogany-coloured faces and bleared eyes damaged noses and hideous mouths louchard now stepped forth more decently dressed than his men but keeping his hat on his expression at once smooth-faced and smiling mademoiselle i arrest you said he to esther as for you my girl he added to europe any resistance will be punished and perfectly useless the noise of muskets let down with a thud of their stalks on the floor of the dining-room showing that the invaders had soldiers to back them gave emphasis to this speech and what am i arrested for said esther what about our little debts said louchard to be sure cried esther give me leave to dress but unfortunately mademoiselle i am obliged to make sure that you have no way of getting out of your room said louchard all this passed so quickly that the baron had not yet had time to intervene well and am i still a foul dealer in human flesh baron de nucingen cried the hideous asie forcing her way past the sheriff's officers to the couch where she pretended to have just discovered the banker contemptible wretch exclaimed nucingen drawing himself up in financial majesty he placed himself between esther and louchard who took off his hat as contenson cried out monsieur le baron de nucingen at a signal from louchard the bailiffs vanished from the room respectfully taking their hats off contenson alone was left do you propose to pay monsieur le baron asked he hat in hand i shall pay said the banker but i must know what this is all about three hundred and twelve thousand francs and some centimes costs paid but the charges for the arrest not included three hundred thousand francs cried the baron that is a very expensive vaking for a man that has passed the night on a sofa he added in europe's ear is that man really the baron de nucingen asked europe to louchard giving weight to the doubt by a gesture which mademoiselle dupont the low comedy servant of the francais might have envied yes mademoiselle said louchard yes replied contenson i shall be answerable said the baron piqued in his honour by europe's doubt you shall allow me to say un vert to her esther and her elderly lover retired to the bedroom louchard finding it necessary to apply his ear to the keyhole i love you more as my life esther but why give to your creditors monies which shall be so much better in your pocket go into prison i shall undertake to buy up those hundred thousand crowns for ein hundred thousand francs and so you shall have two hundred thousand francs for you that scheme is perfectly useless cried louchard through the door the creditor is not in love with mademoiselle not he you understand and he means to have more than all now he knows that you are in love with her you damn sneak cried nucingen opening the door and dragging louchard into the bedroom you know not that what you talk about i shall give you yourself twenty per cent if you make the job 
impossible monsieur le baron what monsieur you could have the heart to let my mistress go to prison said europe intervening but take my wages my savings take them madame i have forty thousand francs ah my good girl i did not really know you cried esther clasping europe in her arms europe proceeded to melt into tears i shall pay said the baron piteously as he drew out a pocket-book from which he took one of the little printed forms which the bank of france issues to bankers on which they have only to write a sum in figures and in words to make them available as checks to bearer it is not worth the trouble monsieur le baron said louchard i have instructions not to accept payment in anything but coin of the realm gold or silver as it is you i will take bank-notes de teufel cried the baron well show me your papers contenson handed him three packets covered with blue paper which the baron took looking at the man and adding in an undertone it should have been a better day's work for you when you had give me notice why how should i know you were here monsieur le baron replied the spy heedless whether louchard heard him you lost my services by withdrawing your confidence you are done added this philosopher shrugging his shoulders quite true said the baron ah my child he exclaimed seeing the bills of exchange and turning to esther you are the victim of a thorough scoundrel ein highway thief alas yes said poor esther but he loved me truly then i should have known i should have made you to protest you are off your head monsieur le baron said louchard there is a third endorsement yes there is a third endorsement cerizet a man of the opposition will you write an order on your cashier monsieur le baron said louchard i will send contenson to him and dismiss my men it is getting late and everybody will know that go then contenson said nucingen my cashier lives at the corner of rue des Matourins and rue de la Cate. here is ein vote for that he shall go to dutier or to de keller's in case we shall not have a hundred thousand franc for our cash shall be at the bank get dressed my angel he said to esther you are at liberty an old woman's he went on looking at asie are more dangerous as young woman's i will go and give the creditor a good laugh said asie and he will give me something for a treat to-day we bear no malice monsieur le baron added saint esteve with a horrible courtesy louchard took the bills out of the baron's hands and remained alone with him in the drawing-room whither half an hour later the cashier came followed by contenson esther then reappeared in a bewitching though improvised costume when the money had been counted by louchard the baron wished to examine the bills but esther snatched them with a cat-like grab and carried them away to her desk what will you give the rabble said contenson to nucingen you have not shown much consideration said the baron and what about my leg cried contenson louchard you shall give ein hundred francs to contenson out of the change of the thousand franc note the lady is a beauty said the cashier to the baron as they left the rue Tebu, but she is costing you ver dear monsieur le baron keep my secret said the baron who had said the same to contenson and louchard louchard went away with contenson but on the boulevard asie who was looking out for him stopped louchard the bailiff and the creditor are there in a cab said she they are thirsty and there is money going while louchard counted out the cash contenson studied the customers he recognized carlos by his eyes and traced the form of his forehead under the wig the wig he shrewdly regarded as suspicious 
he took the number of the cab while seeming quite indifferent to what was going on asie and europe puzzled him beyond measure he thought that the baron was the victim of excessively clever sharpers all the more so because louchard when securing his services had been singularly close and besides the twist of europe's foot had not struck his shin only a trick like that is learned at saint lazare he had reflected as he got up carlos dismissed the bailiff paying him liberally and as he did so said to the driver of the cab to the perron palais royal the rascal thought contenson as he heard the order there is something up carlos drove to the palais royal at a pace which precluded all fear of pursuit he made his way in his own fashion through the arcades took another cab on the place du chateau d'eau and bid the man go to the passage de l'opera the end of the rue pinon a quarter of an hour later he was in the rue Taitbout. on seeing him esther said here are the fatal papers carlos took the bills examined them and then burned them in the kitchen fire we have done the trick he said showing her three hundred and ten thousand francs in a roll which he took out of the pocket of his coat this and the hundred thousand francs squeezed out by asie set us free to act oh god oh god cried poor esther but you idiot said the ferocious swindler you have only to be ostensibly nucingen's mistress and you can always see lucien he is nucingen's friend i do not forbid your being madly in love with him esther saw a glimmer of light in her darkened life she breathed once more europe my girl said carlos leading the creature into a corner of the boudoir where no one could overhear a word europe i am pleased with you europe held up her head and looked at this man with an expression which so completely changed her faded features that asie witnessing the interview as she watched her from the door wondered whether the interest by which carlos held europe might not perhaps be even stronger than that by which she herself was bound to him that is not all my child four hundred thousand francs are a mere nothing to me Pacard will give you an account for some plate amounting to thirty thousand francs on which money has been paid on account but our goldsmith bidden has paid money for us our furniture seized by him will no doubt be advertised to-morrow go and see bidden he lives in the rue de l'arbre sec he will give you montepiete tickets for ten thousand francs you understand esther ordered the plate she had not paid for it and she put it up the spout she will be in danger of a little summons for swindling so we must pay the goldsmith the thirty thousand francs and pay up ten thousand francs to the mont de piete to get the plate back forty three thousand francs in all including the costs the silver is very much alloyed the baron will give her a new service and we shall bone a few thousand francs out of that you owe what two years account with the dressmaker put it at six thousand francs replied europe well if madame auguste wants to be paid and keep our custom tell her to make out a bill for thirty thousand francs over four years make a similar arrangement with the milliner the jeweller samuel friche the jew in the rue saint avois will lend you some pawn tickets we must owe him twenty-five thousand francs and we must want six thousand for jewels pledged at the mont de piete we will return the trinkets to the jeweller half the stones will be imitation but the baron will not examine them in short you will make him fork out another hundred and fifty thousand francs to add to our nest eggs within a week madame might give me a little help said europe tell her so for she sits there mum chance and obliges me to find more inventions than three authors for one piece 
if esther turns prudish just let me know said carlos nucingen must give her a carriage and horses she will have to choose and buy everything herself go to the horse-dealer and the coachmaker who are employed by the job-master where paccard finds work we shall get handsome horses very dear which will go lame within a month and we shall have to change them we might get six thousand francs out of a perfumer's bill said europe oh said he shaking his head we must go gently nucingen has only got his arm into the press we must have his head besides all this i must get five hundred thousand francs you can get them replied europe madame will soften towards the fat fool for about six hundred thousand and insist on four hundred thousand more to love him truly listen to me my child said carlos the day when i get the last hundred thousand francs there shall be twenty thousand for you what good will they do me said europe letting her arms drop like a woman to whom life seems impossible you could go back to valenciennes buy a good business and set up as an honest woman if you chose there are many tastes in human nature paccard thinks of settling sometimes he has no encumbrances on his hands and not much on his conscience you might suit each other replied carlos go back to valenciennes what are you thinking of monsieur cried europe in alarm Europe, who was born at Valenciennes, the child of very poor parents, had been sent at seven years of age to a spinning factory, where the demands of modern industry had impaired her physical strength, just as vice had untimely depraved her. Corrupted at the age of twelve, and a mother at thirteen, she found herself bound to the most degraded of human creatures on the occasion of a murder case she had been called as a witness before the court haunted at sixteen by a remnant of rectitude and the terror inspired by the law her evidence led to the prisoner being sentenced to twenty years of hard labor the convict one of those men who have been in the hands of justice more than once and whose temper is apt at terrible revenge had said to the girl in open court in ten years as sure as you live prudence europe's name was prudence servien i will return to be the death of you if i am scragged for it the president of the court tried to reassure the girl by promising her the protection and the care of the law but the poor child was so terror-stricken that she fell ill and was in hospital nearly a year justice is an abstract being represented by a collection of individuals who are incessantly changing whose good intentions and memories are like themselves liable to many vicissitudes courts and tribunals can do nothing to hinder crimes their business is to deal with them when done from this point of view a preventive police would be a boon to a country but the mere word police is in these days a bugbear to legislators who no longer can distinguish between the three words government administration and law-making the legislator tends to centralize everything in the state as if the state could act the convict would be sure always to remember his victim and to avenge himself when justice had ceased to think of either of them prudence who instinctively appreciated the danger in a general sense so to speak left valenciennes and came to paris at the age of seventeen to hide there she tried four trades of which the most successful was that of a super at a minor theatre she was picked up by paccard and to him she told her woes paccard jacques collin's disciple and right-hand man spoke of this girl to his master and when the master needed a slave he said to prudence if you will serve me as the devil must be served 
I will rid you of Duru. Duru was the convict. The Damocles sword hung over Prudence Servien's head. But for these details, many critics would have thought Europe's attachment somewhat grotesque, and no one could have understood the startling announcement that Carlos had ready. Yes, my girl, you can go back to Valenciennes. Here, read this. And he held out to her yesterday's paper, pointing to this paragraph. Toulon. Yesterday Jean-Francois Duru was executed here. Early in the morning the garrison, etc. Prudence dropped the paper. Her legs gave way under the weight of her body. She lived again, for, to use her own words, she never liked the taste of her food since the day when Duru had threatened her. You see, I have kept my word. It has taken four years to bring Duru to the scaffold by leading him into a snare. Well, finish my job here, and you will find yourself at the head of a little country business in your native town, with twenty thousand francs of your own as Paccard's wife, and I will allow him to be virtuous as a form of pension. Europe picked up the paper and read with greedy eyes all the details of which for twenty years the papers have never been tired as to the death of convicted criminals the impressive scene the chaplain who has always converted the victim the hardened criminal preaching to his fellow convicts the battery of guns the convicts on their knees and then the twaddle and reflections which never lead to any change in the management of the prisons where eighteen hundred crimes are herded we must place Azie on the staff once more, said Carlos. Azie came forward, not understanding Europe's pantomime. In bringing her back here as cook, you must begin by giving the baron such a dinner as he never ate in his life, he went on. Tell him that Azie has lost all her money at play and has taken service once more. We shall not need an outdoor servant. Paccard shall be coachmen. Coachmen do not leave their box, where they are safe out of the way, and he will run less risk from spies. Madame must turn him out in a powdered wig and a braided felt cocked hat. That will alter his appearance. Besides, I will make him up. Are we going to have men servants in the house? asked Azie with a leer all honest folks said carlos all soft heads retorted the mulatto if the baron takes a house paccard has a friend who will suit as the lodge porter said carlos then we shall only need a footman and a kitchen maid and you can surely keep an eye on two strangers as carlos was leaving paccard made his appearance wait a little while there are people in the street said the man this simple statement was alarming carlos went up to europe's room and stayed there till paccard came to fetch him having called a hackney cab that came into the courtyard carlos pulled down the blinds and was driven off at a pace that defied pursuit having reached the faubourg st antoine he got out at a short distance from a hackney coach stand to which he went on foot and thence returned to the quai malaquais escaping all inquiry dear child said he to lucien showing him four hundred banknotes for a thousand francs here is something on account for the purchase of the estates of rubempre we will risk a hundred thousand omnibuses have just been started the parisians will take to the novelty in three months we shall have trebled our capital i know the concern they will pay splendid dividends taken out of the capital to put a head on the shares an old idea of nucingen's revived if we acquire the rubempre land we shall not have to pay on the nail you must go and see des lupeaux 
and beg him to give you a personal recommendation to a lawyer named desroches a cunning dog whom you must call on at his office get him to go to rubempre and see how the land lies promise him a premium of twenty thousand francs if he manages to secure you thirty thousand francs a year by investing eight hundred thousand francs in land round the ruins of the old house how you go on 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 i am always going on this is no time for joking you must then invest a hundred thousand crowns in treasury bonds so as to lose no interest you may safely leave it to desroches he is as honest as he is knowing that being done get off to angouleme and persuade your sister and your brother-in-law to pledge themselves to a little fib in the way of business your relations are to have given you six hundred thousand francs to promote your marriage with clotilde de grandlieu there is no disgrace in that we are saved cried lucien dazzled you are yes replied carlos but even you are not safe till you walk out of saint thomas d'aquin with clotilde as your wife and what have you to fear said lucien apparently much concerned for his counsellor some inquisitive souls are on my track i must assume the manners of a genuine priest it is most annoying the devil will cease to protect me if he sees me with a breviary under my arm Section twenty three of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter three. At this moment, the Baron de Nucingen, who was leaning on his cashier's arm, reached the door of his mansion. I am very much afraid, said he, as he went in that i have done a bad day's work well we must make it up some other ways the misfortune is that you have been caught mein herr baron said the worthy german whose whole care was for appearances yeah my missus en titre should be in a position verdy of me said this louis the fourteenth of the counting-house feeling sure that sooner or later esther would be his the baron was now himself again a masterly financier he resumed the management of his affairs and with such effect that his cashier finding him in his office room at six o'clock next morning verifying his securities rubbed his hands with satisfaction aha mein herr baron you shall have saved money last night said he with a half cunning half loutish german grin though men who are as rich as the baron de nucingen have more opportunities than others for losing money they also have more chances of making it even when they indulge their follies though the financial policy of the house of nucingen has been explained elsewhere it may be as well to point out that such immense fortunes are not made are not built up are not increased and are not retained in the midst of the commercial political and industrial revolutions of the present day but at the cost of immense losses or if you choose to view it so of heavy taxes on private fortunes very little newly created wealth is thrown into the common treasury of the world every fresh accumulation represents some new inequality in the general distribution of wealth what the state exacts it makes some return for but what a house like that of nucingen takes it keeps such covert robbery escapes the law for the reason which would have made a jacques collin of frederick the great if instead of dealing with provinces by means of battles he had dealt in smuggled goods or transferable securities 
the high politics of money-making consist in forcing the states of europe to issue loans at twenty or at ten per cent in making that twenty or ten per cent by the use of public funds in squeezing industry on a vast scale by buying up raw material in throwing a rope to the first founder of a business just to keep him above water till his drowned-out enterprise is safely landed in short in all the great battles for money-getting the banker no doubt like the conqueror runs risks but there are so few men in a position to wage this warfare that the sheep have no business to meddle such grand struggles are between the shepherds thus as the defaulters are guilty of having wanted to win too much very little sympathy is felt as a rule for the misfortunes brought about by the coalition of the nusingans if a speculator blows his brains out if a stockbroker bolts if a lawyer makes off with the fortune of a hundred families which is far worse than killing a man if a banker is insolvent all these catastrophes are forgotten in paris in a few months and buried under the oceanic surges of the great city the colossal fortunes of jacques Coeur, of the medici of the angles of dieppe of the Euphrates of la rochelle of the fuggers of the tiepolos of the corners were honestly made long ago by the advantages they had over the ignorance of the people as to the sources of precious products but nowadays geographical information has reached the masses and competition has so effectually limited the profits that every rapidly made fortune is the result of chance or of a discovery or of some legalized robbery the lower grades of mercantile enterprise have retorted on the perfidious dealings of higher commerce especially during the last ten years by base adulteration of the raw material wherever chemistry is practised wine is no longer procurable the vine industry is consequently waning manufactured salt is sold to avoid the excise the tribunals are appalled by this universal dishonesty in short french trade is regarded with suspicion by the whole world and england too is fast being demoralized with us the mischief has its origin in the political situation the charter proclaimed the reign of money and success has become the supreme consideration of an atheistic age and indeed the corruption of the higher ranks is infinitely more hideous in spite of the dazzling display and specious arguments of wealth than that ignoble and more personal corruption of the inferior classes of which certain details lend a comic element terrible if you will to this drama the government always alarmed by a new idea has banished these materials of modern comedy from the stage the citizen class less liberal than louis the fourteenth dreads the advent of its mariage de figaro forbids the appearance of a political tartuffe and certainly would not allow tourcaré to be represented for tourcaré is king consequently comedy has to be narrated and a book is now the weapon less swift but no more sure that writers wield in the course of this morning amid the coming and going of callers orders to be given and brief interviews making nucingen's private office a sort of financial lobby one of his stockbrokers announced to him the disappearance of a member of the company one of the richest and cleverest too jacques faillex brother of martin faillex and the successor of jules desmarais jacques faillex was stockbroker in ordinary to the house of nucingen in concert with du tillet and the kellers the baron had plotted the ruin of this man in cold blood as if it had been the killing of a passover lamb 
he could not have held on replied the baron quietly jacques faillex had done them immense service in stock jobbing during a crisis a few months since he had saved the situation by acting boldly but to look for gratitude from a money-dealer is as vain as to try to touch the heart of the wolves of the ukraine in winter poor fellow said the stockbroker he so little anticipated such a catastrophe that he had furnished a little house for his mistress in the rue saint georges he has spent one hundred and fifty thousand francs in decorations and furniture he was so devoted to madame du val noble the poor woman must give it all up and nothing is paid for good good thought nucingen this is the very chance to make up for what i have lost this night he have paid for nothing he asked his informant why said the stockbroker where would you find a tradesman so ill-informed as to refuse credit to jacques faix there is a splendid cellar of wine it would seem by the way the house is for sale he meant to buy it the lease is in his name what a piece of folly plate furniture wine carriage horses everything will be valued in a lump and what will the creditors get out of it come again to-morrow said nucingen i shall have seen all that and if it is not a declared bankruptcy if things can be arranged and compromised i shall tell you to offer some reasonable price for that furniture if i shall buy the lease that can be managed said his friend if you go there this morning you will find one of Fayex's partners there with the tradespeople who want to establish a first claim but la val noble has their accounts made out to Fayex. the baron sent off one of his clerks forthwith to his lawyer jacques Fayex had spoken to him about this house which was worth sixty thousand francs at most and he wished to be put in possession of it at once so as to avail himself of the privileges of the householder the cashier honest man came to inquire whether his master had lost anything by faix's bankruptcy on the contraire mein gut wolfgang i stand to win ein hundred thousand francs how was that well i shall have the little house what that poor teufel faix should furnish for his missus this year i shall have all that for fifty thousand francs to the creditors and my notary maitre cardot shall have my orders to buy the house for the landlord vant the money i knew dat but i had lost my head ver soon my divine esther shall live in a little palace i have been there mit Fayex. it is close to here it shall fit me like a glove Fayex's failure required the baron's presence at the bourse but he could not bear to leave his house in the rue saint lazare without going to the rue Tebou. he was already miserable at having been away from esther for so many hours he would have liked to keep her at his elbow the profits he hoped to make out of his stockbroker's plunder made the former loss of four hundred thousand francs quite easy to endure delighted to announce to his angel that she was to move from the rue Tebou to the rue saint georges where she was to have ein little palace where her memories would no longer rise up in antagonism to their happiness the pavement felt elastic under his feet he walked like a young man in a young man's dream as he turned the corner of the rue des trois frères in the middle of his dream and of the road the baron beheld Europe coming towards him, looking very much upset. "'Where shall you go?' he asked. "'Well, monsieur, I was on my way to you. You were quite right yesterday. I see now that poor madame had better have gone to prison for a few days. But how should women understand money matters? When madame's creditors heard that she had come home, they all came down upon us like birds of prey.' last evening at seven o'clock monsieur men came and stuck terrible posters up to announce a sale of furniture on saturday but that is nothing madame who is all heart 
once upon a time to oblige that wretch of a man you know that wretch well the man she was in love with destourney well he was charming he was only a gambler he gambled with beveled cards well and what do you do at the bourse said europe but let me go on one day to hinder georges as he said from blowing out his brains she pawned all her plate and her jewels which had never been paid for now on hearing that she had given something to one of her creditors they came in a body and made a scene they threaten her with the police court your angel at that bar is it not enough to make a wig stand on end she is bathed in tears she talks of throwing herself into the river and she will do it if i shall go to see her that is good-bye to de bourse and it is impossible but i shall go for i shall make some money for her you shall compose her i shall pay her debts i shall go to see her at four o'clock but tell me eugenie that she shall love me a little a little a great deal i tell you what monsieur nothing but generosity can win a woman's heart you would no doubt have saved a hundred thousand francs or so by letting her go to prison well you would never have won her heart as she said to me eugenie he has been noble grand he has a great soul she have said that eugenie cried the baron yes monsieur to me myself here take this ten louis thank you but she is crying at this moment she has been crying ever since yesterday as much as a weeping magdalen could have cried in six months the woman you love is in despair and for debts that are not even hers oh men they devour women as women devour old fogies there they all is the same she have pledged herself thy no one shall ever pledge herself tell her that she shall sign nothing more i shall pay but if she shall sign something more i what will you do said europe with an air mein gott i have no power over her I shall take the management of her little affairs there there go to comfort her and you shall say that in ein month she shall live in a little palace you have invested heavily monsieur le baron and for large interest in a woman's heart i tell you you look to me younger i am but a waiting-maid but i have often seen such a change it is happiness happiness gives a certain glow if you have spent a little money do not let that worry you you will see what a good return it will bring and i said to madame i told her she would be the lowest of the low a perfect hussy if she did not love you for you have picked her out of hell when once she has nothing on her mind you will see between you and me i may tell you that night when she cried so much what is to be said we value the esteem of the man who maintains us and she did not dare tell you everything she wanted to fly to fly cried the baron in dismay at the notion but the bourse the bourse gove i will not come in but tell her that i shall see her at her window that shall give me courage esther smiled at m de nucingen as he passed the house and he went ponderously on his way saying she is ein angel this was how europe had succeeded in achieving the impossible at about half-past two esther had finished dressing as she was wont to dress when she expected lucien she was looking charming seeing this prudence looking out of the window said there is monsieur the poor creature flew to the window thinking she would see lucien she saw nucingen oh how cruelly you hurt me she said there is no other way of getting you to seem to be gracious to a poor old man who after all is going to pay your debts said europe 
for they are all to be paid what debts said the girl who only cared to preserve her love which dreadful hands were scattering to the winds those which monsieur carlos made in your name why here are nearly four hundred and fifty thousand francs cried esther and you owe a hundred and fifty thousand more but the baron took it all very well he is going to remove you from hence and place you in a little palace on my honor you are not so badly off in your place as you have got on the right side of this man as soon as carlos is satisfied i should make him give me a house and a settled income you are certainly the handsomest woman i ever saw madame and the most attractive but we so soon grow ugly i was fresh and good-looking and look at me i am twenty-three about the same age as madame and i look ten years older an illness is enough well but when you have a house in paris and investments you need never be afraid of ending in the streets esther had ceased to listen to europe eugenie prudence servien the will of a man gifted with the genius of corruption had thrown esther back Section twenty four of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter four. Those who know love in its infinitude know that those who do not accept its virtues do not experience its pleasures since the scene in the den in the rue de l'anglade esther had utterly forgotten her former existence she had since lived very virtuously cloistered by her passion hence to avoid any obstacle the skilful fiend had been clever enough to lay such a train that the poor girl prompted by her devotion had merely to utter her consent to swindling actions already done or on the point of accomplishment this subtlety revealing the mastery of the tempter also characterized the methods by which he had subjugated lucien he created a terrible situation dug a mine filled it with powder and at the critical moment said to his accomplice you have only to nod and the whole will explode esther of old knowing only the morality peculiar to courtesans thought all these attentions so natural that she measured her rivals only by what they could get men to spend on them ruined fortunes are the conduct stripes of these creatures carlos in counting on esther's memory had not calculated wrongly these tricks of warfare these stratagems employed a thousand times not only by these women but by spendthrifts too did not disturb esther's mind she felt nothing but her personal degradation she loved lucien she was to be the baron de nucingen's mistress by appointment this was all she thought of the supposed spaniard might absorb the earnest money lucien might build up his fortune with the stones of her tomb a single night of pleasure might cost the old banker so many thousand franc notes more or less europe might extract a few hundred thousand francs by more or less ingenious trickery none of these things troubled the enamoured girl this alone was the canker that ate into her heart for five years she had looked upon herself as being as white as an angel she loved she was happy she had never committed the smallest infidelity this beautiful pure love was now to be defiled there was in her mind no conscious contrasting of her happy isolated past and her foul future life it was neither interest nor sentiment that moved her 
only an indefinable and all-powerful feeling that she had been white and was now black pure and was now impure noble and was now ignoble desiring to be the ermine moral taint seemed to her unendurable and when the baron's passion had threatened her she had really thought of throwing herself out of the window in short she loved lucien wholly and as women very rarely love a man women who say they love who often think they love best dance waltz and flirt with other men dress for the world and look for a harvest of concupiscent glances but esther without any sacrifice had achieved miracles of true love she had loved lucien for six years as actresses love and courtesans women who having rolled in mire and impurity thirst for something noble for the self-devotion of true love and who practice exclusiveness the only word for an idea so little known in real life vanished nations greece rome and the east have at all times kept women shut up the woman who loves should shut herself up so it may easily be imagined that on quitting the palace of her fancy where this poem had been enacted to go to this old man's little palace esther felt heartsick urged by an iron hand she had found herself waist-deep in disgrace before she had time to reflect but for the past two days she had been reflecting and felt a mortal chill about her heart at the words end in the street she started to her feet and said in the street no in the seine rather in the seine and what about monsieur lucien said europe this single word brought esther to her seat again she remained in her armchair her eyes fixed on a rosette in the carpet the fire in her brain drying up her tears at four o'clock nucingen found his angel lost in that sea of meditations and resolutions whereon a woman's spirit floats and whence she emerges with utterances that are incomprehensible to those who have not sailed it in her convoy clear your brow meine schöne said the baron sitting down by her you shall have no more debts i shall arrange mit eugenie and in ein month you shall go away from these rooms and go to that little palace thus a pretty hand give it me that i shall kiss it Esther gave him her hand as a dog gives a paw. Ach, ja, you shall give de hunt, but not de heart, and it is that heart I love. The words were spoken with such sincerity of accent that poor Esther looked at the old man with a compassion in her eyes that almost maddened him. Lovers, like martyrs, feel a brotherhood in their sufferings nothing in the world gives such a sense of kindred as community of sorrow poor man said she he really loves as he heard the words misunderstanding their meaning the baron turned pale the blood tingled in his veins he breathed the airs of heaven at his age a millionaire for such a sensation will pay as much gold as a woman can ask i love you like what i love my daughter said he and i feel there and he laid her hand over his heart that i shall not bear to see you anything but happy if you would only be a father to me i would love you very much i would never leave you and you would see that i am not a bad woman not grasping or greedy as i must seem to you now you have done some little follies said the baron like all those pretty women that is all say no more about that it is our business to make money for you be happy i shall be your father for some days yet for i know i must make you accustomed to my old carcass really 
she exclaimed springing on to nucingen's knees and clinging to him with her arm round his neck really repeated he trying to force a smile she kissed his forehead she believed in an impossible combination she might remain untouched and see lucien she was so coaxing to the banker that she was la torpille once more she fairly bewitched the old man who promised to be a father to her for forty days those forty days were to be employed in acquiring and arranging the house in the rue saint georges when he was in the street again as he went home the baron said to himself i am an old flat but though in esther's presence he was a mere child away from her he resumed his lynx's skin just as the gambler in le joueur becomes affectionate to angelique when he has not a liard a half a million francs i have paid and i have not yet seen what her leg is like that is too silly but happily nobody shall have known it said he to himself three weeks after and he made great resolutions to come to the point with the woman who had cost him so dear then in esther's presence once more he spent all the time he could spare her in making up for the roughness of his first words after all said he at the end of a month i cannot be the father eternal towards the end of the month of december eighteen twenty nine just before installing esther in the house in the rue saint georges the baron begged du tillet to take florine there that she might see whether everything was suitable to nucingen's fortune and if the description of a little palace were duly realized by the artist's commission to make the cage worthy of the bird every device known to luxury before the revolution of eighteen thirty made this residence a masterpiece of taste grandot the architect considered it his greatest achievement as a decorator the staircase which had been reconstructed of marble the judicious use of stucco ornament textiles and gilding the smallest details as much as the general effect outdid everything of the kind left in paris from the time of louis the fifteenth this is my dream this and virtue said florine with a smile and for whom are you spending all this money she asked nucingen a virgin sent down from heaven for a woman that is going up there replied the baron a way of playing jupiter replied the actress and when is she on show on the day of the housewarming cried du tillet not before that said the baron my word how we must lace and brush and fig ourselves out florine went on what a dance the women will lead their dressmakers and hairdressers for that evening's fun and when is it to be that is not for me to say what a woman she must be cried florine how much i should like to see her and so should i answered the baron artlessly what is everything new together the house the furniture and the woman even the banker said du tillet for my old friend seems to me quite young again well he must go back to his twentieth year said florine at any rate for once in the early days of eighteen thirty everybody in paris was talking of nucingen's passion and the outrageous splendor of his house the poor baron pointed at laughed at and fuming with rage as may easily be imagined took it into his head that on the occasion of giving the house warming he would at the same time get rid of his paternal disguise and get the price of so much generosity always circumvented by la torpille he determined to treat of their union by correspondence so as to win from her an autograph promise bankers have no faith in anything less than a promissory note 
so one morning early in the year he rose early locked himself into his room and composed the following letter in very good french for though he spoke the language very badly he could write it very well dear esther the flower of my thoughts and the only joy of my life when i told you that i loved you as i love my daughter i deceived you i deceived myself i only wished to express the holiness of my sentiments which are unlike those felt by other men in the first place because i am an old man and also because i have never loved till now i love you so much that if you cost me my fortune i should not love you the less be just most men would not like me have seen the angel in you i have never even glanced at your past i love you both as i love my daughter augusta and as i might love my wife if my wife could have loved me since the only excuse for an old man's love is that he should be happy ask yourself if i am not playing a too ridiculous part i have taken you to be the consolation and joy of my declining days you know that till i die you will be as happy as a woman can be and you know too that after my death you will be rich enough to be the envy of many women in every stroke of business i have affected since i have had the happiness of your acquaintance your share is set apart and you have a standing account with nucingen's bank in a few days you will move into a house which sooner or later will be your own if you like it now plainly will you still receive me then as a father or will you make me happy forgive me for writing so frankly but when i am with you i lose all courage i feel too keenly that you are indeed my mistress i have no wish to hurt you i only want to tell you how much i suffer and how hard it is to wait at my age when every day takes with it some hopes and some pleasures besides the delicacy of my conduct is a guarantee of the sincerity of my intentions have i ever behaved as your creditor you are like a citadel and i am not a young man in answer to my appeals you say your life is at stake and when i hear you you make me believe it but here i sink into dark melancholy and doubts dishonourable to us both you seemed to me as sweet and innocent as you are lovely but you insist on destroying my convictions ask yourself you tell me you bear a passion in your heart an indomitable passion but you refuse to tell me the name of the man you love is this natural you have turned a fairly strong man into an incredibly weak one you see what i have come to i am induced to ask you at the end of five months what future hope there is for my passion again i must know what part i am to play at the opening of your house money is nothing to me when it is spent for you i will not be so absurd as to make a merit to you of this contempt but though my love knows no limits my fortune is limited and i care for it only for your sake well if by giving you everything i possess i might as a poor man win your affection i would rather be poor and loved than rich and scorned by you you have altered me so completely my dear esther that no one knows me i paid ten thousand francs for a picture by joseph bridau because you told me that he was clever and unappreciated i give every beggar i meet five francs in your name well and what does the poor man ask who regards himself as your debtor when you do him the honour of accepting anything he can give you he asks only for a hope and what a hope good god is it not rather the certainty of never having anything from you but what my passion may seize the fire in my heart will abet your cruel deceptions you find me ready to submit to every condition you can impose on my happiness 
on my few pleasures but promise me at least that on the day when you take possession of your house you will accept the heart and service of him who for the rest of his days must sign himself your slave frederick de nucingen ah how he bores me this money-bag cried esther a courtesan once more she took a small sheet of note-paper and wrote all over it as close as it could go scribe's famous phrase which has become a proverb prenez mon ours a quarter of an hour later esther overcome by remorse wrote the following letter monsieur le baron pay no heed to the note you have just received from me i had relapsed into the folly of my youth forgive monsieur a poor girl who ought to be your slave i never more keenly felt the degradation of my position than on the day when i was handed over to you you have paid i owe myself to you there is nothing more sacred than a debt of dishonour i have no right to compound it by throwing myself into the seine a debt can always be discharged in that dreadful coin which is good only to the debtor you will find me yours to command i will pay off in one night all the sums for which that fatal hour has been mortgaged and i am sure that such an hour with me is worth millions all the more because it will be the only one the last i shall then have paid the debt and may get away from life a good woman has a chance of restoration after a fall but we the like of us fall too low my determination is so fixed that i beg you will keep this letter in evidence of the cause of death of her who remains for one day your servant esther having sent this letter esther felt a pang of regret ten minutes after she wrote a third note as follows forgive me dear baron it is i once more i did not mean either to make game of you or to wound you i only want you to reflect on this simple argument if we were to continue in the position towards each other of father and daughter your pleasure would be small but it would be enduring if you insist on the terms of the bargain you will live to mourn for me i will trouble you no more the day when you shall choose pleasure rather than happiness will have no morrow for me your daughter esther on receiving the first letter the baron fell into a cold fury such as a millionaire may die of he looked at himself in the glass and rang the bell an hot bat for mine feet said he to his new valet while he was sitting with his feet in the bath the second letter came he read it and fainted away he was carried to bed when the banker recovered consciousness madame de nucingen was sitting at the foot of the bed the hussy is right said she why do you try to buy love is it to be bought in the market let me see your letter to her the baron gave her sundry rough drafts he had made madame de nucingen read them and smiled then came esther's third letter she is a wonderful girl cried the baroness when she had read it what shall i do madame asked the baron of his wife wait wait but nature is pitiless he cried look here my dear you have been admirably kind to me said delphine i will give you some good advice you are a very good woman said he when you have any debts i shall pay your state on receiving these letters touches a woman far more than the spending of millions or than all the letters you could write however fine they may be try to let her know it indirectly 
perhaps she will be yours and have no scruples she will not die of that added she looking keenly at her husband but madame de nucingen knew nothing whatever of the nature of such women what a clever woman is montame de nucingen said the baron to himself when his wife had left him still the more the baron admired the subtlety of his wife's counsel the less he could see how he might act upon it Section twenty five of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter five. The stupidity of wealthy men, though it is almost proverbial, is only comparative. The faculties of the mind, like the dexterity of the limbs, need exercise the dancer's strength is in his feet the blacksmith's in his arms the market porter is trained to carry loads the singer works his larynx and the pianist hardens his wrist a banker is practised in business matters he studies and plans them and pulls the wires of various interests just as a playwright trains his intelligence in combining situations studying his actors giving life to his dramatic figures we should no more look for powers of conversation in the baron de nucingen than for the imagery of a poet in the brain of a mathematician how many poets occur in an age who are either good prose writers or as witty in the intercourse of daily life as madame cornoel buffon was dull company newton was never in love lord byron loved nobody but himself rousseau was gloomy and half crazy la fontaine absent-minded human energy equally distributed produces dolts mediocrity in all unequally bestowed it gives rise to those incongruities to whom the name of genius is given and which if we could only see them would look like deformities the same law governs the body perfect beauty is generally allied with coldness or silliness though pascal was both a great mathematician and a great writer though beaumarchais was a good man of business and zamet a profound courtier these rare exceptions prove the general principle of the specialization of brain faculties within the sphere of speculative calculations the banker put forth as much intelligence and skill finesse and mental power as a practised diplomatist expends on national affairs if he were equally remarkable outside his office the banker would be a great man nucingen made one with the prince de ligne with mazarin or with diderot is a human formula that is almost inconceivable but which has nevertheless been known as pericles aristotle voltaire and napoleon the splendor of the imperial crown must not blind us to the merits of the individual the emperor was charming well informed and witty Monsieur de nucingen a banker and nothing more having no inventiveness outside his business like most bankers had no faith in anything but sound security in matters of art he had the good sense to go cash in hand to experts in every branch and had recourse to the best architect the best surgeon the greatest connoisseur in pictures or statues the cleverest lawyer when he wished to build a house to attend to his health to purchase a work of art or an estate but as there are no recognized experts in intrigue no connoisseurs in love affairs a banker finds himself in difficulties when he is in love and much puzzled as to the management of a woman 
so nucingen could think of no better method than that he had hitherto pursued to give a sum of money to some frontin male or female to act and think for him madame de saint esteve alone could carry out the plan imagined by the baroness nucingen bitterly regretted having quarrelled with the odious old clothes seller however feeling confident of the attractions of his cash-box and the soothing documents signed gara he rang for his man and told him to inquire for the repulsive widow in the rue saint-marc and desire her to come to see him in paris extremes are made to meet by passion vice is constantly binding the rich to the poor the great to the mean the empress consults mademoiselle lenormand the fine gentleman in every age can always find a rampanneau the man returned within two hours monsieur le baron said he madame de saint esteve is ruined ah so much de better cried the baron in glee i shall have her safe then the good woman is given to gambling it would seem the valet went on and moreover she is under the thumb of a third-rate actor in a suburban theatre whom for decency's sake she calls her godson she is a first-rate cook it would seem and wants a place those poifel of geniuses of the common people have always ten vays of making money and ein dozen vays of spending it said the baron to himself quite unconscious that panurge had thought the same thing he sent his servant off in quest of madame de saint esteve who did not come till the next day being questioned by asie the servant revealed to this female spy the terrible effects of the notes written to monsieur le baron by his mistress monsieur must be desperately in love with the woman said he in conclusion for he was very near dying for my part i advised him never to go back to her for he will be wheedled over at once a woman who has already cost monsieur le baron five hundred thousand francs they say without counting what he has spent on the house in the rue saint georges but the woman cares for money and for money only as madame came out of monsieur's room she said with a laugh if this goes on that slut will make a widow of me the devil cried asie it will never do to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs monsieur le baron has no hope now but in you said the valet ay the fact is i do know how to make a woman go well walk in said the man bowing to such occult powers well said the false saint esteve going into the sufferer's room with an abject air monsieur le baron has met with some difficulties what can you expect everybody is open to attack on his weak side dear me i have had my troubles too within two months the wheel of fortune has turned upside down for me here i am looking out for a place we have neither of us been very wise if monsieur le baron would take me as cook to madame esther i would be the most devoted of slaves i should be useful to you monsieur to keep an eye on eugenie and madame there is no hope of that said the baron i cannot succeed in being the master i am let such a tense as as a top as he put in well you have made others dance daddy and the little slut has got you and is making a fool of you heaven is just just said the baron i have not sent for you to preach to me pooh my boy a little moralizing breaks no bones it is the salt of life to the like of us as vice is to your bigots come have you been generous you have paid her debts yeah said the baron lamentably that is well 
and you have taken her things out of pawn and that is better but you must see that it is not enough all this gives her no occupation and these creatures love to cut a dash i shall have a surprise for her rue saint georges she knows that said the baron but i shall not be made a fool of very well then let her go i am only afraid that she shall let me go cried the baron and we want our money's worth my boy replied asie listen to me we have fleeced the public of some millions my little friend twenty-five millions i am told you possess the baron could not suppress a smile well you must let one go i shall let one go but as soon as i shall let one go i shall have to give still another yes i understand replied asie you will not say b for fear of having to go on to z still as there is a good girl a very honest girl cried the banker and she is ready to submit but only as in payment of a debt in short she does not want to be your mistress she feels an aversion well and i understand it the child has always done just what she pleased when a girl has never known any but charming young men she cannot take to an old one you are not handsome you are as big as louis the eighteenth and rather dull company as all men are who try to cajole fortune instead of devoting themselves to women well if you don't think six hundred thousand francs too much said asie i pledge myself to make her whatever you can wish six hundred thousand franc cried the baron with a start esther is to cost me a million to begin with happiness is surely worth sixteen hundred thousand francs you old sinner you must know men in these days have certainly spent more than one or two millions on a mistress i even know women who have cost men their lives for whom heads have rolled into the basket you know the doctor who poisoned his friend he wanted the money to gratify a woman yeah i know all that but if i am in love i am not an idiot at least while i am here but if i shall see her i shall give her my pocket-book well listen monsieur le baron said asie assuming the attitude of a semiramis you have been squeezed dry enough already now as sure as my name is saint esteve in the way of business of course i will stand by you Goot, i shall repay you i believe you my boy for i have shown you that i know how to be revenged besides i tell you this daddy i know how to snuff out your madame esther as you would snuff a candle and i know my lady when the little hussy has once made you happy she will be even more necessary to you than she is at this moment you paid me well you have allowed yourself to be fooled but after all you have forked out i have fulfilled my part of the agreement haven't i well look here i will make a bargain with you let me hear you shall get me the place as cook to madame engage me for ten years and pay the last five in advance what is that just a little earnest money when once i am about madame i can bring her to these terms of course you must first order her a lovely dress from madame auguste who knows her style and taste and order the new carriage to be at the door at four o'clock after the bourse closes go to her rooms and take her for a little drive in the bois de boulogne well by that act the woman proclaims herself your mistress she has advertised herself to the eyes and knowledge of all paris a hundred thousand francs you must dine with her 
i know how to cook such a dinner you must take her to the play to the varieté to a stage-box and then all paris will say there is that old rascal nucingen with his mistress it is very flattering to know that such things are said well all this for i am not grasping is included for the first hundred thousand francs in a week by such conduct you will have made some way but i shall have paid ein hundred thousand franc in the course of the second week as he went on as though she had not heard this lamentable ejaculation madame tempted by these preliminaries will have made up her mind to leave her little apartment and move to the house you are giving her your esther will have seen the world again have found her old friends she will wish to shine and do the honors of her palace it is in the nature of things another hundred thousand francs by heaven you are at home there esther compromised she must be yours the rest is a mere trifle in which you must play the principal part old elephant how wide the monster opens his eyes well i will undertake that too four hundred thousand and that my fine fellow you need not pay till the day after what do you think of that for honesty i have more confidence in you than you have in me if i persuade madame to show herself as your mistress to compromise herself to take every gift you offer her perhaps this very day you will believe that i am capable of inducing her to throw open the pass of the great saint bernard and it is a hard job i can tell you it will take as much pulling to get your artillery through as it took the first consul to get over the alps but why her heart is full of love old shaver rasabus as you say who know latin replied asie she thinks herself the queen of sheba because she has washed herself in sacrifices made for her lover an idea that that sort of woman gets into her head well well old fellow we must be just it is fine that baggage would die of grief at being your mistress i really should not wonder but what i trust to and i tell you to give you courage is that there is good in the girl at bottom you have a genius for corruption said the baron who had listened to asie in admiring silence just as i have the knack of the banking then it is settled my pigeon said asie done for fifty thousand francs instead of ein hundred thousand and i shall give you five hundred thousand the day after my triumph very good i will set to work said asie and you may come monsieur she added respectfully you will find madame as soft already as a cat's back and perhaps inclined to make herself pleasant go go my good woman said the banker rubbing his hands and after seeing the horrible mulatto out of the house he said to himself how vice it is to have much money he sprang out of bed went down to his office Section twenty six of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Perry. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter six. Nothing could be more fatal to Esther than the steps taken by Nucingen. The hapless girl, in defending her fidelity, was defending her life this very natural instinct was what carlos called prudery now as he not without taking such precautions as usual in such cases went off to report to carlos the conference she had had with the baron and all the profit she had made by it 
the man's rage like himself was terrible he came forthwith to esther in a carriage with the blinds drawn driving into the courtyard still almost white with fury the double-dyed forger went straight into the poor girl's room she looked at him she was standing up and she dropped onto a chair as though her legs had snapped what is the matter monsieur said she quaking in every limb leave us erop said he to the maid esther looked at the woman as a child might look at its mother from whom some assassin had snatched it to murder it do you know where you will send lucien carlos went on when he was alone with esther where asked she in a low voice venturing to glance at her executioner where i come from my beauty esther as she looked at the man saw red to the hulks he added in an undertone esther shut her eyes and stretched herself out her arms dropped and she turned white the man rang and prudence appeared bring her round he said coldly i have not done he walked up and down the drawing-room while waiting Prudence Europe was obliged to come and beg Monsieur to lift Esther on to the bed. He carried her with the ease that betrayed athletic strength. They had to procure all the chemist's strongest stimulants to restore Esther to a sense of her woes. An hour later the poor girl was able to listen to this living nightmare seated at the foot of her bed, his eyes fixed and glowing like two spots of molten lead. "'My little sweetheart,' said he, "'Lucien now stands between a splendid life, honoured, happy, and respected, and the hole full of water, mud, and gravel into which he was going to plunge when I met him. The house of Grandlieu requires of the dear boy an estate.' worth a million francs before securing for him the title of marquis and handing over to him that maypole named clotilde by whose help he will rise to power thanks to you and me lucien has just purchased his maternal manor the old chateau de rubempre which indeed did not cost much thirty thousand francs but his lawyer by clever negotiations has succeeded in adding to it estates worth a million on which three hundred thousand francs are paid the chateau the expenses and percentages to the men who were put forward as a blind to conceal the transaction from the country people have swallowed up the remainder we have to be sure a hundred thousand francs invested in a business here which in a few months hence will be worth two to three hundred thousand francs but there will still be four hundred thousand francs to be paid in three days lucien will be home from angouleme where he has been because he must not be suspected of having found a fortune in remaking your bed oh no cried she looking up with a noble impulse i ask you then is this a moment to scare off the baron he went on calmly and you very nearly killed him the day before yesterday he fainted like a woman on reading your second letter you have a fine style i congratulate you if the baron had died where would we be now when lucien walks out of saint thomas d'aquin son-in-law to the duc de grandlieu if you want to try a dip in the seine well my beauty i offer you my hand for a dive together it is one way of ending matters but consider a moment would it not be better to live and say to yourself again and again this fine fortune this happy family for he will have children children have you ever thought of the joy of running your fingers through the hair of his children esther closed her eyes with a little shiver well as you gaze on that structure of happiness you may say to yourself this is my doing there was a pause and the two looked at each other 
this is what i have tried to make out of such despair as saw no issue but the river said carlos am i selfish that is the way to love men show such devotion to none but kings but i have anointed lucien king if i were riveted for the rest of my days to my old chain i fancy i could stay there resigned so long as i could say he is gay he is at court my soul and mind would triumph while my carcass was given over to the jailers you are a mere female you love like a female but in a courtesan as in all degraded creatures love should be a means to motherhood in spite of nature which has stricken you with barrenness if ever under the skin of the abbe carlos herrera any one were to detect the convict i have been do you know what i would do to avoid compromising lucien esther awaited the reply with some anxiety well he said after a brief pause i would die as the negroes do without a word and you with all your airs will put folks on my traces what did i require of you to be la torpille again for six months for six weeks and to do it to clutch a million lucien will never forget you men do not forget the being of whom they are reminded day after day by the joy of awaking rich every morning lucien is a better fellow than you are he began by loving coralie she died good but he had not enough money to bury her he did not do as you did just now he did not faint though he is a poet he wrote six rollicking songs and earned three hundred francs with which he paid for coralie's funeral i have those songs i know them by heart well then do you too compose your songs be cheerful be wild be irresistible and insatiable you hear me do not let me have to speak again kiss papa good-bye when half an hour after europe went into her mistress's room she found her kneeling in front of a crucifix in the attitude which the most religious of painters has given to moses before the burning bush on horeb to depict his deep and complete adoration of jehovah after saying her prayers esther had renounced her better life the honor she had created for herself her glory her virtue and her love she rose oh madame you will never look like that again cried prudence servien struck by her mistress's sublime beauty she hastily turned the long mirror so that the poor girl should see herself her eyes still had a light as of the soul flying heavenward the jewess's complexion was brilliant sparkling with tears unshed in the fervor of prayer her eyelashes were like leaves after a summer shower for the last time they shone with the sunshine of pure love her lips seemed to preserve an expression as of her last appeal to the angels whose palm of martyrdom she had no doubt borrowed while placing in their hands her past unspotted life and she had the majesty which mary stuart must have shown at the moment when she bid adieu to her crown to earth and to love i wish lucien could have seen me thus she said with a smothered sigh now she added in a strident tone now for a fling Arop stood dumb at hearing the words as though she had heard an angel blaspheme well why need you stare at me to see if i have clothes in my mouth instead of teeth i am nothing henceforth but a vile foul creature a thief and i expect my lord so get me a hot bath and put my dress out it is twelve o'clock the baron will look in no doubt when the bourse closes 
i shall tell him i was waiting for him and as these to prepare us dinner first chop mind you i mean to turn the man's brain come hurry hurry my girl we are going to have some fun that is to say we must go to work she sat down at the table and wrote the following note my friend if the cook you have sent me had not already been in my service i might have thought that your purpose was to let me know how often you had fainted yesterday on receiving my three notes what can i say i was very nervous that day i was thinking over the memories of my miserable existence but i know how sincere as he is still i cannot repent of having caused you so much pain since it has availed to prove to me how much you love me this is how we are made we luckless and despised creatures true affection touches us far more deeply than finding ourselves the objects of lavish liberality for my part i have always rather dreaded being a peg on which you would hang your vanities it annoyed me to be nothing else to you yes in spite of all your protestations i fancied you regarded me merely as a woman paid for well you will now find me a good girl but on condition of your always obeying me a little if this letter can in any way take the place of the doctor's prescription prove it by coming to see me after the bourse closes you will find me in full fig dressed in your gifts for i am for life your pleasure machine esther at the bourse the baron de nucingen was so gay so cheerful seemed so easy-going and allowed himself so many jests that du tillet and the kellers who were on change could not help asking him the reason of his high spirits i am beloved we shall soon give that house warming he told du tillet and how much does it cost you asked francois keller rudely it was said that he had spent twenty-five thousand francs a year on madame colville that woman is an angel she never has asked me for one sou they never do replied du tillet and it is to avoid asking that they have always aunts or mothers between the bourse and the rue Tebou, seven times did the baron say to his servant you go so slow vip de horse he ran lightly upstairs and for the first time he saw his mistress in all the beauty of such women who have no other occupation than the care of their person and their dress just out of her bath the flower was quite fresh and perfumed so as to inspire desire in robert de bruxelles esther was in a charming toilette a dress of black corded silk trimmed with rose-colored gimp opened over a petticoat of gray satin the costume subsequently worn by amigo the handsome singer in i puritani a honiton lace kerchief fell or floated over her shoulders the sleeves of her gown were strapped round with cording to divide the puffs which for some little time fashion has substituted for the large sleeves which had grown too monstrous esther had fastened a mechlin lace cap on her magnificent hair with a pin a la folle as it is called ready to fall but not really falling giving her an appearance of being tumbled and in disorder though the white parting showed plainly on her little head between the waves of her hair is it not a shame to see madame so lovely in a shabby drawing-room like this said europe to the baron as she admitted him well then come to the rue st georges said the baron coming to a full stop like a dog marking a partridge the weather is splendid we shall drive to the champs elysees and montame saint estephe and eugenie shall carry there all your clothes and your linen and we shall dine in the rue st georges i will do whatever you please said esther 
if only you will be so kind as to call my cook Asie and Eugenie Europe. I have given those names to all the women who have served me ever since the first two. I do not love change. Asie Europe, echoed the baron, laughing. How very droll you are! You have inventions. I should have eaten many dinners before I should have called a cook Asie it is our business to be droll said esther come now may not a poor girl be fed by asia and dressed by europe when you live on the whole world it is a myth i say some women would devour the earth i only ask for half you see vater woman is montame saint esteph said the baron to himself as he admired esther's changed demeanour Rob, my girl, I want my bonnet, said Esther. I must have a black silk bonnet lined with pink and trimmed with lace. Madame Thomas has not sent it home. Come, Monsieur le Baron, quick, off you go. Begin your functions as a man of all work, that is to say, of all pleasure. Happiness is burdensome. You have your carriage here. Go to Madame Thomas, said Europe to the Baron make your servant ask for the bonnet for madame van bogseck and above all she added in his ear bring her the most beautiful bouquet to be had in paris it is winter so try to get tropical flowers the baron went downstairs and told his servants to go to montame thomas the coachman drove to a famous pastry cook's she is a milliner you damn idiot and not a cake shop cried the baron who rushed off to madame prevost's in the palais royal where he had a bouquet made up Section 27 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter 7. A superficial observer, walking about Paris, wonders who the fools can be that buy the fabulous flowers that grace the illustrious bouquetier's shop window and the choice products displayed by chevet of european fame the only purveyor who can vie with the rocher de cancale in a real and delicious revue des deux mondes well every day in paris a hundred or more passions a la nucingen come into being and find expression in offering such rarities as queens dare not purchase presented kneeling to baggages who to use asie's word like to cut a dash but for these little details a decent citizen would be puzzled to conceive how a fortune melts in the hands of these women whose social function in fourier's scheme is perhaps to rectify the disasters caused by avarice and cupidity such squandering is no doubt to the social body what a prick of the lancet is to a plethoric subject in two months nucingen had shed broadcast on trade more than two hundred thousand francs by the time the old lover returned darkness was falling the bouquet was no longer of any use the hour for driving in the champs elysees in winter is between two and four however the carriage was of use to convey esther from the rue taitbout to the rue saint georges where she took possession of the little palace never before had esther been the object of such worship or such lavishness and it amazed her but like all royal ingrates she took care to express no surprise when you go into st peter's at rome to enable you to appreciate the extent and height of this queen of cathedrals you are shown the little finger of a statue which looks of a natural size and which measures i know not how much 
descriptions have been so severely criticized necessary as they are to a history of manners that i must here follow the example of the roman cicerone as they entered the dining-room the baron could not resist asking esther to feel the stuff of which the window curtains were made draped with magnificent fullness lined with white watered silk and bordered with a gimp fit to trim a portuguese princess's bodice the material was silk brought from canton on which chinese patients had painted oriental birds with a perfection only to be seen in medieval illuminations or in the missal of charles v the pride of the imperial library at vienna it have cost two thousand franc an ell for a milord who brought it from india it is very nice charming said esther how i shall enjoy drinking champagne here the froth will not get dirty here on a bare floor oh madame cried Europe, only look at the carpet this carpet have been made for the duc de torlonia a friend of mine who found it too dear so i took it for you who are my queen said musingen by chance this carpet by one of our cleverest designers matched with the whimsicalities of the chinese curtains the walls painted by schinner and leon de lora represented voluptuous scenes in carved ebony frames purchased for their weight in gold from du Sommerard, and forming panels with a narrow line of gold that coyly caught the light from this you may judge of the rest you did well to bring me here said esther it will take me a week to get used to my home and not to look like a parvenu in it my home then you shall accept it cried the baron in glee why of course and a thousand times of course stupid animal said she smiling animal was enough stupid is a term of endearment said she looking at him the poor man took esther's hand and pressed it to his heart he was animal enough to feel but too stupid to find words feel how it beats for ein little tender vert and he conducted his goddess to her room oh madame i cannot stay here cried eugenie it makes me long to go to bed well said esther i mean to please the magician who has worked all these wonders listen my fat elephant after dinner we will go to the play together i am starving to see a play it was just five years since esther had been to a theatre all paris was rushing at that time to the porte saint martin to see one of those pieces to which the power of the actors lends a terrible expression of reality richard darlington like all ingenuous natures esther loved to feel the thrills of fear as much as to yield to tears of pathos let us go to see frederic lemaitre said she he is an actor i adore it is a horrible piece said nucingen foreseeing the moment when he must show himself in public he sent his servant to secure one of the two stage-boxes on the grand tier and this is another strange feature of paris whenever success on feet of clay fills a house there is always a stage-box to be had ten minutes before the curtain rises the managers keep it for themselves unless it happens to be taken for a passion a la nucingen this box like chevet's dainties is a tax levied on the whims of the parisian olympus it would be superfluous to describe the plate and china nucingen had provided three services of plate common medium and best and the best plates dishes and all was of chased silver gilt the banker to avoid overloading the table with gold and silver 
had completed the array of each service with porcelain of exquisite fragility in the style of dresden china which had cost more than the plate as to the linen saxony england flanders and france vied in the perfection of flowered damask at dinner it was the baron's turn to be amazed on tasting aziz cookery i understand said he why you call her Azie? this is asiatic cooking i begin to think he loves me said esther to Arop. he has said something almost like a bon mot i said many words said he well he is more like tourcaret than i had heard he was cried the girl laughing at this reply worthy of the many artless speeches for which the banker was famous the dishes were so highly spiced as to give the baron an indigestion on purpose that he might go home early so this was all he got in the way of pleasure out of his first evening with esther at the theatre he was obliged to drink an immense number of glasses of eau sucre leaving esther alone between the acts by a coincidence so probable that it can scarcely be called chance tullia mariette and madame du val noble were at the play that evening richard darlington enjoyed a wild success and a deserved success such as is seen only in paris the men who saw this play all came to the conclusion that a lawful wife might be thrown out of window and the wives loved to see themselves unjustly persecuted the women said to each other this is too much we are driven to it but it often happens now a woman as beautiful as esther and dressed as esther was could not show off with impunity in a stage-box at the porte saint martin and so during the second act there was quite a commotion in the box where the two dancers were sitting caused by the undoubted identity of the unknown fair one with la torpille hey day where has she dropped from said mariette to madame du val noble i thought she was drowned but is it she she looks to me thirty-seven times younger and handsomer than she was six years ago perhaps she has preserved herself in ice like madame d'espard and madame zayoncheck said the comte de brambourg who had brought the three women to the play to a pit tier box isn't she the rat you meant to send me to hocus my uncle said he addressing tullia the very same said the singer du bruel go down to the stalls and see if it is she what brass she has got exclaimed madame du val noble using an expressive but vulgar phrase oh said the comte de brambourg she very well may she is with my friend the baron de nucingen i will go is that the immaculate joan of arc who has taken nucingen by storm and who has been talked of till we are all sick of her these three months past asked mariette good evening my dear baron said philippe bridau as he went into nucingen's box so here you are married to mademoiselle esther mademoiselle i am an old officer whom you once on a time were to have got out of a scrape at issoudun philippe rideau i know nothing of it said esther looking round the house through her opera glasses this lady said the baron is no longer known as esther so short she is called montame de champy a little estate that i have bought for her though you do things in such style said the comte these ladies are saying that madame de champy gives herself two great airs if you do not choose to remember me will you condescend to recognize mariette tullia madame du val noble the parvenu went on a man for whom the duc de montfrigneuse had won the dauphin's favor if these ladies are kind to me i am willing to make myself pleasant to them 
replied madame de champy dryly kind why they are excellent they have named you joan of arc replied philippe well then if these ladies will keep you company said nucingen i shall go away for i have eaten too much your carriage shall come for you and your people that teufel asie the first time and you leave me alone said esther come come you must have courage enough to die on deck i must have my man with me as i go out if i were insulted am i to cry out for nothing the old millionaire's selfishness had to give way to his duties as a lover the baron suffered but stayed esther had her own reasons for detaining her man if she admitted her acquaintance she would be less closely questioned in his presence than if she were alone philippe bridau hurried back to the box where the dancers were sitting and informed them of the state of affairs oh so it is she who has fallen heir to my house in the rue saint georges observed madame du val noble with some bitterness for she as she phrased it was on the loose most likely said the colonel du tillet told me that the baron had spent three times as much there as your poor fayex let us go round to her box said tullia not if i know it said mariette she is much too handsome i will call on her at home i think myself good-looking enough to risk it remarked tullia so the much daring leading dancer went round between the acts and renewed acquaintance with esther who would talk only on general subjects and where have you come back from my dear child asked tullia who could not restrain her curiosity oh i was for five years in a castle in the alps with an englishman as jealous as a tiger a nabob i called him a nabo a dwarf for he was not so big as le bailli de ferrette and then i came across a banker from a savage to salvation as florine might say and now here i am in paris again i long so for amusement that i mean to have a rare time i shall keep open house i have five years of solitary confinement to make good and i am beginning to do it five years of an englishman is rather too much six weeks are the allowance according to the advertisements was it the baron who gave you that lace no it is a relic of the nabob what ill luck i have my dear he was as yellow as a friend's smile at a success i thought he would be dead in ten months pooh he was as strong as a mountain always distrust men who say they have a liver complaint i will never listen to a man who talks of his liver i have had too much of livers who cannot die my nabob robbed me he died without making a will and the family turned me out of doors like a leper so then i said to my fat friend here pay for two you may as well call me joan of arc i have ruined england and perhaps i shall die at the stake of love said tullia and burnt alive answered esther and the question made her thoughtful the baron laughed at all this vulgar nonsense but he did not always follow it readily so that his laughter sounded like the forgotten crackers that go off after fireworks we all live in a sphere of some kind and the inhabitants of every sphere are endowed with an equal share of curiosity next evening at the opera esther's reappearance was the great news behind the scenes between two and four in the afternoon all paris in the champs elysees had recognized la torpille and knew at last who was the object of the baron de nucingen's passion do you know blondet remarked to de marsay in the green room at the opera house that la torpille vanished 
the very day after the evening when we saw her here and recognized her in little rubempre's mistress in paris as in the provinces everything is known the police of the rue de jerusalem are not so efficient as the world itself for every one is a spy on every one else though unconsciously carlos had fully understood the danger of lucien's position during and after the episode of the rue tebou no position can be more dreadful than that in which madame de val noble now found herself and the phrase to be on the loose or as the french say left on foot expresses it perfectly the recklessness and extravagance of these women precludes all care for the future in that strange world far more witty and amusing than might be supposed only such women as are not gifted with that perfect beauty which time can hardly impair and which is quite unmistakable only such women in short as can be loved merely as a fancy ever think of old age and save a fortune the handsomer they are the more improvident they are are you afraid of growing ugly that you are saving money was a speech of florine's to mariette which may give a clue to one cause of this thriftlessness thus if a speculator kills himself or a spendthrift comes to the end of his resources these women fall with hideous promptitude from audacious wealth to the utmost misery they throw themselves into the clutches of the old clothes buyer and sell exquisite jewels for a mere song they run into debt expressly to keep up a spurious luxury in the hope of recovering what they have lost a cash-box to draw upon these ups and downs of their career account for the costliness of such connections generally brought about as asie had hooked another word of her vocabulary nucingen for esther and so those who know their paris are quite aware of the state of affairs when in the champs elysees that bustling and mongrel bazaar they meet some woman in a hired fly whom six months or a year before they had seen in a magnificent and dazzling carriage turned out in the most luxurious style if you fall on sainte pelagie you must contrive to rebound on the bois de boulogne said florine laughing with blondet over the little vicomte de portandouer some clever women never run the risk of this contrast they bury themselves in horrible furnished lodgings where they expiate their extravagance by such privations as are endured by travellers lost in a sahara but they never take the smallest fancy for economy they venture forth to masked balls they take journeys into the provinces they turn out well dressed on the boulevards when the weather is fine and then they find in each other the devoted kindness which is known only among proscribed races it costs a woman in luck no effort to bestow some help for she says to herself i may be in the same plight by sunday however the most efficient protector still is the purchaser of dress when this greedy money-lender finds herself the creditor she stirs and works on the hearts of all the old men she knows in favor of the mortgaged creature in thin boots and a fine bonnet in this way madame du val noble unable to foresee the downfall of one of the richest and cleverest of stockbrokers was left quite unprepared she had spent Fayex's money on her whims and trusted to him for all necessaries and to provide for the future how could i have expected such a thing in a man who seemed such a good fellow in almost every class of society the good fellow is an open-handed man who will lend a few crowns now and again without expecting them back 
who always behaves in accordance with a certain code of delicate feeling above mere vulgar obligatory and commonplace morality certain men regarded as virtuous and honest have like nucingen ruined their benefactors and certain others who have been through a criminal court have an ingenious kind of honesty towards women perfect virtue the dream of moliere an alceste is exceedingly rare still it is to be found everywhere even in paris the good fellow is the product of a certain facility of nature which proves nothing a man is a good fellow as a cat is silky as a slipper is made to slip on to the foot and so in the meaning given to the word by a kept woman Thayex ought to have warned his mistress of his approaching bankruptcy and have given her enough to live upon destourney the dashing swindler was a good fellow he cheated at cards but he had set aside thirty thousand francs for his mistress and at carnival suppers women would retort on his accusers no matter you may say what you like georges was a good fellow he had charming manners he deserved a better fate these girls laugh laws to scorn and adore a certain kind of generosity they sell themselves as a Section twenty eight of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter eight. After saving a few jewels from the wreck with great difficulty, Madame du Val Noble was crushed under the burden of the horrible report she ruined Thayax. she was almost thirty and though she was in the prime of her beauty still she might be called an old woman and all the more so because in such a crisis all a woman's rivals are against her mariette florine tullia would ask their friend to dinner and gave her some help but as they did not know the extent of her debts they did not dare to sound the depths of that gulf an interval of six years formed rather too long a gap in the ebb and flow of the paris tide between la torpille and madame du val noble for the woman on foot to speak to the woman in her carriage but la val noble knew that esther was too generous not to remember sometimes that she had as she said fallen heir to her possessions and not to seek her out by some meeting which might seem accidental though arranged to bring about such an accident madame du val noble dressed in the most ladylike way walked out every day in the champs-elysees on the arm of theodore gaillard who afterwards married her and who in these straits behaved very well to his former mistress giving her boxes at the play and inviting her to every spree she flattered herself that esther driving out one fine day would meet her face to face esther's coachman was paccard for her household had been made up in five days by asie europe and paccard under carlos's instructions and in such a way that the house in the rue saint georges was an impregnable fortress peyrade on his part prompted by deep hatred by the thirst for vengeance and above all by his wish to see his darling lydie married made the champs-elysees the end of his walks as soon as he heard from contenson that monsieur de nucingen's mistress might be seen there peyrade could dress so exactly like an englishman and spoke french so perfectly with the mincing accent that the english give the language 
he knew england itself so well and was so familiar with all the customs of the country having been sent to england by the police authorities three times between seventeen seventy nine and seventeen eighty six that he could play his part in london and at ambassadors residences without awaking suspicion peyrade who had some resemblance to mousson the famous juggler could disguise himself so effectually that once contenson did not recognize him followed by contenson dressed as a mulatto peyrade examined esther and her servants with an eye which seeming heedless took everything in hence it quite naturally happened that in the side alley where the carriage company walk in fine dry weather he was on the spot one day when esther met madame du val noble peyrade his mulatto in livery at his heels was airing himself quite naturally like a nabob who is thinking of no one but himself in a line with the two women so as to catch a few words of their conversation well my dear child said esther to madame de val noble come and see me nucingen owes it to himself not to leave his stockbroker's mistress without a sou all the more so because it is said that he ruined fayex remarked theodore gaillard and that we have every right to squeeze him he dines with me to-morrow said esther come and meet him then she added in an undertone i can do what i like with him and as yet he has not that and she put the nail of a gloved finger under the prettiest of her teeth with the click that is familiarly known to express with peculiar energy just nothing you have him safe my dear as yet he has only paid my debts how mean cried suzanne du val noble oh said esther i had debts enough to frighten a minister of finance now i mean to have thirty thousand a year before the first stroke of midnight oh he is excellent i have nothing to complain of he does it well in a week we give a housewarming you must come that morning he is to make me a present of the lease of the house in the rue st georges in decency it is impossible to live in such a house on less than thirty thousand francs a year of my own so as to have them safe in case of accident i have known poverty and i want no more of it there are certain acquaintances one has had enough of at once and you who used to say my face is my fortune how you have changed exclaimed suzanne it is the air of switzerland you grow thrifty there look here go there yourself my dear catch a swiss and you may perhaps catch a husband for they have not yet learned what such women as we are can be and at any rate you may come back with a passion for investments in the funds a most respectable and elegant passion good-bye esther got into her carriage again a handsome carriage drawn by the finest pair of dappled gray horses at that time to be seen in paris the woman who is getting into the carriage is handsome said peyrade to contenson but i like the one who is walking best follow her and find out who she is that is what that englishman has just remarked in english said theodore gaillard repeating peyrade's remark to madame de val noble before making this speech in english peyrade had uttered a word or two in that language which had made theodore look up in a way that convinced him that the journalist understood english madame de val noble very slowly made her way home to very decent furnished rooms in the rue louis le grand glancing round now and then to see if the mulatto were following her this establishment was kept by a certain madame gerard 
whom suzanne had obliged in the days of her splendor and who showed her gratitude by giving her a suitable home this good soul an honest and virtuous citizen even pious looked on the courtesan as a woman of a superior order she had always seen her in the midst of luxury and thought of her as a fallen queen she trusted her daughters with her and which is a fact more natural than might be supposed the courtesan was as scrupulously careful in taking them to the play as their mother could have been and the two gerard girls loved her the worthy kind lodging-house keeper was like those sublime priests who see in these outlawed women only a creature to be saved and loved madame du val-noble respected this worth and often as she chatted with the good woman she envied her while bewailing her own ill fortune you are still handsome you may make a good end yet madame gerard would say but indeed madame du val-noble was only relatively impoverished this woman's wardrobe so extravagant and elegant was still sufficiently well furnished to allow of her appearing on occasion as on that evening at the porte saint martin to see richard darlington in much splendor and madame gerard would most good-naturedly pay for the cabs needed by the lady on foot to go out to dine or to the play and to come home again well dear madame gerard said she to this worthy mother my luck is about to change i believe well well madame so much the better but be prudent do not run into debt any more i have such difficulty in getting rid of the people who are hunting for you oh never worry yourself about those hounds they have all made no end of money out of me here are some tickets for the varieté for your girls a good box on the second tier if any one should ask for me this evening before i come in show them up all the same adele my old maid will be here i will send her round madame du val-noble having neither mother nor aunt was obliged to have recourse to her maid equally on foot to play the part of a saint esteve with the unknown follower whose conquest was to enable her to rise again in the world she went to dine with theodore gaillard who as it happened had a spree on that day that is to say a dinner given by nathan in payment of a bet he had lost one of those orgies when a man says to his guests you can bring a woman it was not without strong reasons that peyrade had made up his mind to rush in person on to the field of this intrigue at the same time his curiosity like corentin's was so keenly excited that even in the absence of reasons he would have tried to play a part in the drama at this moment charles the tenth's policy had completed its last evolution after confiding the helm of state to ministers of his own choosing the king was preparing to conquer algiers and to utilize the glory that should accrue as a passport to what has been called his coup d'etat there were no more conspiracies at home charles x believed he had no domestic enemies but in politics as at sea a calm may be deceptive thus corentin had lapsed into total idleness in such a case a true sportsman to keep his hand in for lack of larks kills sparrows domitian we know for lack of christians killed flies contenson having witnessed esther's arrest had with the keen instinct of a spy fully understood the upshot of the business the rascal as we have seen did not attempt to conceal his opinion of the baron de nucingen who is benefiting by making the banker pay so dear for his passion was the first question the allies asked each other 
recognizing asie as a leader in the piece contenson hoped to find out the author through her but she slipped through his fingers again and again hiding like an eel in the mud of paris and when he found her again as the cook in esther's establishment it seemed to him inexplicable that the half-caste woman should have had a finger in the pie thus for the first time these two artistic spies had come on a text that they could not decipher while suspecting a dark plot to the story after three bold attempts on the house in the rue Tebou, contenson still met with absolute dumbness so long as esther dwelt there the lodge porter seemed to live in mortal terror as he had perhaps promised poisoned meat-balls to all the family in the event of any indiscretion on the day after esther's removal contenson found this man rather more amenable he regretted the lady he said who had fed him with the broken dishes from her table contenson disguised as a broker tried to bargain for the rooms and listened to the porter's lamentations while he fooled him casting a doubt on all the man said by a questioning really yes monsieur the lady lived here for five years without ever going out and more by token her lover desperately jealous though she was beyond reproach took the greatest precautions when he came in or went out and a very handsome young man he was too lucien was at this time still staying with his sister madame sechard but as soon as he returned contenson sent the porter to the quai malaquais to ask monsieur de rubempre whether he were willing to part with the furniture left in the rooms lately occupied by madame van bogseck the porter then recognized lucien as the young widow's mysterious lover and this was all that contenson wanted the deep but suppressed astonishment may be imagined with which lucien and carlos received the porter whom they affected to regard as a madman they tried to upset his convictions within twenty-four hours carlos had organized a force which detected contenson red-handed in the act of espionage contenson disguised as a market porter had twice already brought home the provisions purchased in the morning by asie and had twice got into the little mansion in the rue saint georges corentin on his part was making a stir but he was stopped short by recognizing the certain identity of carlos herrera for he learned at once that this abbe the secret envoy of ferdinand the seventh had come to paris towards the end of eighteen twenty three still corentin thought it worth while to study the reasons which had led the spaniard to take an interest in lucien de rubempre it was soon clear to him beyond doubt that esther had for five years been lucien's mistress so the substitution of the englishwoman had been effected for the advantage of that young dandy now lucien had no means he was rejected as a suitor for mademoiselle de grandlieu and he had just bought up the lands of rubempre at the cost of a million francs corentin very skilfully made the head of the general police take the first steps and the prefet de police a propos de peyrade informed his chief that the appellants in that affair had been in fact the comte de serizy and lucien de rubempre we have it cried peyrade and corentin the two friends had laid plans in a moment this hussy said corentin has had intimacies she must have some women friends among them we shall certainly find one or another who is down on her luck one of us must play the part of a rich foreigner and take her up we will throw them together 
they always want something of each other in the game of lovers and we shall then be in the citadel peyrade naturally proposed to assume his disguise as an englishman the wild life he should lead during the time that he would take to disentangle the plot of which he had been the victim smiled on his fancy while corentin grown old in his functions and weakly too did not care for it disguised as a mulatto contenson at once evaded carlos's force just three days before peyrade's meeting with madame du val-noble in the champs elysees this last of the agents employed by messieurs de sartine and lenoir had arrived provided with a passport at the hotel mirabeau rue de la paix having come from the colonies via le havre in a travelling chaise as mud-splashed as though it had really come from le havre instead of no further than by the road from saint denis to paris carlos herrera on his part had his passport vis at the spanish embassy and arranged everything at the quai malaquais to start for madrid and this is why within a few days esther was to become the owner of the house in the rue saint georges and of shares yielding thirty thousand francs a year europe and asie were quite cunning enough to persuade her to sell these shares and privately transmit the money to lucien thus lucien proclaiming himself rich through his sister's liberality would pay the remainder of the price of the rubempre estates of this transaction no one could complain esther alone could betray herself but she would die rather than blink an eyelash clotilde had appeared with a little pink kerchief round her crane's neck so she had won her game at the hotel de grandlieu the shares in the omnibus company were already worth thrice their initial value carlos by disappearing for a few days would put malice off the scent human prudence had foreseen everything no error was possible the false spaniard was to start on the morrow of the day when peyrade met madame du val-noble but that very night at two in the morning asie came in a cab to the quai malaquais and found the stoker of the machine smoking in his room and reconsidering all the points of the situation here stated in a few words like an author going over a page in his book to discover any faults to be corrected such a man would not allow himself a second time such an oversight as that of the porter in the rue Tebou. Pacard, whispered asie in her master's ear recognized contenson yesterday at half-past two in the champs elysees disguised as a mulatto servant to an englishman who for the last three days has been seen walking in the champs elysees watching esther paccard knew the hound by his eyes as i did when he dressed up as a market porter paccard drove the girl home taking a round so as not to lose sight of the wretch contenson is at the hotel mirabeau but he exchanged so many signs of intelligence with the englishman that paccard says the other cannot possibly be an englishman we have a gadfly behind us said carlos i will not leave till the day after to-morrow that contenson is certainly the man who sent the porter after us from the rue Tebou. we must Section 29 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter 9. At noon, Mr. Samuel Johnson's black servant was solemnly waiting on his master, who always breakfasted too heartily with a purpose. 
peyrade wished to pass for a tippling englishman he never went out till he was half seas over he wore black cloth gaiters up to his knees and padded to make his legs look stouter his trousers were lined with the thickest fustian his waistcoat was buttoned up to his cheeks a red scratch wig hid half his forehead and he had added nearly three inches to his height in short the oldest frequenter of the cafe david could not have recognized him from his square-cut coat of black cloth with full skirts he might have been taken for an english millionaire contenson made a show of the cold insolence of a nabob's confidential servant he was taciturn abrupt scornful and uncommunicative and indulged in fierce exclamations and uncouth gestures peyrade was finishing his second bottle when one of the hotel waiters unceremoniously showed in a man in whom peyrade and contenson both at once discerned a gendarme in mufti monsieur peyrade said the gendarme to the nabob speaking in his ear my instructions are to take you to the prefecture peyrade without saying a word rose and took down his hat you will find a hackney coach at the door said the man as they went downstairs the prefet thought of arresting you but he decided on sending for you to ask some explanation of your conduct through the peace officer whom you will find in the coach shall i ride with you asked the gendarme of the peace officer when peyrade had got in no replied the other tell the coachman quietly to drive to the prefecture peyrade and carlos were now face to face in the coach carlos had a stiletto under his hand the coach driver was a man he could trust quite capable of allowing carlos to get out without seeing him or being surprised on arriving at his journey's end to find a dead body in his cab no inquiries are ever made about a spy the law almost always leaves such murders unpunished it is so difficult to know the rights of the case peyrade looked with his keenest eye at the magistrate sent to examine him by the prefet of police carlos struck him as satisfactory a bald head deeply wrinkled at the back and powdered hair a pair of very light gold spectacles with double green glasses over weak eyes with red rims evidently needing care these eyes seemed the trace of some squalid malady a cotton shirt with a flat pleated frill a shabby black satin waistcoat the trousers of a man of law black spun silk stockings and shoes tied with ribbon a long black overcoat cheap gloves black and worn for ten days and a gold watch-chain in every point the lower grade of magistrate known by a perversion of terms as a peace officer my dear monsieur peyrade i regret to find such a man as you the object of surveillance and that you should act so as to justify it your disguise is not to the prefet's taste if you fancy that you can thus escape our vigilance you are mistaken you travelled from england by way of beaumont sur oise no doubt beaumont sur oise repeated peyrade or by saint denis said the sham lawyer peyrade lost his presence of mind the question must be answered now any reply might be dangerous in the affirmative it was farcical in the negative if this man knew the truth it would be peyrade's ruin he is a sharp fellow thought he he tried to look at the man and smile and he gave him a smile for an answer the smile passed muster without protest for what purpose have you disguised yourself taken rooms at the mirabeau and dressed contenson as a black servant asked the peace officer monsieur le prefet may do what he chooses with me but i owe no account of my actions to any one but my chief said peyrade with dignity 
if you mean me to infer that you are acting by the orders of the general police said the other coldly we will change our route and drive to the rue de grenelle instead of the rue de jerusalem i have clear instructions with regard to you but be careful you are not in any deep disgrace and you may spoil your own game in a moment as for me i owe you no grudge come tell me the truth well then this is the truth said peyrade with a glance at his cerberus's red eyes the sham lawyer's face remained expressionless impassable he was doing his business all truths were the same to him he looked as though he suspected the prefet of some caprice prefets have their little tantrums i have fallen desperately in love with a woman the mistress of that stockbroker who is gone abroad for his own pleasure and the displeasure of his creditors Fayex. madame du val noble yes replied peyrade to keep her for a month which will not cost me more than a thousand crowns i have got myself up as a nabob and taken contenson as my servant this is so absolutely true monsieur that if you like to leave me in the coach where i will wait for you on my honour as an old commissioner-general of police you can go to the hotel and question contenson not only will contenson confirm what i have the honour of stating but you may see madame du val noble's waiting-maid who is to come this morning to signify her mistress's acceptance of my offers or the conditions she makes an old monkey knows what grimaces mean i have offered her a thousand francs a month and a carriage that comes to fifteen hundred five hundred francs worth of presents and as much again in some outings dinners and play-going you see i am not deceiving you by a centime when i say a thousand crowns a man of my age may well spend a thousand crowns on his last fancy bless me papa peyrade and you still care enough for women to but you are deceiving me i am sixty myself and i can do without him however if the case is as you state it i quite understand that you should have found it necessary to get yourself up as a foreigner to indulge your fancy you can understand that peyrade or old Conquel of the rue des moineaux ay neither of them would have suited madame du val noble carlos put in delighted to have picked up Conquel's address before the revolution he went on i had for my mistress a woman who had previously been kept by the gentleman in waiting as they then called the executioner one evening at the play she pricked herself with a pin and cried out a customary ejaculation in those days ah bourreau on which her neighbor asked her if this were a reminiscence well my dear peyrade she cast off her man for that speech i suppose you have no wish to expose yourself to such a slap in the face madame du val noble is a woman for gentlemen i saw her once at the opera and thought her very handsome tell the driver to go back to the rue de la paix my dear peyrade i will go upstairs with you to your rooms and see for myself a verbal report will no doubt be enough for monsieur le prefet carlos took a snuff-box from his side pocket a black snuff-box lined with silver gilt and offered it to peyrade with an impulse of delightful good fellowship peyrade said to himself and these are their agents good heavens what would monsieur lenoir say if he could come back to life or monsieur de sartine that is part of the truth no doubt but it is not all said the sham lawyer sniffing up his pinch of snuff you have had a finger in the baron de nucingen's love affairs and you wish no doubt to entangle him in some slipknot you missed fire with the pistol and you are aiming at him with a field piece madame de val noble is a friend of madame de champy's devil take it i must take care not to founder said peyrade to himself he is a better man than i thought him he is playing me 
he talks of letting me go and he goes on making me blab well asked carlos with a magisterial air monsieur it is true that i have been so foolish as to seek a woman in monsieur de nucingen's behoof because he was half mad with love that is the cause of my being out of favour for it would seem that quite unconsciously i touched some important interests the officer of the law remained immovable but after fifty-two years experience peyrade went on i know the police well enough to have held my hand after the blowing up i had from monsieur le prefet who no doubt was right then you would give up this fancy if monsieur le prefet required it of you that i think would be the best proof you could give of the sincerity of what you say he is going it he is going it thought peyrade ah by all that's holy the police to-day is a match for that of monsieur lenoir give it up said he aloud i will wait till i have monsieur le prefet's orders but here we are at the hotel if you wish to come up where do you find the money said carlos point-blank with a sagacious glance monsieur i have a friend get along said carlos go and tell that story to an examining magistrate this audacious stroke on carlos's part was the outcome of one of those calculations so simple that none but a man of his temper would have thought it out at a very early hour he had sent lucien to madame de serizy's lucien had begged the count's private secretary as from the count to go and obtain from the prefet of police full particulars concerning the agent employed by the baron de nucingen the secretary came back provided with a note concerning peyrade a copy of the summary noted on the back of his record in the police force since seventeen seventy eight having come to paris from avignon two years previously without money or character possessed of certain state secrets lives in the rue des moineaux under the name of Concouel, the name of a little estate where his family resides in the department of vaucluse very respectable people was lately inquired for by a grand-nephew named theodore de la perade see the report of an agent number thirty seven of the documents he must be the man to whom contenson is playing the mulatto servant cried carlos when lucien returned with other information besides this note within three hours this man with the energy of a commander-in-chief had found by paccard's help an innocent accomplice capable of playing the part of a gendarme in disguise and had got himself up as a peace officer three times in the coach he had thought of killing peyrade but he had made it a rule never to commit a murder with his own hand he promised himself that he would get rid of peyrade all in good time by pointing him out as a millionaire to some released convicts about the town peyrade and his mentor as they went in heard contenson's voice arguing with madame du val noble's maid peyrade signed to carlos to remain in the outer room with a look meant to convey thus you can assure yourself of my sincerity madame agrees to everything said adele madame is at this moment calling on a friend madame de champy who has some rooms in the rue Taitbout on her hands for a year full of furniture which she will let her have no doubt madame can receive mr johnson more suitably there for the furniture is still very decent and monsieur might buy it for madame by coming to an agreement with madame de champy very good my girl if this is not a job of fleecing it is a bit of the wool said the mulatto to the astonished woman however we will go shares that is your darky all over cried mademoiselle adele if your nabob is a nabob he can very well afford to give madame the furniture the lease ends in april eighteen thirty your nabob may renew it if he likes i am quite willing said peyrade speaking french with a strong english accent 
as he came in and tapped the woman on the shoulder he cast a knowing look back at carlos who replied by an assenting nod understanding that the nabob was to keep up his part but the scene suddenly changed its aspect at the entrance of a person over whom neither carlos nor peyrade had the least power corentin suddenly came in he had found the door open and looked in as he went by to see how his old friend played his part as a nabob the prefet is still bullying me said peyrade in a whisper to corentin he has found me out as a nabob we will spill the prefet corentin muttered in reply then after a cool bow he stood darkly scrutinizing the magistrate stay here till i return said carlos i will go to the prefecture if you do not see me again you may go your own way having said this in an undertone to peyrade so as not to humiliate him in the presence of the waiting-maid carlos went away not caring to remain under the eye of the newcomer in whom he detected one of those fair-haired blue-eyed men coldly terrifying that is the peace officer sent after me by the prefet said peyrade that said corentin you have walked into a trap that man has three packs of cards in his shoes you can see that by the place of his foot in the shoe besides a peace officer need wear no disguise corentin hurried downstairs to verify his suspicions carlos was getting into the fly hello monsieur l'abbé cried corentin carlos looked around saw corentin and got in quickly still corentin had time to say that was all i wanted to know que malaque he shouted to the driver with a diabolical mockery in his tone and expression i am done said jacques collin to himself they have got me i must get ahead of them by sheer pace and above all find out what they want of us corentin had seen the abbe carlos herrera five or six times and the man's eyes were unforgettable Corentin had suspected him at once from the cut of his shoulders, then by his puffy face, and the trick of three inches of added height gained by a heel inside the shoe. "'Ah, old fellow, they have drawn you,' said Corentin, finding no one in the room but Peyrade and Contenson. "'Who?' cried Peyrade, with metallic hardness. "'I will spend my last days in putting him on a gridiron and turning him on it it is the abbe carlos herrera the corentin of spain as i suppose this explains everything the spaniard is a demon of the first water who has tried to make a fortune for that little young man by coining money out of a pretty baggage's bolster it is your lookout if you think you can measure your skill with a man who seems to me the very devil to deal with oh exclaimed contenson he fingered the three hundred thousand francs the day when esther was arrested he was in the cab i remember those eyes that brow and those marks of the smallpox oh what a fortune my lydie might have had cried peyrade you may still play the nabob said corentin to keep an eye on esther you must keep up her intimacy with val noble she was really lucien's mistress they have got more than five hundred thousand francs out of nucingen already said contenson and they want as much again corentin went on the rubempre estate is to cost a million daddy added he slapping peyrade on the shoulder you may get more than a hundred thousand francs to settle on lydie don't tell me that corentin if your scheme should fail i cannot tell what i might not do you will have it by to-morrow perhaps the abbe my dear fellow is most astute we shall have to kiss his spurs he is a very superior devil but i have him sure enough he is not a fool and he will knock under
Section thirty of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What love costs an old man. Chapter ten. In the evening of this day, when the opposing forces had met face to face on level ground, Lucien spent the evening at the Hôtel Grandlieu the party was a large one in the face of all the assembly the duchess kept lucien at her side for some time and was most kind to him you are going away for a little while said she yes madame la duchesse my sister in her anxiety to promote my marriage has made great sacrifices and i have been enabled to repurchase the lands of the rue Bompres, to reconstitute the whole estate but i have found in my paris lawyer a very clever man who has managed to save me from the extortionate terms that the holders would have asked if they had known the name of the purchaser is there a chateau asked clotilde with too broad a smile there is something which might be called a chateau but the wiser plan would be to use the building materials in the construction of a modern residence clotilde's eyes blazed with happiness above her smile of satisfaction you must play a rubber with my father this evening said she in a fortnight i hope you will be asked to dinner well my dear sir said the duc de grandlieu i am told that you have bought the estate of rubempre i congratulate you it is an answer to those who say you are in debt we bigwigs like france or england are allowed to have a public debt but men of no fortune beginners you see may not assume that privilege indeed monsieur le duc i still owe five hundred thousand francs on my land well well you must marry a wife who can bring you the money but you will have some difficulty in finding a match with such a fortune in our faubourg where daughters do not get large dowries their name is enough said lucien we are only three whisk players maufrigneuse d'espard and i will you make a fourth said the duke pointing to the card table clotilde came to the table to watch her father's game she expects me to believe that she means it for me said the duke patting his daughter's hands and looking round at lucien who remained quite grave lucien monsieur d'espard's partner lost twenty louis my dear mother said clotilde to the duchess he was so judicious as to lose at eleven o'clock after a few affectionate words with mademoiselle de grandlieu lucien went home and to bed thinking of the complete triumph he was to enjoy a month hence for he had not a doubt of being accepted as clotilde's lover and married before lent in eighteen thirty on the morrow when lucien was smoking his cigarettes after breakfast sitting with carlos who had become much depressed monsieur de saint esteve was announced what a touch of irony who begged to see either the abbe carlos herrera or monsieur lucien de rubempre was he told downstairs that i had left paris cried the abbe yes sir replied the groom well then you must see the man said he to lucien but do not say a single compromising word do not let a sign of surprise escape you it is the enemy you will overhear me said lucien carlos hid in the adjoining room and through the crack of the door he saw corentin whom he recognized only by his voice such powers of transformation did the great man possess this time corentin looked like an old paymaster-general i have not had the honor of being known to you monsieur corentin began but excuse my interrupting you monsieur but but the matter in point is your marriage to mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu which will never take place 
corentin added eagerly lucien sat down and made no reply you are in the power of a man who is able and willing and ready to prove to the duc de grandlieu that the lands of rubempre are to be paid for with the money that a fool has given to your mistress mademoiselle esther corentin went on it will be quite easy to find the minutes of the legal opinions in virtue of which mademoiselle esther was summoned there are ways too of making d'estourny speak the very clever manoeuvres employed against the baron de nucingen will be brought to light as yet all can be arranged pay down a hundred thousand francs and you will have peace all this is no concern of mine i am only the agent of those who levy this blackmail nothing more corentin might have talked for an hour lucien smoked his cigarette with an air of perfect indifference monsieur replied he i do not want to know who you are for men who undertake such jobs as these have no name at any rate in my vocabulary i have allowed you to talk at your leisure i am at home you seem to me not bereft of common sense listen to my dilemma there was a pause during which lucien met corentin's cat-like eye fixed on him with a perfectly icy stare either you are building on facts that are absolutely false and i need pay no heed to them said lucien or you are in the right and in that case by giving you a hundred thousand francs i put you in a position to ask me for as many hundred thousand francs as your employer can find saint esteves to ask for however to put an end once and for all to your kind intervention i would have you know that i lucien de rubempre fear no one i have no part in the jobbery of which you speak if the grandlieus make difficulties there are other young ladies of very good family ready to be married after all it is no loss to me if i remain single especially if as you imagine i deal in blank bills to such advantage if monsieur l'abbe carlos herrera monsieur lucien put in the abbe herrera is at this moment on the way to spain he has nothing to do with my marriage my interests are no concern of his that remarkable statesman was good enough to assist me at one time with his advice but he has reports to present to his majesty the king of spain if you have anything to say to him i recommend you to set out for madrid monsieur said corentin plainly you will never be mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu's husband so much the worse for her replied lucien impatiently pushing corentin towards the door you have fully considered the matter asked corentin coldly monsieur i do not recognize that you have any right either to meddle in my affairs or to make me waste a cigarette said lucien throwing away his cigarette that had gone out good day monsieur said corentin we shall not meet again but there will certainly be a moment in your life when you would give half your fortune to have called me back from these stairs in answer to this threat carlos made as though he were cutting off a head now to business cried he Section thirty one of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter eleven. 
if among the small number of my readers who take an interest in the moral and philosophical side of this book there should be only one capable of believing that the baron de nucingen was happy that one would prove how difficult it is to explain the heart of a courtesan by any kind of physiological formula esther was resolved to make the poor millionaire pay dearly for what he called his day of triumph and at the beginning of february eighteen thirty the housewarming party had not yet been given in the little palace well said esther in confidence to her friends who repeated it to the baron i shall open house at the carnival and i mean to make my man as happy as a cock in plaster the phrase became proverbial among women of her kidney the baron gave vent to much lamentation like married men he made himself very ridiculous he began to complain to his intimate friends and his dissatisfaction was generally known esther meanwhile took quite a serious view of her position as the pompadour of this prince of speculators she had given two or three small evening parties solely to get lucien into the house lousteau rastignac du tillet bichu nathan the comte de brambourg all the cream of the dissipated crew frequented her drawing-room and as leading ladies in the piece she was playing esther accepted tullia florentine fanny beaupre and florine two dancers and two actresses besides madame du val noble nothing can be more dreary than a courtesan's home without the spice of rivalry the display of dress and some variety of type in six weeks esther had become the wittiest the most amusing the loveliest and the most elegant of those female pariahs who form the class of kept women placed on the pedestal that became her she enjoyed all the delights of vanity which fascinate women in general but still as one who is raised above her caste by a secret thought she cherished in her heart an image of herself which she gloried in while it made her blush the hour when she must abdicate was ever present to her consciousness thus she lived a double life really scorning herself her sarcastic remarks were tinged by the temper which was roused in her by the intense contempt felt by the angel of love hidden in the courtesan for the disgraceful and odious part played by the body in the presence as it were of the soul at once actor and spectator victim and judge she was a living realization of the beautiful arabian tales in which a noble creature lies hidden under a degrading form and of which the type is the story of nebuchadnezzar in the book of books the bible having granted herself a lease of life till the day after her infidelity the victim might surely play a while with the executioner moreover the enlightenment that had come to esther as to the secretly disgraceful means by which the baron had made his colossal fortune relieved her of every scruple she could play the part of ate the goddess of vengeance as carlos said and so she was by turns enchanting and odious to the banker who lived only for her when the baron had been worked up to such a pitch of suffering that he wanted only to be quit of esther she brought him round by a scene of tender affection herrera making a great show of starting for spain had gone as far as tours he had sent the chaise on as far as bordeaux with a servant inside engaged to play the part of master and to wait for him at bordeaux then returning by diligence dressed as a commercial traveller he had secretly taken up his abode under esther's roof and thence aided by azie and a 
carefully directed all his machinations keeping an eye on every one and especially on peyrade about a fortnight before the day chosen for her great entertainment which was to be given in the evening after the first opera ball the courtesan whose witticisms were beginning to make her feared happened to be at the italian opera at the back of a box which the baron forced to give a box had secured in the lowest tier in order to conceal his mistress and not to flaunt her in public within a few feet of madame de nucingen esther had taken her seat so as to rake that of madame de serizy whom lucien almost invariably accompanied the poor girl made her whole happiness centre in watching lucien on tuesdays thursdays and saturdays by madame de serizy's side at about half-past nine in the evening esther could see lucien enter the countess's box with a care-laden brow pale and with almost drawn features these symptoms of mental anguish were legible only to esther the knowledge of a man's countenance is to the woman who loves him like that of the sea to a sailor good god what can be the matter what has happened does he want to speak with that angel of hell who is to him a guardian angel and who lives in an attic between those of europe and asie tormented by such reflections esther scarcely listened to the music still less it may be believed did she listen to the baron who held one of his angel's hands in both his talking to her in his horrible polish jewish accent a jargon which must be as unpleasant to read as it is to hear spoken esther said he releasing her hand and pushing it away with a slight touch of temper you do not listen to me i tell you what baron you blunder in love as you gibber in french der teufel i am not in my boudoir here i am at the opera if you were not a barrel made by ure or fiche metamorphosed into a man by some trick of nature you would not make so much noise in a box with a woman who is fond of music i don't listen to you i should think not there you sit rustling my dress like a cockchafer in a paper bag and making me laugh with contempt you say to me you are so pretty i should like to eat you old simpleton supposing i were to say to you you are less intolerable this evening than you were yesterday we will go home well from the way you puff and sigh for i feel you if i don't listen to you i perceive that you have eaten an enormous dinner and your digestion is at work let me instruct you for i cost you enough to give some advice for your money now and then let me tell you my dear fellow that a man whose digestion is so troublesome as yours is is not justified in telling his mistress that she is pretty at unseemly hours an old soldier died of that very folly in the arms of religion as blondet has it it is now ten o'clock you finished dinner at du Tillet's at nine o'clock with your pigeon the comte de brambourg you have millions and truffles to digest come to-morrow night at ten that you are cruel cried the baron recognizing the profound truth of this medical argument cruel echoed esther still looking at lucien have you not consulted bianchon desplein old audry since you have had a glimpse of future happiness do you know what you seem like to me no that a fat old fellow wrapped in flannel who walks every hour from his armchair to the window to see if the thermometer has risen to the degree marked silkworms the temperature prescribed by his physician you are really an ungrateful slut 
cried the baron in despair at hearing a tune which however amorous old men not unfrequently hear at the opera ungrateful retorted esther what have you given me till now a great deal of annoyance come papa can i be proud of you 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 are proud of me i wear your livery and badge with an air you paid my debts so you did but you have grabbed so many millions come you need not sulk you admitted that to me that you need not think twice of that and this is your chief title to fame a baggage and a thief a well-assorted couple you have built a splendid cage for a parrot that amuses you go and ask a brazilian cockatoo what gratitude it owes to the man who placed it in a gilded cage don't look at me like that you are just like a buddhist bonze well you show your red and white cockatoo to all paris you say does anybody else in paris own such a parrot and how well it talks how cleverly it picks its words if du tillet comes in it says at once how do little swindler why you are as happy as a dutchman who has grown an unique tulip as an old nabob pensioned off in asia by england when a commercial traveller sells him the first swiss snuff-box that opens in three places you want to win my heart well now i will tell you how to do it speak speak there is nothing i shall not do for you i love to be fooled by you be young be handsome be like lucien de rubempre over there by your wife and you shall have gratis what you can never buy with all your millions i shall go away for really you are too bad this evening said the banker with a lengthened face very well good night then said esther tell georges to make your pillows very high and place your feet low for you look apoplectic this evening you cannot say my dear that i take no interest in your health the baron was standing up and held the door-knob in his hand here nucingen said esther with an imperious gesture the baron bent over her with dog-like devotion do you want to see me very sweet and giving you sugar and water and petting you in my house this very evening old monster you shall break my heart break your heart you mean bore you she went on well bring me lucien that i may invite him to our belshazzar's feast and you may be sure he will not fail to come if you succeed in that little transaction i will tell you that i love you my fat frederic in such plain terms that you cannot but believe me you are an enchantress said the baron kissing esther's glove i should be willing to listen to abuse for ein hour if always there was a kiss at the end of it but if i am not obeyed i and she threatened the baron with her finger as we threaten children the baron raised his head like a bird caught in a springe and imploring the trapper's pity dear heaven what ails lucien said she to herself when she was alone making no attempt section thirty two of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter twelve this is what had happened to lucien that very evening at nine o'clock he had gone out as he did every evening in his brougham to go to the hotel de grandlieu using his saddle-horse and cab in the morning only like all young men he had hired a brougham for winter evenings 
and had chosen a first-class carriage and splendid horses from one of the best job masters for the last month all had gone well with him he had dined with the grandlieus three times the duke was delightful to him his shares in the omnibus company sold for three hundred thousand francs had paid off a third more of the price of the land clotilde de grandlieu who dressed beautifully now reddened inch thick when he went into the room and loudly proclaimed her attachment to him some personages of high estate discussed their marriage as a probable event the duc de chaulieu formerly ambassador to spain and now for a short while minister for foreign affairs had promised the duchesse de grandlieu that he would ask for the title of marquis for lucien so that evening after dining with madame de serizy lucien had driven to the faubourg saint germain to pay his daily visit he arrives the coachman calls for the gate to be opened he drives into the courtyard and stops at the steps lucien on getting out remarks four other carriages in waiting on seeing monsieur de rubempre one of the footmen placed to open and shut the hall door comes forward and out on to the steps in front of the door like a soldier on guard his grace is not at home says he madame la duchesse is receiving company observes lucien to the servant madame la duchesse is gone out replies the man solemnly mademoiselle clotilde i do not think that mademoiselle clotilde will see you monsieur in the absence of madame la duchesse but there are people here replies lucien in dismay i do not know sir says the man trying to seem stupid and to be respectful there is nothing more fatal than etiquette to those who regard it as the most formidable arm of social law lucien easily interpreted the meaning of this scene so disastrous to him the duke and duchess would not admit him he felt the spinal marrow freezing in the core of his vertebral column and a sickly cold sweat bedewed his brow the conversation had taken place in the presence of his own body-servant who held the door of the brougham doubting whether to shut it lucien signed to him that he was going away again but as he stepped into the carriage he heard the noise of people coming downstairs and the servant called out first madame la duchesse de chaulieu's people then madame la vicomtesse de grandlieu's carriage lucien merely said to the italian opera but in spite of his haste the luckless dandy could not escape the duc de chaulieu and his son the duc de rhetore to whom he was obliged to bow for they did not speak a word to him a great catastrophe at court the fall of a formidable favorite has ere now been pronounced on the threshold of a royal study in one word from an usher with a face like a plaster cast how am i to let my adviser know of this disaster this instant thought lucien as he drove to the opera house what is going on he racked his brain with conjectures this was what had taken place that morning at eleven o'clock the duc de grandlieu as he went into the little room where the family all breakfasted together said to clotilde after kissing her until further orders my child think no more of the sieur de rubempre then he had taken the duchesse by the hand and led her into a window recess to say a few words in an undertone which made poor clotilde turn pale for she watched her mother as she listened to the duke and saw her expression of extreme surprise jean said the duke to one of his servants take this note to monsieur le duc de chaulieu and beg him to answer by you yes or no i am asking him to dine here to-day he added to his wife 
breakfast had been a most melancholy meal the duchess was meditative the duke seemed to be vexed with himself and clotilde could with difficulty restrain her tears my child your father is right you must obey him the mother had said to the daughter with much emotion i do not say as he does think no more of lucien no for i understand your suffering clotilde kissed her mother's hand but i do say my darling wait take no step suffer in silence since you love him and put your trust in your parents care great ladies my child are great just because they can do their duty on every occasion and do it nobly but what is it about asked clotilde as white as a lily matters too serious to be discussed with you my dearest the duchess replied for if they are untrue your mind would be unnecessarily sullied and if they are true you must never know them at six o'clock the duc de chaulieu had come to join the duc de grandlieu who awaited him in his study tell me henri for the dukes were on the most familiar terms and addressed each other by their christian names this is one of the shades invented to mark a degree of intimacy to repel the audacity of french familiarity and humiliate conceit tell me henri i am in such a desperate difficulty that i can only ask advice of an old friend who understands business and you have practice and experience my daughter clotilde as you know is in love with that little rubempre whom i have been almost compelled to accept as her promised husband i have always been averse to the marriage however madame de grandlieu could not bear to thwart clotilde's passion when the young fellow had repurchased the family estate and paid three-quarters of the price i could make no further objections but last evening i received an anonymous letter you know how much that is worth in which i am informed that the young fellow's fortune is derived from some disreputable source and that he is telling lies when he says that his sister is giving him the necessary funds for his purchase for my daughter's happiness and for the sake of our family i am adjured to make inquiries and the means of doing so are suggested to me here read it i am entirely of your opinion as to the value of anonymous letters my dear ferdinand said the duc de chaulieu after reading the letter still though we may condemn them we must make use of them we must treat such letters as we would treat a spy keep the young man out of the house and let us make inquiries i know how to do it your lawyer is derville a man in whom we have perfect confidence he knows the secrets of many families and can certainly be trusted with this he is an honest man a man of weight and a man of honour he is cunning and wily but his wiliness is only in the way of business and you need only employ him to obtain evidence you can depend upon we have in the foreign office an agent of the superior police who is unique in his power of discovering state secrets we often send him on such missions inform derville that he will have a lieutenant in the case our spy is a gentleman who will appear wearing the ribbon of the legion of honor and looking like a diplomat this rascal will do the hunting derville will only look on your lawyer will then tell you if the mountain brings forth a mouse or if you must throw over this little rubempre within a week you will know what you are doing the young man is not yet so far a marquis as to take offence at my being not at home for a week said the duc de grandlieu above all if you end by giving him your daughter replied the minister if the anonymous letter tells the truth what of that 
you can send clotilde to travel with my daughter-in-law madeleine who wants to go to italy you relieve me immensely i don't know whether i ought to thank you wait till the end by the way exclaimed the duc de grandlieu what is your man's name i must mention it to derville send him to me to-morrow by five o'clock i will have derville here and put them in communication his real name said monsieur de chaulieu is i think corentin a name you must never have heard for my gentleman will come ticketed with his official name he calls himself monsieur de saint something saint yves saint valere something of the kind you may trust him louis the eighteenth had perfect confidence in him after this confabulation the steward had orders to shut the door on monsieur de rubempre which was done lucien paced the waiting-room at the opera house like a man who was drunk he fancied himself the talk of all paris he had in the duc de rhetore one of those unrelenting enemies on whom a man must smile as he can never be revenged since their attacks are in conformity with the rules of society the duc de rhetore knew the scene that had just taken place on the outside steps of the grandlieu's house lucien feeling the necessity of at once reporting the catastrophe to his high privy councillor nevertheless was afraid of compromising himself by going to esther's house where he might find company he actually forgot that esther was here so confused were his thoughts and in the midst of so much perplexity he was obliged to make small talk with rastignac who knowing nothing of the news congratulated him on his approaching marriage at this moment nucingen appeared smiling and said to lucien will you do me the pleasure to come to see montame de champy what will invite you herself to van housewarming party with pleasure baron replied lucien to whom the baron appeared as a rescuing angel leave us said esther to monsieur de nucingen when she saw him come in with lucien go and see madame du val noble whom i discover in a box on the third tier with her nabob a great many nabobs grow in the indies she added with a knowing glance at lucien and that one said lucien smiling is uncommonly like yours and then said esther answering lucien with another look of intelligence while still speaking to the baron bring her here with her nabob he is very anxious to make your acquaintance they say he is very rich the poor woman has already poured out i know not how many elegies she complains that her nabob is no good and if you relieve him of his ballast perhaps he will sail closer to the wind you think we are all thieves said the baron as he went away what ails you my lucien asked esther in her friend's ear just touching it with her lips as soon as the box door was shut i am lost i have just been turned from the door of the hotel de grandlieu under pretence that no one was admitted the duke and duchess were at home and five pairs of horses were champing in the courtyard what will the marriage not take place exclaimed esther much agitated for she saw a glimpse of paradise i do not yet know what is being plotted against me my lucien said she in a deliciously coaxing voice why be worried about it you can make a better match by and by i will get you the price of two estates give us supper to-night that i may be able to speak in secret to carlos and above all invite the sham englishman and val noble that nabob is my ruin he is our enemy we will get hold of him and we but lucien broke off with a gesture of despair well what is it 
asked the poor girl. Oh, Madame de Serizy sees me, cried Lucien, and to crown our woes, the Duc de Rétoré, who witnessed my dismissal, is with her. In fact, at that very minute, the Duc de Rétoré was amusing himself with Madame de Serizy's discomfiture. Do you allow Lucien to be seen in Mademoiselle Esther's box? said the young duke, pointing to the box and to Lucien. You, who take an interest in him, should really tell him such things are not allowed. He may sup at her house. He may even— But, in fact, I am no longer surprised at the Grand Lieu's coolness towards the young man. I have just seen their door shut in his face, on the front steps. Women of that sort are very dangerous said madame de serizy turning her opera glass on esther's box yes said the duke as much by what they can do as by what they wish they will ruin him cried madame de serizy for i am told they cost as much whether they are paid or no not to him said the young duke affecting surprise they are far from costing him anything they give him money at need, and all run after him. The countess's lips showed a little nervous twitching, which could not be included in any category of smiles. "'Well, then,' said Esther, "'come to supper at midnight. Bring Blondet and Rastignac. Let us have two amusing persons at any rate, and we won't be more than nine you must find some excuse for sending the baron to fetch eugenie under pretense of warning asie and tell her what has befallen me so that carlos may know before he has the nabob under his claws that shall be done said esther and thus peyrade was probably about to find himself unwittingly under the same roof with his adversary the tiger was coming into the lion's den, and the lion surrounded by his guards. When Lucien went back to Madame de Serizy's box, instead of turning to him, smiling and arranging her skirts for him to sit by her, she affected to pay him not the slightest attention, but looked about the house through her glass. Lucien could see, however, by the shaking of her hand, that the countess was suffering from one of those terrible emotions by which illicit joys are paid for. He went to the front of the box all the same, and sat down by her at the opposite corner, leaving a little vacant space between himself and the countess. He leaned on the ledge of the box with his elbow, resting his chin on his gloved hand, then he half turned away, waiting for a word. By the middle of the act the countess had still neither spoken to him nor looked at him. "'I do not know,' said she at last, "'why you are here. Your place is in Mademoiselle Esther's box.' "'I will go there,' said Lucien, leaving the box without looking at the countess." my dear said madame du val noble going into esther's box with peyrade whom the baron de nucingen did not recognize i am delighted to introduce mr samuel johnson he is a great admirer of monsieur de nucingen's talents indeed monsieur said esther smiling at peyrade oh yes beaucoup said peyrade why baron here is a way of speaking french which is as much like yours as the low breton dialect is like that of burgundy it will be most amusing to hear you discuss money matters do you know monsieur nabob what i shall require of you if you are to make acquaintance with my baron said esther with a smile oh thank you so much you will introduce me to sir baronet said peyrade with an extravagant english accent yes said she 
you must give me the pleasure of your company at supper there is no pitch stronger than champagne for sticking men together it seals every kind of business above all such as you put your foot in come this evening you will find some jolly fellows as for you my little frederic she added in the baron's ear you have your carriage here just drive to the rue st georges and bring europe to me here i have a few words to say to her about the supper i have caught lucien he will bring two men who will be fun we will draw the englishman she whispered to madame du val noble peyrade and the baron left the women together oh my dear if you ever succeed in drawing that great brute you will be clever indeed said suzanne if it proves impossible you must lend him to me for a week replied esther laughing you would but keep him half a day replied madame du val noble the bread i eat is too hard it breaks my teeth never again to my dying day will i try to make an englishman happy they are all cold and selfish pigs on their hind legs what no consideration said esther with a smile on the contrary my dear the monster has never shown the least familiarity under no circumstances whatever asked esther the wretch always addresses me as madame and preserves the most perfect coolness imaginable at moments when every man is more or less amenable to him love-making on my word it is nothing more nor less than shaving himself he wipes the razor puts it back in its case and looks in the glass as if he were saying i have not cut myself then he treats me with such respect as is enough to send a woman mad that odious milord potboiler amuses himself by making poor theodore hide in my dressing-room and stand there half the day in short he tries to annoy me in every way and as stingy as miserly as gobseck and gigonet rolled into one he takes me out to dinner but he does not pay the cab that brings me home if i happen not to have ordered my carriage to fetch me well said esther but what does he pay you for your services oh my dear positively nothing five hundred francs a month and not a penny more and the hire of a carriage but what is it a machine such as they hire out for a third-rate wedding to carry an épicier to the mairie to church and to the cadran bleu oh he nettles me with his respect if i try hysterics and feel ill he is never vexed he only says i wish my lady to have her own way for there is nothing more detestable no gentleman than to say to a nice woman you are a cotton bale a bundle of merchandise Ha <laughs> ha! Are you a member of the Temperance Society and Anti-Slavery? And my horror sits pale and cold and hard, while he gives me to understand that he has as much respect for me as he might have for a negro, and that it has nothing to do with his feelings, but with his opinions as an abolitionist. A man cannot be a worse wretch, said Esther but i will smash up that outlandish chinee smash him up replied madame du val noble not if he does not love me you yourself would you like to ask him for two sous he would listen to you solemnly and tell you with british precision that would make a slap in the face seem genial that he pays dear enough for the trifle that love can be to his poor life and as before madame du val noble mimicked peyrade's bad french to think that in our line of life we are thrown in the way of such men exclaimed esther oh my dear you have been uncommonly lucky take good care of your nucingen but your nabob must have got some idea in his head that is what adele says 
look here my dear that man you may depend has laid a bet that he will make a woman hate him and pack him off in a certain time or else he wants to do business with Nussingen and took me up knowing that you and i were friends that is what adele thinks answered madame du val noble that is why i introduced him to you this evening oh if only i could be sure what he is at what tricks i could play with you and nucingen and you don't get angry asked esther you don't speak your mind now and then try it you are sharp and smooth well in spite of your sweetness he would kill you with his icy smiles i am anti-slavery he would say and you are free if you said the funniest things he would only look at you and say very good and you would see that he regards you merely as a part of the show and if you turned furious the same thing it would still be a show you might cut him open under the left breast without hurting him in the least his internals are of tinned iron i am sure i told him so he replied i am quite satisfied with that physical constitution and always polite my dear he wears gloves on his soul i shall endure this martyrdom for a few days longer to satisfy my curiosity but for that i should have made philippe slap my lord's cheek and he has not his match as a swordsman there is nothing else left for it i was just going to say so cried esther but you must ascertain first that philippe is a boxer for these old english fellows my dear have a depth of malignity this one has no match on earth no if you could but see him asking my commands to know at what hour he may come to take me by surprise of course and pouring out respectful speeches like a so-called gentleman you would say why he adores her and there is not a woman in the world who would not say the same and they envy us my dear exclaimed esther ah oh, well sighed madame du val noble in the course of our lives we learn more or less how little men value us but my dear i have never been so cruelly so deeply so utterly scorned by brutality as i am by this great skinful of port wine when he is tipsy he goes away not to be unpleasant as he tells adele and not to be under two powers at once wine and woman he takes advantage of my carriage he uses it more than i do oh if only we could see him under the table to-night but he can drink ten bottles and only be fuddled when his eyes are full he still sees clearly like people whose windows are dirty outside said esther but who can see from inside what is going on in the street i know that property in man du has it in the highest degree try to get du and if he and nucingen between them could only catch him in some of their plots i should at least be revenged they would bring him to beggary oh my dear to have fallen into the hands of a hypocritical protestant after that poor fayex who was so amusing so good-natured so full of chaff how we used to laugh they say all stockbrokers are stupid well he for one never lacked wit but once when he left you without a sou that is what made you acquainted with the unpleasant side of pleasure europe brought in by monsieur de nucingen put her viperin head in at the door and after listening 